Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. <sighs> well, guys, this is it. The big one. The shit stopper. The constipation of American cinema. A bowel blockage from which nothing of any value can possibly be removed. What is said to be one of the worst films of all time. I am, of course, talking about the indescribable terror that is Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin. We are talking about a movie that's so bad that lawyers are actually making reasonable arguments that their client's crime may be horrible, but at least they didn't make Batman and Robin. And in the remotest parts of Southeast Asia, it is still considered the number one preferred form of execution. Tokahana, see it, talk it all, see it. No! No, please! Anything with that! So as you can tell, I am not looking forward to reviewing this stinker. However, before I review it, let's take a look at the declining history of these Batman movies. The first Batman film was released in 1989 under the direction of then-newcomer Tim Burton. It was edgy, dark, and made just as much for adults as it was for children. In fact, it was made more for adults, and continues to be the highest grossing Batman movie to date. The second film, Batman Returns, was also very edgy and dark, but maybe a little too dark. A lot of people didn't gravitate towards the often disgusting Penguin or the exceptionally depressing storyline. While the first Batman ended on a triumphant note, Batman Returns ending was more bittersweet and left a lot of people feeling kind of empty. While still a big hit, Batman Returns wasn't the mega blockbuster Warner Brothers was hoping for, so Burton was booted off the movie sequels and replaced with another director. Enter Joel Schumacher, director of the third Batman film, Batman Forever, which was definitely more kid-friendly, bringing in stars like Jim Carrey, some bright flashy colors, and some really corny one-liners. It's the car, right? Chicks love the car. It wasn't good, but it certainly wasn't horrible. It was the Batman film studios always wanted, safe and marketable. And as you would imagine, it was a big hit. So logically, Schumacher was called in to direct the next one. And seeing how this is one of the worst films of all time, special precautions have been made today to prevent me from killing myself. For example, um, all sharp objects have been removed from the building. Uh, they took away my ties so that I don't hang myself. And, uh, oh, they also padded the edge of my glasses so that I don't jab them in the sides of my throat. But, they didn't count on my cyanide pills. So, let's take a look and see just how bad Batman Robin really is. This doesn't seem too bad. They're just suiting up, there's the Batmobile, the music's nice. Maybe this won't be so horrible after all. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. So yeah, if you're not a fan of one-liners, don't worry. There's only 167 billion more of them. You lie! So the story centers around our main heroes Batman, played by George Clooney, and Robin, played by Chris O'Donnell, as they plan to stop the evil Mr. Freeze from, you guessed it, taking over the world. Of course! It opens with Freeze, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, robbing the Gotham Museum. So our heroes suit up for battle for the opening fight scene. And yes, those costumes come complete with bat nipples and bat asses. Alright, y'all know what's coming. The ambiguously gay duo. Now that we got that joke out of the way, let's continue. Mr. Freeze is stealing a diamond that apparently powers his Sub-Zero suit. Apart from that, his only goal seems to be making jokes about a subject matter that unfortunately lends itself to a lot of insufferable puns. And I'll give you four guesses as to what that subject matter is. A. Celebrity gossip. B. Political satire. C. Family dilemmas. Or D. Ice! Ice, man. Cometh. Kick some ice. Can you be cold? Chill. Freeze well. Cool party. Stay cool. If your answer was D, NO FUCKING SHIT! Thanks for playing. So Batman comes busting in along with his sidekick Robin on his motorcycle. As the fight scene rages, we get an onslaught of lame lines and over-the-top stunts. Nice catch! You break it, you buy it. In fact, you may notice a similarity to another familiar style. Can't quite put your finger on it? Maybe this'll help. That's right, this Batman movie has stopped moving forward with its dark storyline and complex character development, and has instead gone back to the campy, bright, and colorful style of the original Adam West TV show. HELP! So 
as the fight scene continues, we see Batman and Robin literally skate across the icy floor playing hockey with a valuable hunk of diamond. Do I even have to make fun of this? Meanwhile, Freeze manages to hook up a rocket that'll launch him into space. What killed the dinosaurs? Gee, is it something having to do with ice? The ice age! Batman works his way up the rocket where the villain freezes him to the wall. Freeze, you're mad. Yes, listen to the sane man in the bat suit. I think not. Robin comes to rescue him as they surf their way down to the ground off the doors of the rocket. The only thing that would make this scene lamer is if Robin actually shouted cowabunga. Cowabunga! Ugh. <sighs> as if this scene couldn't possibly be any longer, Batman and Robin chase Freeze into another building, where Robin gets frozen by the ray gun. Stay cool, bad boy. God, how much longer is this movie? Ten minutes? We're only ten minutes in? Oh, this film is gonna be the end of me. Show some mercy. All right, so after Freeze gets the diamond back, Batman stays behind to thaw out Bird Boy. Your emotions make you weak. That's why this day's mine. I'll kill you next time. Why not kill him now? I wish I knew. As you can tell, Schwarzenegger is easily by far the worst actor in this movie. I've got some wild oats to sow. Until this person came along. And you are? Poison Ivy. Ah yes, Poison Ivy. The woman who started off as a nerdy environmental scientist who works in the most cliched of evil laboratories. Seriously, this place is so cliched, all you need is a strike of lightning on the building. <clears throat> She's shocked to find out that her boss is turning people into Mexican wrestlers to auction off to power-hungry dictators. Finding out that his diabolical plan is revealed, her boss takes it well. I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> From all the toxins and chemicals arises a flowery femme fatale known as Poison Ivy, who kills people by giving them venom-filled smooches. Talk about the kiss of death! Why are all the gorgeous ones homicidal maniacs? By using her love of deadly plants, Poison Ivy's diabolical goal is to, you guessed it, take over the world. Of course! Meanwhile, back at Wayne Manor, Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson get a visit from an unlikely visitor. Alfred's niece, Barbara, come all the way from Britain. Uh, the new computer sciences division. I'm sorry, I just can't understand you under that incredibly thick British accent. I don't know, all this luxury really isn't my style. Definitely Liverpool. London's kind of rough. Meanwhile, we discover that the villainous Mr. Freeze actually has a wife who has an incurable disease. So he keeps her frozen in the comfort and hidden safety of a neon-lit ice cream pub. How can nobody figure out that he's in there? It's the equivalent of Walt Disney trying to hide out in Disneyland. I mean, don't you think somebody would take a look? It's really ridiculous. While trying to figure out a cure for his beloved wife, Free spends most of his time conducting an orchestra of killer Eskimos to sing I'm Mr. White Christmas, I'm Mr. Snow. I'm Mr. Snow. That's just stupid. Meanwhile, the Batman who used to hide from the limelight and steal any hidden photographs taken of him is now making public appearances at a sexist auction where men bid on good-looking women to take out on a date. While there, they come across the seductive Poison Ivy, who blows a hypnotizing perfume that makes men bow to her every will. And as you sadly might have guessed, Batman and Robin actually start bidding on her. One million dollars. Two million. Three million. Four million. Seven million. Never leave the cave without it. A bat credit card? They gave him a bat credit card? They had the balls to give one of the greatest superheroes of all time a bat credit card? No! No! Does not compute! Does not compute! It does not compute! I think so! I apologize for that outrage. It was childish and immature. I just get a little peeved when I see one of my childhood icons carrying a bad credit card, you bastards! I'll kill you! I'll kill you, all of you! All of you will die! You'll get that gas! <clears throat> Rape my childhood, will you? You'll all die! You will all die! <sighs> okay. I'm fine. I'm cool. I'm fine. I'm fine. So. After Batman uses the... You know what? Mr. Freeze busts in and ruins the party. But through an exciting chase, Batman catches Mr. Freeze doing God knows what to him under that cape and places him in Arkham Asylum. But Robin is angry because he wanted to get Mr. Freeze. Could have made that jump. Sometimes counting on someone else is the only way you win. 
In fact, most of Robin's dialogue is just bitching and moaning. She loves me and not you. This is no partnership. I want a Robin signal in the sky. It's Batman and Robin, not Robin and Batman. You could pretty much just replace his dialogue with... <laughs> Look, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Meanwhile, in story number 12, we see that Barbara gets out all her rage and emotions by partaking in pointless motorcycle chases. <laughs> After Dick Grayson saves her from the world's worst blue screen effect, Barbara reveals a stunning secret about Alfred. How he's hiding the pain all the time. Alfred's sick. Oh, Alfred is sick? Alfred is sick? I mean, do we really have to concern ourselves with the butler in this movie? I mean, come on, how sick could he possibly be? He's dying. Awkward. So Bruce and Dick decide to give him a leave of absence due to reasons of dying. Here, Bruce and Alfred have a very heartfelt talk. He also reveals his personal appreciation for Alfred, but maybe a little too much. I love you, old man. And I love you. The ambiguously gay duo. I got some real issues with women, you know that? Meanwhile, Poison Ivy breaks Freeze out of prison and steals his Sub-Zero suit. By the way, the Riller suit here is kind of clever. But Freeze needs his diamonds from his headquarters to keep his suit active. I'll help you grab your rocks. Ha 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 ha. Ivy agrees to pick them up while also pulling the plug on Frieza's wife, leaving her to die. I wish I was in that jar. You can say that again. The Cape Crusaders try to stop her, but are turned against one another because of their lust for Ivy. She wants to kill you, dick. You watch her language. Ivy escapes and leaves Batman and Robin to fight over her. What happened? How'd they get away? How dare you didn't stop them? It's not like this is a job for the police. How dare you didn't stop them! As Ivy returns, she tells Freeze that Batman killed his wife. So Freeze vows to take vengeance on society. Sheesh, all that's missing is for Freeze to shout out first Gotham, then the world. First Gotham, and then the world! I hate this. Look at that. That's so lame. This is idiotic. I really hate this. This is so stupid. I wish I could kill myself. Wow, that's horrible. Oh my god, I can't believe how bad this is. I wish I could kill myself. So while Freeze tries freezing the world, Ivy tries to seduce the dynamic duo. And here's something you never thought you'd see in this movie. A man kissing a woman. No, Robin, no. You're just confused. But rubber lips sink ships as Batman and Robin put their few behind them and are ready to kick some green thumbs. Meanwhile, Barbara finds out what anyone with a brain cell could, that Bruce and Dick are Batman and Robin. And you gotta love her expression when she finds it out. <laughs> she finds the Batcave where a virtual reality Alfred, I know, just go with it, tells her that he knew she would find out who they were, discover the Batcave, and has even prepared a Batsuit for her to go out and fight crime. Oh, well, of course. So Barbara helps her colleagues by becoming the fearsome Batgirl, the only character in this movie who should have bat nipples, but doesn't seem to have them. I never thought a cat fight between Uma Thurman and Alicia Silverstone could be so boring. So she defeats Poison Ivy by knocking her into her own man-eating plant. I think the only thing missing here is for Poison Ivy to shout out curses. Go ahead, say it. I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker! You know you want to. You know you want to do every cliche in the book. Go ahead. Say it! Say it! Say it! Curses! God damn this movie! It did it! It finally did it! Batman has driven me batshit crazy! Oh. <sighs> Tranquilizers. Always come prepared when Joel Schumacher's involved. Hmm. So Batgirl saves the dynamic duel and reveals her secret identity. Bruce, it's me, Barbara. A butcher to ba Barbara? Who would have guessed? That mask just hides your face so well.
I find that unlikely. So the three of them set out to stop Freeze after having a change of wardrobe, apparently, and plan to unfreeze the city. It's unlikely to reverse a freezing process. Sunrise in five hours. Here. But it's morning in the Congo. If we could relay the sunlight. From the other side of the equator. It'll take the satellites about a minute to realign. Satellites could be positioned to thaw the city directly, but that'd take a computer genius. I'm on it. All right, I'll set the telescope, you thaw the mirrors. Oh, thank God I don't care. So through a series of lame lines, ridiculous stunts, and over-the-top effects, our heroes defeat Mr. Freeze and blow up his giant ray gun. Wow. Just think about how many starving children we could have saved with the money used for these effects. Talk about your cold shoulder. After that, they melt all that nasty snow covering Gotham down to your simple basic rubber icicles. But wait a minute, what about Alfred? Isn't he still at death's door? Well, luckily, Freeze's wife has the exact same disease as Alfred, and having a change of heart gives Batman the cure that he kept in his suit. And he didn't use this on his wife because... So as you can imagine, they put Freeze in jail, get the cure to Alfred, and they all live happily ever after. But wait, what to do about Barbara? You are going back to school. Bruce, you're never going to win this argument. Partners? Partners. So you see, kids, the moral of the story is drop your studies, forget all about school, dress up in tight leather, and live your life as a superhero. Why? Because Batman said it's okay. I say this is a horrible lesson for the kids, but I don't think it really matters. No kid ever saw this movie. Batman was a gigantic bat bomb. Bat bomb. Bat bomb. Why? Because this film is so terrible, so horrific, and so god awfully bad that there's only one word that could possibly sum it up. You want to know what that word is? I'll tell you. It's super crap a fuck horrific it's Biala bullshit. A film so bad the censors really ought to go and pull it. Sadly, there's not many words that only rhyme with bullshit. Super crap a fuck horrific it's Biala bullshit. Fuck a little bit, fuck it alive, fuck a little bit, fuck it alive. Here's a film that's so awful, I'd rather have a guy Come circumcise me with an axe and poke me in the eye I'd rather drink a giant bowl of ape and monkey's blue And there's another million things that I would rather do Super crap a fuck horrific, it's be all a bullshit Film so bad the censors really ought to go and pull it Sadly there's not many words that only rhyme with bullshit Super crap a fuck horrific, it's be all a bullshit No really though, it's, it's awful think of our prequel to DC's Avengers Part 1, we accomplished what Marvel did in several movies with just one movie, with the exact same results. I'd rather we saw a good Batman Superman movie. What? I thought you liked it. No! Kinda. Well, then you did like it? No. Kinda! Well, then what's the problem? People have been waiting years to see this team up. Yeah, and the choices you made were just so, so DC. This is arguably the most anticipated comic book movie of all time, in that people have been waiting to see it even before it was announced. There have been several comics where Batman and Superman are together, as well as cartoons. But, despite there being tons of Batman and Superman movies, there had never been one with them together. 
However, with the Marvel crossovers proving to be exceptionally successful, DC felt it was time to throw their hat into the ring and use this as a means to start their own DC Cinematic Universe. Despite a very strong opening, its box office dropped a shocking 68% the following weekend. How bad is that? Batman and Robin's second weekend had a 63% drop. Wow. That means more people went back to see that film rather than Batman vs. Superman. What the hell have you done, Zack? Alright, well, why don't you just start from the beginning of the film? Alright! Wait, wait, you're just playing a few minutes for Batman Begins. Exactly! exactly. After showing a flashback we've seen done so much, I'm surprised there's not action figures of it, we cut to yet another flashback of Bruce driving through Metropolis when it was being destroyed by Zod. Vague business associate, you have to get out of Metropolis. Why? Oh, wow, good thing you called me. I never would have looked out the window to notice that. I will avenge you, man, the audience barely knows. As well as all the lives we're only now acknowledging might be Superman's fault! Flash forward a year later as, thank God, Lois figures out Clark Kent is Superman and they discuss their future together. Clark, I'm concerned. People were shot to death in the desert and they're blaming you for... some... reason. Hey, Zack, what's that about? Yeah, what's that about? Well, if you can't see how they would mistake Superman shooting people to death... Yeah, who do they think he is, Batman? I don't think I should have to explain the obvious. Besides, this leads to a very deep conversation. I just don't know if the world is ready to accept you, or if what you're doing is right, or if it is right, if it's just gonna make things worse. You're standing in the bathtub. I'm standing in the bathtub. I feel like we were discussing some very important issues here. But I'm standing in the bathtub. Eh, good point. But it looks like one of the people intimidated by soups is Lex Luthor, played remarkably without an apology by Jesse Eisenberg. Hey, Mr. Standard Man, look what I got! A shiny green rock that can weaken Kryptonians! I'll let you have it if you give me access to Zod's ship. You seem completely unbalanced. Why would I give you access to any of that? Because I've got Jolly Ranchers! Sold! <laughs> Cherry! Cherry. By the way, Wonder Woman's in this movie. Hello! Okay, so what's the problem? Come on. First, Jesse Eisenberg. Second, if Superman took down military satellites trying to track him, why the hell didn't he take Zod's ship, a weapon from Krypton, away from them? Third, Jesse Eisenberg. Fourth, there's no reason for Luther to hate Superman here. In the comics and movies, Superman foils his evil plans constantly, so it makes sense to try to kill him. But in this movie, if anything, Lex Luthor benefits from Superman as he said he has contracts to rebuild everything that was destroyed. His motivations are completely backward. Well, like everyone else, he's afraid of Superman's massive power and ability to destroy. He makes Doomsday later! That's like Superman's with a fist for a brain! And what was that other thing? Oh, yeah. Oh. Jesse Eisenberg! Huh? Whether you want to call him Lex Luthor Jr. or whatever, this is a beyond awkward performance. Even at his corniest, Lex is a powerful, charming, diabolical mastermind. He always had a cool attitude, a business type mindset, and a suave, calculating demeanor. This guy is more like Roger Rabbit if he was a supervillain. But at least he introduces Clark Kent to Bruce Wayne. That'll really get them hating each other. Yeah, but why? We have a vague understanding of why Batman hates Superman, but there's really no reason Superman should hate Batman. So nice to meet you, Bruce Wayne. The pleasure's all mine, Clark Kent. I hear Batman is trampling on civil liberties, making people live in fear, thinking he's above the law. I hear Superman is powerfully dangerous, putting tons of people in harm's way. If there's even a 1% chance that he's unstable, he must be destroyed. By the way, Wonder Woman's in this movie. Hello. Howdy, boys. God, I love bringing people together. This reminds me of the time that I ended up... Who's the pipsqueak? That's Lex Luthor. No! Right, so. Does he ever shut up? I don't know. Let's ask him. I can't fall! Huh. Well, I guess I had that coming. See you later, boys. Smokin'! This is like a bad dream, man. No, that's my department. 
What? Yeah. I want most people to look at me and say he was such a good Batman, he could do most of it in his sleep. So I do most of it in my sleep. In fact, this is a dream sequence right now. No kidding. Yeah. Subplots, future characters, things you don't understand yet, so it must be clever. Hello. <gasps> Master Wayne, what is it? I just don't know, Commissioner Alfred. I just feel like the motivations of the next film are being figured out before the motivations of this film. Well, that's still not going to get me grandchildren anytime soon. <sighs> not this again. Yes, this again. It gets even weirder when Batman is chasing down some guys who have the kryptonite and Superman stops him right in his tracks for pretty much no reason. Well, by only weakness that can kill you. I hate you. Why? Because you're a vigilante. You're a vigilante. I hate you because you're responsible for a ton of deaths. You're responsible for a ton of deaths. That's ridiculous. I value human life much more than you ever will. Just stop hypocriting where I'm hypocriting. Go back to Gotham. It's literally across the street. Tell me something. Do you bleed? Whoa, 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 we're cool, we're cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. Listen, detective, if I'm so bloodthirsty as you say I am, why haven't I killed you already? Because I intimidate you? Boo. You never answered me. Do you bleed? You will. What did you say? Nothing, nothing. A real mature! So you guys don't think Batman and Superman have enough reasons to hate each other. But hey, you gotta give me credit. Lex Luthor, his plan's pretty amazing. How? By inviting Superman to the Capitol building and then blowing it up, causing people to hate him more. But even in the movie, they know he didn't do it. And why would Superman use a bomb? He doesn't need one. But it's okay because he scares Superman into exile. What, was that Lex's plan? I don't know. I mean, yes, yes, that's exactly what he wants. Why does he make another Kryptonian then? He tricks the incredibly advanced Kryptonian technology using fake fingerprints and forces it to genetically combine his DNA with that of Zod. You know, genetic mutation is forbidden by Kryptonians. But they're all dead, so it really doesn't matter. Even though your fingerprints convince me otherwise, I'll roll with it. Boy, don't you wish this is how all advanced technology worked? This phone is password protected. Yeah, but the guy who owned it died. Oh. Okay, here's all his info. Jackpot! Oh, hey, whose phone is that? Ah, it's yours. What? Uh, hey, give me that! Ooh, look at all the Spartan porn! I don't need this! I'm friends with Christopher Nolan! So while in exile, Clark comes across his dead father building a snow fort. This is either because A, he's a ghost, B, Clark's hallucinating, C, more inconsistent Kryptonian technology, or D, if this is really your biggest question through all of this, you're on Quaaludes. Not up. Okay. Meanwhile, Luther's men sneak up on Lois and kidnap her. Oh, oh, don't worry. This happens all the time. I brought my own chloroform. <sighs> and she wakes up on top of Lex's building. <gasps> Hello, my dear. Aha! I knew it! Through my journalistic skills, I figured out it was you, thus completing my incredibly essential role to this film. Oh, you figured out that Lex Luthor was the bad guy, huh? Real brain scratcher there. Nobody else would have figured that one out. You really solidified yourself as a necessity there. You know what I was doing while you were figuring out that incredible info? I figured out who Superman was, I figured out who Batman was, and I planned two kidnappings to take place on the night that he was planning to finish him off. See, see, there you go. And you know what the best part is? I did all of that off screen. So even I don't know how I did all this impossible shit. Um. Phew, is it chilly up here? Or is that just the cold uselessness of your character? Hey, I'm really important. Oh yeah, sure. Let's get to the one thing that we know you're good at. <laughs> Thank you, I really am important. It's over, Luther. Your mama says blah. Says blah? No, but she will when I slit her throat. <laughs> now go kill Batman because I think it'd be cool. Okay. 
this is it. We barely have a reason to hate each other, except we hate the fact that the other one kills. I'll kill you for that! Eh? Eh? Pretty high drama, huh? Or isn't this it? Isn't this what you've always wanted to see? Yeah, it's what we've always wanted to see, but not why we wanted to see it. We want to see Batman and Superman fight because they have different ideologies that we enjoy. One is dark and aggressive, the other is kind and hopeful. Seeing two points of view that are different but we identify with go head and head is deep and conflicting drama. But Superman is fighting to save his mom and Batman is fighting because he pretty much does what he does. It's not an epic fight if the motivations are weak. It is the literal definition of forced. Yeah, but isn't it so cool the way Batman swings him around like a yo-yo? Yeah. yeah. And isn't it cool the way Superman punches him across the building? Yeah. yeah. And wasn't it cool when Batman sprayed him with kryptonite gas or just minutes later he could stab him with a kryptonite spear? Wait a minute. Why didn't he just stab him with the spear first? Huh? Yeah, if this is a battle of brains as well as brawn, why didn't Batman just stab him as his first move? I... Uh, well... Look! Aquaman's in the movie! Hello? Answer the question! Okay, we did it so people could see more of them fighting. I'm cool! And there's your problem. They see them fighting, but they don't experience them fighting. Anyone can just watch two people fight. Hell, you can just take two strangers, put them in Batman and Superman costumes, and have them do cool stuff. But if you're constantly questioning why throughout the whole thing, you're not experiencing it. You're constantly being distracted by elements that don't add up. But perhaps you didn't hear me. Aquaman's in the movie! Hello. <sighs> Cyborg? No, Zack. No. Batman has the upper hand until an amazing discovery is made. Martha! What? What'd you say? I need to save Martha! Oh my god. My mother's still alive. No, you idiot! Your mothers have the same name. This instantly erases all hatred. From now on, you and I will be best friends. I'll throw this over here then. Haha! <laughs> <laughs> I've created the ultimate Kryptonian devil! I'll just go and grab that, then. Oh, fuck! I'm drowning in the water! What is this, like the fourth time? I'll save you, Lois, and I'll grab the spear, which is the only thing that weakens me. I'm important! Yeah, you used to be. And I'm Batman. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> I've done it! I've created the ultimate Kryptonian devil! Candy? Oh! On my face! I have your spirit all over my face! What's going on here, Lex? I thought you hated Kryptonians. Now you've made another one. Your plan makes no sense. <sighs> you don't get it. My plan is chaos. God versus God. Anarchy. The bell has been rung. Ding, 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 ding. Let's put a smile on that face. Lex Luther. Uh-huh. You're portraying Lex Luther right now. That's nothing. Wait till you see how well we understand Doomsday. Doomsday? Yes, we wrote him so he's a combo of Lex and Zod's DNA, creating... Roar! Roar! I am your Doomsday! Roar! I will find him! But that's not what Doomsday looks like! Oh? What did you expect? A monster evolved from cloning thousands of alien babies dying and being reborn until it created the ultimate killing machine? Like in the comic? Yeah! Well, why would that look anything like Zod and Luther's goddamn DNA? Roar, roar, A combination of Zod and Luther should look exactly like that. Zod and Luther. Where did this double-sized, double-muscle, brain-dead, dick-missing creature come from? In fact, wait a minute. Lex Luther combining his DNA with Kryptonian DNA to create an uncontrollable monster? That's Nuclear Man! Oh my god, Zack Snyder is getting inspiration from Superman 4, the worst Superman movie ever! But, but, we got Doomsday in the movie! Dude, this isn't a contest for how much shit you can jam in this movie. We loved these characters because they were given time to develop. Just because you give them the same name doesn't automatically make them the same character. But what if we had the Flash? Shut the hell. Up. Okay. 
So after Wonder Woman finally joins the team... Hello! Oh, I can stay this time? Awesome. Batman has a great idea! We need to lure him into the city towards the kryptonite, where all the innocent people are. Wouldn't it be easier to bring the easily transportable kryptonite here? <sighs> don't you watch these movies? We don't save people from destruction, we bring it to them! Then Superman has a great idea. I'm gonna sacrifice myself to save us all. Are you sure? Yes, even though there's probably a thousand other ways we can be doing this right now, but no, I'm gonna sacrifice myself. No, I meant, are you sure you're gonna kill him? Because wasn't killing Zod a big deal in the first one? Yeah, but I got over it. We seem to do that a lot. Ah! I will fight him! Superman rushes towards Doomsday with the kryptonite spear, and... He dies. Superman dies in the second movie. Well, don't forget, there's even more than that. We use even more Jesus symbolism. Don't worry, we'll get through all the stations of the cross. Luther is sent to jail. See? I have a bald head now. I'm totally Lex Luther. Why so serious? And just when you think he's really gone for good, a few specks of dirt rise from his coffin, hinting that maybe, just maybe, he'll come back. Thus, we've combined the most famous Batman and Superman stories into one emotional package, giving you exactly what you've always wanted to see. Come on. see the Justice League at his funeral, but now I can't. I want to see a hero slowly stripped of his life in the ultimate battle instead of just being stabbed in one swoop, but now I can't. I want to build a connection with this Superman the same way he built a connection with me in hundreds of stories, but now I can't. I want to fear that this might be the time that Superman doesn't make it back, but now I can't. How many comics were there before Superman died? I don't know. Hundreds! Thousands! And how many movies did you make with him? Two. Two! You killed him in two movies and you barely even focused on him! You know what I want to see? I want to see you earn Superman's death! This isn't fucking Jimmy Olsen! This is goddamn Superman! He deserves your time and respect! Ditto. This movie is trying to be Marvel, The Dark Knight, Wonder Woman, Justice League, The Death of Superman, and Batman vs. Superman, when Batman vs. Superman would have been more than enough. The reason we love so many of the stories that you were trying to fit into this is because each one was its own individual story. The Death of Superman wasn't also a prequel to Suicide Squad or the retelling of Dark Knight Returns. It focused on one story and allowed us to get invested. Sure, you have to compromise a story when it comes to making a movie, but when you lose the heart and soul of what made that story so special, is it worth just squeezing in instead of devoting the time it deserves? So, uh, that's what you really think, huh? Well, I'm sorry that my movie didn't please you in the least. Oh no, a lot of it was pretty awesome. What?! As much as so many of those scenes suck, there's a lot of scenes that are friggin' amazing! The action, the visuals, Affleck as Batman, Irons as Alfred. When it did certain parts of the comic right, it was a pretty kick-ass film. So wait, did you like it or not? Uh, I mean, uh, it's not good. I am glad that I saw it. If you're just looking for Batman and Superman to fight each other, you'll get it. It's just not in a story that makes any sense. It's got a lot of cool scenes that are hard to say not to go check it out. So, in a strange way, I'm still recommending it. I suppose that's all over the map, but then again, your movie's all over the map. So I guess it comes full circle. If those are your thoughts, then why did you come all the way out of here then? Well, uh, we were thinking that uh, maybe we could write the next one?
That is a very violent man. Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. Ah! What the hell is this? Why are the nipples on the outside of me? Ooh, hot entrance, Critic. Have I ever let you know that my interest in you isn't purely professional, or do I need skin-tight vinyl and a whip? Tamara, you're a freaking professional! Why are you suddenly acting so weirdly horny? I'm just representing how an out-of-touch gay man thinks that straight women act. <laughs> Malcolm, why are you suddenly a white guy? And a very annoying one at that! I'll tell you right after I finish mugging for the camera. <laughs> stop it! Stop it! All of you! Who's responsible for all this? He is! Hello, critic. It's your old friend, Joe. <gasps> the mocker! Nostalgia Critics has gotten too dark for some viewers' time. I'm here to make it more kid-friendly, colorful, and nippleicious. You won't get away with this, Mocker! I know you don't like it, but I was just doing what the studio demanded. Yeah, but I apologize. I'm just trying to do something more colorful for the kids. Oh, you don't need to apologize. Now, I understand you're frustrated, but why don't we sit down and talk about it over some herbal tea? Okay, that does sound really nice. No! I won't let the fact that you're a decent human being get in front of the fact that you make horrible crap! It's Earl Grey. Oh, I love Earl Grey. That's like my favorite. No! I need someone who won't fall for your kindness. I need a geek. An angry geek. A last angry geek! Last? Really? Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of angry geeks. Millions. Okay, I don't know why he calls himself that either, but I'm calling it! <laughs> Don't judge me. I very much am. <laughs> All right, Mocker. It's time we... It's time we put an end to your insanity. Now don't be that way. Why don't I order us some lattes and we can sit down and discuss artistic styles and interpretations? He is very nice. Isn't so he? He is nice. just the nicest he's guy. Just want to eat him. But it won't work! We did an entire riff track on how your style ruined Batman Forever. You did? Yes, and it's still available. For anyone to purchase! The cameos by Mike Nelson. Kevin Murphy. And Bill Corbett. Good times are just a back click away. Ha! Well, that was recorded years ago. You couldn't possibly find any fault in Batman Forever now. Why? Yeah. I don't know. I just needed a segue into the review. Yeah, there's like a million jokes about this movie. Yeah, we should probably just get to it. Batman Forever. After the 1989 smash hit Batman, producers were excited to see if the follow-up, Batman Returns, would deliver as big a financial punch. The film didn't quite deliver what the studio wanted, with many parents complaining it was too dark for children. This resulted in child-friendly merchandise being pulled, most notably McDonald's Happy Meal toys. Not wanting to go through that again, the studio pushed director Tim Burton into a producing role and handed control over to Joel Schumacher. He agreed to make the third installment, Batman Forever, more lighthearted and marketable, and it seemed to pay off as it made more money than the previous installment. Schumacher is best known for his following epic, Ice Puns and Ass, but a lot of people ignore what a cluster of goofiness Batman Forever is, seemingly giving it a pass. We're here to see if that pass is warranted, or if it deserves to be tossed in the Snyder pile. Pile of what? You know what. Let's take a look at this batshit insanity with Batman Forever. After being assaulted by the big names in this movie, interpret that as you will, we see Batman, played this time by Val Kilmer, getting ready to ride a Batmobile so phallic that even H.R. Geiger's original design looked less penisy. And if you think they're not going to overcorrect the Happy Meal tie in from the last film, take a look at this actual opening line. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through. Well, can't act like they didn't set the bar low from the very start. 
It's such a weird line, clearly done just for a McDonald's ad. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through tomatoes, crisp lettuce, two cheeses, and a superhero bun. It doesn't fit in the movie at all. The only way it could work is if it was literally followed by this. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through Two cheeseburgers, a large fries, and uh, I got a movie out, so just give me whatever plastic schlock with my face on it you got. Bingo. Batman drives to the second bank of Gotham in Chinatown? As a crime boss named Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones instead of Billy D. Williams. Only the finest of art forms remedy this. You know I love the Italian mobster in that. <laughs> He's robbing a bank and juggling his split personality of a district attorney and a burping monkey. You know Tommy Lee Jones told Jim Carrey he hated him because he couldn't sanction his buffoonery? The blood drained from his face uh, wow. and hugged me and said, I hate you. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. See ya! <laughs> Makes sense to me. I'm just wondering how acid can turn one half of your face into plastic purple latex. <laughs> As you probably guess, he often flips a coin to decide who lives and who dies. Fortune smiles, another day of wine and roses. But, but you said you'd let me live! Too true! And so you shall! I mean, I'll kill you later, but I'm letting you live for a few minutes. I'm a district attorney, I can always find a loophole. Batman arrives on the scene to meet up with psychiatrist Dr. Chase Meridian, played by Nicole Kidman. Hot entrance. A dedicated professional, as you can see. Gordon is trying to figure out how to save the hostages inside, but Batman has more important issues to confront. Like convincing a stranger that bats aren't rodents. I could write a hell of a paper on a grown man who dresses like a flying rodent. Oh no, you didn't. Bats aren't rodents, Dr. Meridian. You are interesting. Your ability to wiki search intrigues me. By the way, do you have a first name or do I just call you Bats? Oh, what, is there a bank robbery or something? Oh yeah, there totally is. We'll start this party with a bat! Well, we know Dr. Meridian sure did. Batman breaks in and fights off a gang of Mexican wrestlers while also trying to get the cameraman a tripod. Does that device turn people into Roger Rabbit? Oh, apparently it spread to the music, too. Well, the composer ran out of money, so he just started going... It's a trap! It's a trap! Composer. Two-Face lifts the vault into the air, filling it with acid to rain down on the people of Gotham and their... multicolored windows. Medieval Times is more subtle with their color use. He uses his grappling hook to break through the incredibly weak concrete, which also supports a giant metal safe because it's suddenly the strongest concrete in the world. I knew they shouldn't have used this stuff. Two-Face flies his helicopter towards the... statue of Gothamy. It was a gift from French Metropolis. But both Two-Face and Batman jump out in time, leading to... Can we just start a pointless Schumacher slow-mo count? Only if I can start a Val Kilmer mouth-hanging open count. But that clashes with my Christian Bale mouth-hanging open count. Oh, let's look at the menu. If you share the slow-mo count with a Jim Carrey making an excited he farted face count... Then you can share the Val Kilmer mouth hanging open count with Christian Bale's mouth hanging open count! And who gets the bad news? We, we all, all do. do. Harvey Two-Face is still at large and extremely dangerous. Wow. Batman the Animated Series did not age well. That's supposed to look realistic. It's not. I know it's not. Speaking of which, we're introduced to Jim Carrey as Edward Nigma, a name so ridiculous even the animated series refused to believe he didn't just make it up. What did you mean, a joke on his name? His name's Edward Nigma. I get it. Enigma. Edward. Edward Nigma. Look at us. Two of a kind! Huh? At first I thought Carrey's portrayal of Nigma was a little too over the top, but after internet culture and fanboys blew up... I'm Nigma Rick! Woman on the dog dog! Yeah, it might be too subtle. Nigma is obsessed with Bruce Wayne and wants him to okay his device that beams TV signals directly into the human brain. I'm sorry, Ed, then the answer is no. Tampering with people's brain waves, mind manipulation. It just sounds like cable news. 
It just raises too many questions. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. Bruce sees the bat signal and uses the um, bat pipe to transport himself to the bat cave. Oh, that must have been a lot of fun for the builders to put in. Alfred threw his back out a lot after setting that up. Chair. Does he really see no problem arising with that setup? Boy, Bruce, this is a really comfortable chair. <laughs> it turns out the call came from Dr. Meridian. Commissioner Gordon? He's at home. I sent the signal. No, trust me, you're sending all the signals. And thus we partake in one-liner theater. You're trying to get under my cape, Doctor? A girl can't live by psychosis alone. It's the car, right? Chicks love the car. Oh! Oh! I know the opening line for the next film! Oh, black rubber. Try firemen, less to take off. This is sexual harassment and I don't have to take it. My life's an open book. You read? I'll bring the wine, you bring your scarred psyche. Or do I need skin-tight vinyl and a whip? lady, what's your PhD in bad pickup lines? Come to think of it, what was she shaking earlier? Commissioner Gordon bat blocks them, showing up in his pajamas. I saw the signal, what's going on? False alarm. Are you sure? I so wish there was an emergency just so I could see him fight crime in his pajamas. Oh, you saw my director's cut. Nigma, meanwhile, kidnaps his boss and uses his device on him. Yay, you made Spy Kids 3D. And because this film isn't subtle enough. <laughs> Clearly, dignity has been returned to the Dark Knight. Fred! After stealing his brainwaves, Nigma kills his boss, and we're showing the most cinematic court show ever. Was horribly scarred by Boss Maroney. Although Badman tried to save him, dense left brain damage transformed him into a violent criminal. Blame Batman. Well, there you go. One third of the Dark Knight movie condensed into two sentences. Shouldn't he want revenge on the crime boss? Also, is Batman testifying in court? Is he a valid witness if no one knows who he is? It just raises too many questions. No, no shit! shit! Bruce is given a riddle in his office after it's revealed that Nigma's boss seems to have jumped to his death. Yep. Definitely suicide. Best commissioner ever. Meanwhile, we see Wayne Enterprises apparently hands out really shitty paychecks as Nigma's home slash someone else's closet is being used to send more threatening riddles. Bruce takes one of them to a <clears throat> professional. Dr. Meridian, please. Eh, that wish. You can figure out the rest. Bruce hears threatening sounds from her office, but it looks like she was just doing her usual in-office boxing before a session. Are you sure he's supposed to be the crazy looking one here? And of course he gets her in-depth expert advice. This letter writer is a total wacko. At this point I'd actually trust wacko more than you! He's obsessed with you. His only escape may be to purge the fixation. So not only is he a wacko, but you've jumped to the conclusion that he's a guy. I think we established he's not a good psychiatrist. The two of them hit it off, I guess. They more play I Spy of obvious symbolism in the room. You have a thing for bats? She's a Malaysian dream warden. She protects you from bad dreams. And he invites her to the Gotham Charity Circus. <laughs> a Joel Schumacher film, you say? Schumacher looks at men the same way Michael Bay looks at women. And men, the more I think about it. It's here that we're introduced to the Flying Graysons. One of them soon to be Robin, the 25-year-old boy wonder. I'm totally 15, you guys. I'm like into Pokemon or whatever. But Two-Face interrupts the televised circus performance. You know those common circus performances you see all the time on TV. And tells the crowd that if Batman's identity isn't revealed, he'll blow everybody up. Batman, bruised, broken, bleeding in a word. Dead! <laughs> The Graysons try to stop the bomb, but Two-Face guns them down, leaving only Dick. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. The day is saved, but young Grayson is left without a family. To demonstrate Schumacher's understanding of this tremendous loss, we cut immediately to a horse humping a rock. Okay, I'm out of here. Excuse me? Like I figured telling that cop I'd stay here for a while saved me a truckload of social service interviews and charity, so... Uh... No offense, but no thanks. Well, you're legally an adult, so do whatever the hell you want. 
Get a fix on Two Face. I don't want to kill him. Killing Two Face won't take the pain away. It'll make it worse. <laughs> I mean, I felt great when I killed the Joker, but it probably wouldn't fit you. Bruce says, forget your parents and fix my bike, which Dick immediately agrees to. But it looks like Batman is being called to an emergency that will never be addressed, so Alfred is left to tend to Bruce's dick. I know what I said. Is this a Robin? My brother's wire broke. I swung out and grabbed him. My father said I was his hero. I flew in like a Robin. Some hero I turned out to be. Ah, uh, but your father was right. The first time, anyway. Meanwhile, Two-Face ambushes Batman on his way to the crime we'll never see as, once again, we're introduced to the world's strongest frickin' grappling hook. Tune in next time, kids! Same batshit implausibility, same batshit movie! Meanwhile, Nygma is trying to figure out what to call his alternate identity, but his Geico caveman puppet apparently has an idea. Thank you. I shall be the green light bulb. Meanwhile, Two Face sulks in his split layer. Yeah, that's as complex as his character is gonna get, folks. Well, apparently the Riddler is waiting there too. Don't mind me. I'll just be waiting for the assistant director to cue me. I made your favorite a sterno and grain alcohol. Straight up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> or as Drew Barrymore calls it, a starter. We have two minds about what to eat first. <laughs> The green light bulb! The Riddler comes out of literally hiding and says he can help him kill Batman if Two-Face lets him live. But Batman... <gasps> There's a challenge. Flash of blood and then what? Post-homicidal depression. <laughs> Did you enjoy my Porg impression? The combination of Max Hedrum and a green skittle tells Two-Face that if he gets his device on every television in town, he'll help him get Batman. Two-Face reluctantly agrees. Reluctant for him or us? Pick one. Okay. They rob every place they can to mass produce his invention. <laughs> ah, his superpower is to magically shrink diamonds mid-edit. Teamed with Two-Face, this new criminal's pattern of marking his crimes with puzzles has Gothamites calling him the Riddler. Wouldn't they be calling him the ripoff artist? I mean, obviously the Riddler-type character exists in this world from all the toys Nygma had, so why don't people recognize it? It'd be like if a killer wore a Spider-Man costume and called himself the Red Lobster. I sure that would be a better name. How many spiders are red? Nygma gets enough money to sell his device and even finally gives it a name. The box in every home in America and one day the world. It's a cone. Edward Nygma's 3D box has become- It's a cone. Critics have claimed the box turns Gothamite- Cone! There's hardly a home without the Nygma tech box. The box. Cone! I don't know why you have such a problem saying you're watching Jim Carrey's box. Now I get it. Meanwhile, Alfred wants to make sure he can use the entrance to the Batcave while his dick is occupied. Yeah. Sheesh! You can hop on one foot and catch up to the door in time. Yeah, Batman's got some hardcore security there. Have everything turned on while a meek voice goes intruder alert. Uh, here we are, it's the Bats Cave! Intruder oh, alert! there goes the voice! I guess it means we gots to go! Yo, oh, but the Batmobile just rolled in with the music and everything! Can we take a spin in it? Didn't you hear the voice? It called us intruders! Think about that! Nah, you're right, that would be pretty rude. Now let's get out of here before it calls us ruffians. Oh wait, quick selfie, real quick. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just to know we've been here. Intruder okay, alert. Intruder alert. Meanwhile, Bruce and Chase get ready for their date. Bruce opens with his most romantic phrases. My parents were murdered in front of me when I was just a kid. You really know all the pickup lines. But he literally gets jealous of himself as Chase leaves her bad porn out. Maybe I'll leave you too long. Well, try not posing with a smile on the cover of Time, you egomaniac. Did you get my bad side? But Alfred lets him know that his dick has gone traveling as he cruises around town in the Batmobile. Wait a minute, that's not Batman. What are you talking about? 
this bat boy? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm like totally a little kid. I'm watching Ben 10 or whatever. That's not bad, man. Oh wait, that's the circus kid Bruce Wayne adopted. Oh, Bruce Wayne's totally Batman. You have to be a genius to figure that out. I'm gonna put it on Snapchat. It looks like a girl is in trouble at this laser tag arcade, but Good Hardy Dick is on the way to save her. He's dick feeded, but the gang language of a whistle signals the other members to attack. Uh, hello. Batman here. Trying to look threatening. Not for crying out loud. Batman! Batman saves him after getting his cape caught. No, really, that happens. Getting some harsh reactions from his dick. If you don't do this anywhere, the circus! Still be alive! If Bruce Wayne could have given his life for your family, he would have. Will you tell Bruce Wayne I hate him? Oh, jeez, you dumbass. Bruce goes to wipe the sweat away. Lord knows it took a lot out of him to jump, and that's it. As he makes it clear that Grayson don't know dick. So you're willing to take a life. It will happen this way. You make the kill. Yeah. But your pain doesn't die with Harvey. It grows. Cool. So you run out into the night to find another face. Awesome. And another. Even better. And another. This is literally my dream, you know that, Bruce. I'm a part of this whether you like it or not. What are you gonna do? Replace me with Joseph Gordon-Levitt? <laughs> so everyone gathers to see the new version of Nygma's box? Cone! Let it go. As Nygma seems to be the toast of the town. How does it feel to be the city's newest <laughs> eligible bachelor? Gotham must know! Oh! Is everyone's acting channeling a constant orgasm? I think that's bad. Check out this guy who tries Nygma's latest invention. You're dashing and a genius. The hell is up with that guy? I think a rabid baboon would be less awkward. <laughs> Shall we dance? I was asking you. So while therapist and the world's greatest detective couldn't figure out this is the Riddler, Wayne is duped into a mind-reading machine which is interrupted by Two-Face. This gives time for him to break free and once again refuse to enter through a door. Are there any normal extras in this movie? They put on a stunt show and try doing their version of the Raiders of the Lost Ark gun scene. It doesn't work. Don't worry, we don't blame you, Stuntman. Not in any way resembling Val Kilmer. As Two-Face moves on to Phase 2. <laughs> By the way, I can't sanction your buffoonery. Ooh, look! We have two pointless slow-mos and two Kilmer's mouths hanging open. And yet I feel so... empty. But Two-Face blasts him under a mountain of sand. <laughs> Enjoy! It's course rough and gets everywhere! But his dick saves him, making Bruce surprisingly unhappy. What the hell did you think you were doing? I had an out from this movie! They bicker and argue, but Bruce has no time for that. He's got a horny honey he's secretly stalking. Even Chase calls being Batman a curse. Never been in love before, Alfred. Perhaps the lady is just what the doctor ordered. She seems lovely and wise. Hot entrance. My place. Midnight. What is it about the wrong kind of man? Oh, do I need skin tight vinyl and a whip? Honestly, I think she's a creepier fan than Nygma. Nevertheless, Batman visits her and she admits she's more in love with Bruce than him. I'm sorry. I... I'm wishing you were somebody else. I've met someone. I hope you can understand. It's not even his personality, it's just something about his jawline. Oh, come on! And this, of course, gives us the bat nerp. <laughs> However, Nygma shows us the results of a Bruce Wayne mind reading. Riddle me this. What kind of a man has bats on the brain? Aquaman? While that's going on, Batman decides to give up his night job. From this day on, Batman is no more. Chase is... Coming over for dinner, I'm going to tell her everything. So just remember, folks, it wasn't a supervillain or dangerous stunt that ended Batman's career. It was a horny psychologist and his whiny dick. Actually, that makes a little too much sense. Bruce invites Chase over to tell her everything while kids go trick-or-treating at his house. Trick-or-treat! Release the hounds. 
As Bruce continues to have flashbacks, his dick flees in disgrace, and the Riddler and Two-Face find a way to sneak in. Twig or tweet! Yeah, don't forget to move that tray away from the door. There you go. They blow up the Batcave, kidnap Chase Meridian, and Two-Face keeps flipping his coin until he gets the side he wants. Just like the comic! I can't sanction this buffoon, no way! Too much buffoonery! If you kill him, you won't learn nothing. <laughs> As Bruce wakes up, he's told what happened, and the Riddler gets to continue his annoying Jim Carrey impression. Batman will come for me. Batman? Batman, you say? Coming for you? <laughs> I'd say this is over the top even for him. But seeing how the rest of Gotham acts, I'd say he fits right in. There! Who the hell's doing that? Catwoman. Who do you think? Meanwhile, Bruce and Alfred try to figure out the meaning of the riddles, realizing there's a number in each one, and perhaps they represent the alphabet. 18 is R. M. R. E. Mr. E. And another name for Mr. E. Enigma. Mr. E. Enigma. Edward Nigma. There's also a return address from Edward Nigma Industries, but your way worked too. And if for a split second you forgot Joel Schumacher directed this. But he's not the only one who wants to look ridiculous. R. What's that stand for? Ralph. I just always wanted to be called Ralph. Batman is rather easily convinced to let him come along now, as they go to stop the evildoers. Oh, I have no boat training! I'm gonna die in this thing! Thankfully, Batman also lets the police know they don't actually have to do their jobs. Well, I guess our work is done. Meanwhile, at Nickelodeon Studios, the Riddler and Two-Face try to foil our dynamic duo. Oh no, my dick! Hi. We've had a lot of fun with people named Dick today, but they're all good sports. So the next time you see your local Dick, why not go up to him and say, I know it's hard, Dick. Between the Joker's gun and a green light, the bat plane is pathetically easy to take down, isn't it? Holy rusted metal, Batman! Huh? You're grown, it's all metal, it's full of holes, you know? Holy! Oh. Ha 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 ha! We gotcha! The movie wouldn't be so silly to put that kind of line in there! However, lines like this. You're trying to get under my cape, Doctor? And this. I'll get drive through. And this. The car, right? Chicks love the car. Are totally fine. The two are separated, leaving Robin to fight Two-Face alone. That was for my mother! My father! My brother! My goldfish! My dog! My uncle you never met! I hope you have a small family. Batman reaches the Riddler, who looks like Elton John, Liberace, and Syndrome fused by Satan, as he reveals his evil plan. Soon my little box will be on countless TVs around the world, feeding me. Credit card numbers, bank codes, sexual fantasies, and little white lies. Wow, that's actually kind of relevant. Yeah, like legit clever commentary. I am not saying this is ahead of its time! Nope. I am not saying this is ahead of its time! He shows that he captured Chase and Robin. In fact, he weirdly looks less shocked that Robin is captured than Chase. Seriously, day one and you got caught. And the Riddler makes him choose which one dies. Which one will it be, Batman? Bruce's love? Or the Dark Knight's junior partner? I'll have the lasagna. But Batman seems to have a riddle for the Riddler. I see without seeing. To me, darkness is as clear as daylight. What am I? The Riders. You're as blind as a bat! Exactly. He puts on his computer specs because he needed help to hit the giant blender in the middle of the room, and the Riddler is turned into... Pizza dough? I have no idea. 
The Riddler ends up dropping them, but thankfully Batman's ego weighs more than them, so he's able to defy the laws of gravity to save them. In answer to what I choose, Nygma, I choose the same cop out answer that Spider Man took! Go me! <sighs> You're welcome. It was a mistake bringing you, and I'm never doing this again. <laughs> no more riddles, no more curtains one and two, just plain curtains. <laughs> I like curtains. Aren't you forgetting something, Harvey? Your coin. You're always of two minds about everything. Except when it's not, which we've established is most of the time. Batman makes it clear that it's wrong for Robin to kill, but him, on the other hand, he can totally keep looking for other faces to kill. And this one is two for one. He kind of explains this to Enigma. Ooh, I should have gotten vaccinated. You see, I'm both Bruce Wayne and Batman. Not because I have to be. Now, because I choose to be. Did I mention I'm not going to be in the next Batman movie? He's sent to Arkham Asylum, where the doctor is concerned about what he knows. Edward Nigma has been screaming for hours that he knows the true identity of Batman. And why my name is in the opening credits, even though I only have one line. Dr. Burton tells me you know who Batman is. Ben Affleck! Okay, he's clearly nuts. Bruce says goodbye to Chase, so I guess he did choose Batman over Bruce Wayne. Kind of cheating. And our dynamic duds run triumphant-ish into the night. Ha! Holds up pretty well, doesn't it? Well, while we appreciate you standing there in silence the whole time. Yeah, I like to listen. We still can't say it's a good Batman movie. I mean, okay, it's not Batman and Robin, and it's meant to be lighter in tone, but it just seems confused on whether it wants to be a comedy like the Adam West show, a drama like the Burton movies, and thus, it turns out, it doesn't succeed in either. Granted, it does have a few good ideas, and the visuals are still rather stunning in many respects, but it plays everything too safe, and that's not how Batman should be handled. Batman should be different, memorable, and inspired. This film is either annoyingly odd or boringly generic. If it didn't have the Batman name on it, it'd probably be forgotten quickly as a superhero flick. It's not the worst, but it's not that good either. It's a strange installment, but not strange enough to leave that big of an impact. Well, I respect your opinion. Come on, why don't we all sit down and have some tea together? I've already made some for Malcolm and Tamara. He really is a nice guy. You know, why not? Yeah, I mean, I know I don't always like your movies, Mocker, but you seem like a decent, down-to-earth guy. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember? <coughs> nostalgia Critic, the Justice League is in danger. Oh no! Their future is in great geo party. Please meet us at your studio and bring YouTubers with a connection to cinema. I can't believe such an original super team movie that broke all sorts of box office records is in peril. Well, if they want YouTubers with a connection to cinema, it's time to light the cinema signal. Or I could just give him a call. Hey, you want to get drunk and nitpick a movie? Critic, Chris. Critic, Barrett. Hello. Jeremy. I must say, I was very brave of you to physically transition into talking text with a ding at the end. You act as if I had a choice. Ding. Fantastic. The cinema sins are ready for action. There's only one other YouTuber connected to cinema, or at least has cinema in his name, that needs to make the long journey.
Hey, Cinema Snob, want to do a review? Sure. All right, Cinema Sins and the Cinema Snob, ready to save the Justice League. Wait a minute, aren't we forgetting about one other cinema-related YouTuber, Cinemassacre? <sighs> Chris, don't you remember? Cinemassacre died a long time ago. Did he? Didn't seem very convincing. Ah, of course he did, Chris. Just ask him yourself. Oh yeah, I'm totally dead. There, you see? I don't know. I just have a feeling he's not really dead. Also, is there something off about his upper lip? What are you talking about? My lip always looked this way. You're all stupid and I'm dead, so piss off. Eh, convinced me. Yes, now don't you come back and save us in our time of need. Dead people have a bad habit of doing that. Fucking weirdos. All right, after so much time building this up. We only spent a few minutes. Is he always like this? Worse. <laughs> time to unite the Justice League. Ah, there they are now. DC's biggest money makers, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Shazam, Joker. So what great danger did you summon us to take on? Oh no, we didn't summon you. You didn't? No, we're doing fine. Better than fine. He's the one that summoned you. Hey guys, it's me, Cyborg. From the Justice League. Teen Titans. Go. Anyway, I need your guys' help saving the Justice League. But why? Yeah, a lot of DC characters are doing great right now. For them, sure, but if Justice League doesn't become popular again, I may never get another movie. I guess in some respect I see what he's talking about. With the Marvel Cinematic Universe changing the landscape of box office hits, DC was rushing to catch up on the potential gold mine that lay before them. They released superhero movies that were all connected, similar to what Marvel had started five years earlier. But where Marvel gracefully eased people into how their world worked with individual hero stories, DC threw unfinished Wikipedia pages posing as films. As some have pointed out, DC's cinematic lineup was the equivalent of going from Iron Man to Civil War to Guardians of the Galaxy to Captain America to the Avengers, about as straightforward as a curvy metal rod game at carnivals. On top of that, due to a family tragedy, Zack Snyder had to leave as director and was replaced by Joss Whedon, and they're about as polar opposite as you can get. So the tone of the film seemed to juggle back and forth as well. Because of this, Justice League underperformed at the box office, still making its money back, but not becoming the record breaker DC was hoping for. Exactly! And now DC is doing movies that barely tie into a continuing story, and they're... Making boy! So you see, unless people see the value in a DC Cinematic Universe that connects, there could be no more Justice League, and thus, no more me. All right, listen, Jax. Kano! I mean, Cyborg! That's what he said. I don't remember this movie being the greatest, but I remember it being better than DC's other stinkers. Yes, with the overflowing positivity we give in most of our videos, I'm sure we can find something of value here. <laughs> Let's get to it, then. This is our review of the one and only, for now, Justice League. I was promised booze. In the kitchen. Well, this movie had a smaller budget than I thought. The studio was okay when Whedon said he wanted to turn this into a found footage movie. So one of the biggest criticisms is that Henry Cavill was under contract not to shave his mustache when shooting Mission Impossible 6. Which means they had to digitally remove it when he came back to play Superman. But this movie had a budget of over 300 million dollars. I'm sure they made it look okay. Let's do some questions? Ah! Mm. Christ, did he brush his teeth with kryptonite toothpaste? Yeah, I didn't know Mouse Man was in this movie. Still waiting on his own film, DC. What's the best thing about planet Earth? You can keep stealing from Marvel and no one will care. By the way, Superman never does answer this question in the movie. Presumably his legal team interrupted before cutting. What's the best thing about planet Earth? You don't have to answer that question. Cut to Gotham City, or the set of holy musical Batman, where a criminal's robbing a pigeon trainer's house? Hey, they made coin, man. He stopped by the Cape Crusader, though, played by Ben Affleck. What are you doing? No, wait! Wait, wait! <laughs> We're finally gonna see what happened to Johnny Gobbs. 
It turns out Batman was using this criminal's fear to lure out an alien menace known as the Parademons. For such a cool name, why did they look like the B-Twins from The Tick? I just wanted to tempt your tummy with the taste of nuts and honey. He blows up, but Batman is afraid there might be more. Or rather, the criminal is afraid there might be more. <laughs> yeah, things are cool between them now. What was that? A scout. From space. Like an alien army? Alfred, are you seeing this? Alfred? You Bruce Wayne? <laughs> I thought you had a way in his jawline! It's cause they know he's dead, right? Superman, where does that leave us? Still able to rob shit. Hello, you're a criminal. The opening credits show a world without Superman, which apparently means a lot more violence, a lot more slow-mo, and a lot more slow songs. Eh, yeah, Snyder's used to ripping off himself. He can do it again with these credits. Drop your guns now! We then see the Kingsman seizing the central criminal court. Uh, bang? As Wonder Woman, played by Gal Gadot, decides now is a good time to come out of retirement. Yeah, not 9-11, World War II, or anything like that. Just this place being blown up. But how does this tie into the plot? To remind you that Wonder Woman was a hit. Yeah, but I thought that... Mm. Who are you? You're too late. The countdown's already begun. Of course the code to disarm it is 3615 and damn lasso! I'm glad the people are safe, but poor birds. We see Batman approaching a village where Aquaman, played by Jason Momoa, is the dolphin rack he said to constantly save the day. If fight comes, we'll need you. Don't count on a Batman. Did you hear that? That guy's Batman! Nah, I heard he looked like the guy from Twilight. Strong man as strong as alone. You ever hear of Superman? He died fighting next to me. I know, because I originally tried to kill him. It's a complicated story, but don't worry, it makes no sense. Ha, shaved. Now no one will know that was me. One misses the days when one's biggest concerns were exploding wind-up penguins. Yeah, I also miss Bane. We next see The Flash, played by Ezra Miller, visiting his father in prison. Hurry it up, will ya? <laughs> oh, I get it! Yeah. I can't sit here and watch you run in place for some old dude who's not going anywhere. Dad, that's not the time. Fun. As you may have noticed, these character backstories are quickly rushed, so you aren't given much time to connect with them. Yeah, Marvel had a bad habit of giving most of the Avengers their own movies, so they didn't need to explain much when they met up. Ooh, wait, are you telling me that the Suicide Squad doesn't make any appearance in this movie? No. Okay, good. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about! Like, look at my intro. It's mostly just talking. There's no flashbacks. It's just me saying what happened to me rather than showing what happened to me. I can access everything. I lost your mother in that accident. The box stays hidden. I got a language in my head that I don't speak. That is a good point. I mean, what were your thoughts about Black Widow and Iron Man 2? She was in Iron Man 2? Exactly. But the more she interacts with others, the more she forms her character. People want to see her in her own movie now because she had unique scenes with unique interactions. Here we have Cyborg having a brooding talk in his apartment, a brooding talk on a rooftop, and I think a brooding talk against a green screen. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny, what's up? I have a problem with Lisa. She said that I hit her. <sighs> What? Why are we suddenly supposed to be invested after that? See, that's what I'm talking about, man. You just gotta be your own thing. You don't need to have the connection with them, baby. Yeah, if I was gonna fight Ben Affleck's Batman, I'd be like a million years old. Hell, Batman's a vigilante and they sell toys of him in my universe. Let, Let it go. go. Let, Let it go. go. No! I believe in the sanctity of the Justice League and all of me getting my own, all of us getting our own movie. I haven't said anything in a while, so ding! Meanwhile, on Thermos, um, Amazon Island... I already made that joke. I already don't care. The Amazons guard a powerful device called the Mother Box. Mother Box? Yeah, she married the GameCube and gave birth to the Game Boy. Huh. As something awakens it, causing great distress. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! Does it feel good to be out of there? A bargain basement Thanos appears named Steppenwolf, voiced by Kieran Hines, who tries to steal the mother box for himself. I 
At last, you call me home. Oh my god, Superman's upper lip has mutated and become the villain of this movie. No, no, it's just an unwanted Soul Calibur character, even down to the weapon he uses. <laughs> Steppenwolf wins. I turned down a cameo in Game of Thrones for this. Ha! Take that, Marvel. We didn't wait for the end to get our shitty sky portal. We threw it in right in the first 30 minutes. Steppenwolf grabs the mother box and the Amazon signal Diana by firing a flaming arrow, burning down an ancient monumental building. You know a phone could work. Lois Lane, played by Amy Adams, talks about the death of Clark while a seemingly hilarious news story plays. My Howard is a good man, and these aliens are gonna f probe him? But I'll stick a f probe up your aliens. Gee, I wonder if this was a Joss Whedon written scene. This janitor's wife has some strong words for the aliens she says stole her man. <laughs> Seriously, we all know aliens are real. So if you see your husband, let us know. But swearing ladies, right? <laughs> who was your source? Um, the activist. Who was your guy? Well, I'll see if she'll take your call. <laughs> so it's a she. Oh, next you'll be telling me they can leave the kitchens and fight crime. Oh, scandal! It's not a shame. We apologize for this confusing lesson. We now return you to your superhero movie. Thankfully, Diana meets up with Bruce, as let's be honest, they're the closest thing to any chemistry of any kind in this movie. Oh, I don't know. I think Bruce and Alfred's romance will send hearts aflutter. I think there's an attack coming. It's already here. Diana tells us about Steppenwolf while showing us what clearly should have been the climax of this movie, as men, Amazon, Fish, and Ryan Reynolds Nightmares fought him off from collecting three mother boxes to rule the everything. All the tribes of men fought side by side. Even the gods themselves all acted as one. Now it's six people who look like dirty amusement park statues. Look, Mom! I'm next to Wonder Woman! Wow! Okay, so I'm not entirely sure why all these armies can't just get together again, but we do get everyone's favorite part about the movie, The Flash. That's right! Everybody who saw this movie could get behind The Flash. Oh yeah, I do remember him being pretty funny in this movie. Yeah, it's nice to get some comedy in these gloomy DC films. Tell me about this. The person who looks exactly like me, but who is definitely not me. Okay, that, that, that was a rocky start, but I remember the rest of his stuff being pretty funny. My special skills include uh, viola, uh, web design, fluent in sign language, gorilla sign language. <laughs> that old gorilla sign language routine. Caused me to burn a tremendous amount of calories, so I am just a black hole of snacks. I am a snack hole. Were we just looking for anything to like about this movie? Oh, hey, it's gotta be a lot better than CW Flash, which has... Anybody here seen that show? I have. And? We're in trouble. Okay. You don't get it, man. Everybody was like, DC, you're too gloomy. You need to lighten up. Well, now we have some comedy for you. I mean, yeah, I guess because we saw a little humor in these movies, we thought it was okay, but... But now looking back, it's... Like brunch. What is brunch? You wait in line for an hour for- Oh, oh shut, shut up, Joss Whedon! Hey, lay off. That's our shawarma. I mean, something totally original. Could I have a sip of that? Yeah. It's not- Um, what if he had the wrong guy? Bruce Wayne would just have another dead kid he'd have to mop up. It's not- Oh, that's the sixth Flash I've killed this week. After watching what clearly should have been the introduction of Aquaman... <laughs> Lunchtime. He goes back to his kingdom to try and stop Steppenwolf as well as continue to have no chemistry with Amber Heard. When my parents fought in the wars, she took me in. What a saint. You dare speak of Queen Atlanta that way. Oh, thank God, we're back to two people talking in left-right justified shots. We missed you in your three-minute absence. Steppenwolf gets the mother box and sets up camp in Russia. Finally, HBO tells us the truth about Chernobyl. Unsatisfied with his pictures of Spider-Man, J.K. Simmons as Gordon sees pictures of Batman aren't much better, as he summons him to save kidnapped people at Gotham Harbor. Do you really think that... Oh, wow, they just... they really just vanish. Huh? Oh. That's rude. Hey, he's a vital part to these movies, man. A vital part! Listen to me now! Lois Lane's the key! Find us! Find 
find us, Bruce! Yeah, I don't think we're following through with that anymore. Oh, okay. Wait! I need to tell you about brunch! What is that? A vital part. Steppenwolf starts killing people until he's told where to find what he's looking for. Where is my mother box? <laughs> that still sounds so funny. As the Justice League turns into the Injustice League, the whole fight sequence has the effects of a DC video game. Boy, you really feel the weight of movement in every scene, don't you? Sure, the weight of the hand moving a mouse and getting carpal tunnel is very felt here. Uh, did I just score? Thanks, Alfred. But I'll take it from here. Uh, d do I know you? Did Brucey get another boy toy while I was out? Aquaman joins the fight as well. I mention this as an afterthought because the movie does too. And they fight Steppenwolf off. However, Cyborg finds the final mother box, and they go to the Batcave. Via... animated Technodrome elevator. Wow, it's like a cave! Like a Batcave. Look, if you just imagine him less as a superhero and more as Jason from The Good Place, this really works a lot better. This is a person who looks exactly like me, but who is definitely not me. I mean, Jason? Who is Jason? Uh, so is this a, a bad time to bring up my blood sugar? You got it, homie. I give good advice. See, that works. That works. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Justice League! We got you, man. We got you. We cost more than the Avengers, and we look better than the Avengers. I am so sorry about all this. Booyah! Booyah! Batman has a plan to use the Mother Box to bring Superman back to life, as he feels he's the missing key to defeating Steppenwolf. Superman is dead. We don't know what state he's in. Don't you bat explain to me! Superman was a beacon to the world. That's why a lot of the world feared him, and I tried to kill him. So Party City somehow sneaks into this high security base, and they dig up Superman, but make fist bump jokes, so it's not creepy. Okay, we're not ready for... Racially charged. I'm glad we all agree that Justice League grave robbing is cute. They use the technology to bring him back to life. Superman lives! God, that would have made this more fun. No, I mean he's resurrected, but with his memories all screwed up. So he sees the Justice League as a threat. <laughs> and they said they'd never make a sequel to Brightburn. What does it say when the best part of a $300 million superhero movie is an eye turn? I know you. You resurrected me with the shitty upper lip. Clark. His real name's Clark? God, next to Bruce Wayne, you guys suck at keeping identities! Lois arrives, hopefully knocking some sense into his brain, or at least into his shorts, while Steppenwolf steals the final mother box, which they left totally unguarded. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, something is definitely bleeding. Thanks, Joss! Guys, I've done it. I found the perfect way to make you see the genius of this movie. I brought back Cinemassacre as a pissed off super mecha death cry. <laughs> see, isn't that awesomely epic? Yes, it's awesome. But it's not really epic. What? How? We knew he was gonna come back anyway, and it's not really furthering anything. If anything, it kind of just slows stuff down. It, it's awesome, so it's awesomely epic. Oh, come on, sweetie. It's what you've all been waiting for. Everybody loves you, buddy. Everybody loves me, buddy. That's right. Again, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll be over here then. Yeah, this studio didn't have enough holes. Kinda like this movie! Ding! Superman takes Lois to the farm, where it's always permanently magic hour o'clock, when, after coming back from the dead, this is what they have to say to each other. You smell good. 
Did I not before? Thanks, Thanks Joss. Joss. Don't worry, it gets stranger. What was it like? Coming back? Itchy. Okay, seriously, did a preschool write this? You smell good. Did I not before? What was it like coming back? Itchy. <laughs> Here's a Zen riddle. What's flatter in this scene? The green screen or his acting? Just got out of a wooden box. I mean, honestly, weird in so many ways. This is nice. I do hope that they include Steppenwolf nuking the world in the background. Their ignoring of Armageddon just shows how much they're in love. You called mom. You do have better chemistry with her than Lois. The team gets ready to take him on, but not before Aquaman reveals some embarrassing secrets. You're gorgeous and fierce. And you know what? I don't want to die. Maybe I'm scared because... Eh, yeah, screw it. Let's keep it going. Game of Thrones is overrated. Bad Batch is underrated. There aren't enough jokes about me being in Stargate Atlantis. And I banged Nicole Kidman. But she likes to say she banged me. Something many people have noticed is the climax of this movie changed from having a darker gray sky to a neon red sky. What do they think this is, Batman the Animated Series? Actually, he is animated for most of this. It checks out. Even when they get off the plane, the color correction goes from steel blue to Garfield orange. Honestly, it matches the inconsistencies for the rest of the climax. Like how they're flying parademons that are supposed to be scary. But also Nickelodeon slime is their blood. <laughs> Don't forget how they're focusing mainly on this one family, but suddenly it's revealed there's more to be saved, even though we never see them. What are you talking about? There's some in that corner of the screen, and there's some in that corner of the screen? At least in Man of Steel, we can clearly see who's being ignored. Oh, speaking of which, he's back. Wow, I really thought he was going to sit this one out. Hey, at least it earned one of the most awkward Batman faces ever given. Hmm, I think that face goes here. Part of the reason the climax feels so empty, I mean apart from everything being set up backwards, is the CG is not only fake, but also cluttered. Because this is an alien design, it's hard to keep up with what we're looking at. Avengers, an amazingly cheaper movie to make, didn't always have convincing effects, but it was in a location we all recognize and well lit. So we're not always asking are we on a building, in a building, far away, or really close. Everything is somehow too dark and too bright at the same time, with heavy shadows for a darker background, but a lighter background given instead. Even the colors look really rushed. I mean, I know it's gonna sound weird, but with the obvious green screen fake effects and turned up colors, it kind of looks like one of my reviews. The greatest combination of heroes should not look like a review show I put together in a week. You stopped that box from destroying all life on Earth. Hey look, the Batman v Superman poster. Thanks, Justice League. Steppenwolf is defeated, the mother box is separated, Flash does his Jeff Goldblum pose, and Cyborg says booyah. Booyah. Ha <laughs> ha, that's gonna be my thing and my movie. It's pointless. <sighs> hey, thanks, Superman 4! The day is saved as the town turns into the ending of Princess Mononoke, and the team decide they need a headquarters for future <laughs> sequels. Big round table. Six chairs, right there. But room for more. Though you and Superman might look a little different. Uh, this is a crime scene. Is there no damn police tape? The film ends with Superman and Flash racing. Again, they'll tell you who wins in the sequel. And even Pipsqueak Luther has a cameo after the credits. He and his odd little friends are forming some sort of league. Shouldn't we have a league of our own? Out. 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 So, what did you guys think? Wow. That did not hold up as well as I remember. And I remember it only being okay at best. But come on, guys. For a movie that's seven years old, I think it's allowed to show its age. It's only two years old. Huh, this movie's garbage. And there's only one thing left to be done. There's only one beacon of hope that can save the day. I said there's only one beacon of hope that can save the day. Oh. Oh, okay, G give me a second. No! 
Yes! Even though the most popular of us had perished. You know we have more subscribers than all of you combined. He came back, saved the day, and most importantly, we were emotionally invested every step of the way. By God, this epicness was earned! You're fucking weird. Fucking weirdos. But I don't get it. How is blowing up Justice League saving Justice League? Because you don't want to be like this Justice League. Yeah, you want to be like this Justice League. Or this Justice League. Or any of these. What, the stuff you watch on TV? They don't even have a continuing story half the time. Exactly. And they're doing really damn good right now. Justice League didn't work because it was the end result of trying to do the same thing the MCU did, only darker and not as focused. Where the animated DC shows and movies had similar worlds and characters, but never one continual story. It would change up a little bit in each one. Hell, I can't even count how many times Superman died in them. But each one felt big and epic because it was planning to tell one good story, not looking ahead to others. And those are the stories DC is doing best right now, the self-contained ones, the ones that have as little connection as possible to the previous DC movies, not only stand on their own, but they also allow the most variety. With cast members, time periods, and even styles constantly being switched around, DC may have more of a unique voice allowing exactly that, more unique voices. Justice League was two very different voices coming together to serve what felt like a corporate environment. DC movies now are feeling more individual, personal, and carrying more weight. Yeah, it sucks we may never get that complete universe like what Marvel has, but this would allow DC to truly be something different, maybe even something better in the long run. Some people have said there could be several different Joker origin movies with several different actors, or as the Joker says, If I'm going to have a past, I prefer it to be multiple choice. While Justice League is nowhere near the worst superhero movie, it's a step away from the potential of what DC films could be giving us. Bottom line, if you want Justice League to thrive, continue to stop doing what Marvel is doing and keep doing what DC is doing. Yeah, come to our side. We could be deep, dark, and have money. And have audiences love you. That does sound nice, but... No! By going that route, it means that Justice League was just a big sellout. It never had any real story, any real depth, and it'll never lead to me being in a movie ever again. So no, I can never join you. I will stand by the story that Justice League has started. I will stand- Cyborg, get your agent. Good news, baby. You got your own solo movie <laughs> without the Justice League. Hey! hey, hey, hey. Right. Congrats. Now, the real question is, are you going to go with it, or are you going to stick with the integrity of the Justice League? <laughs> yeah, art means more when it pays more. I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I'm the Cinema Snob. And, and we're, we're Cinema, Cinema Sins. Sins. DC future is gonna be weird. Let's just so it's a good weird. Oh yeah. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. It's the week of Christmas in 2020. What holiday film best connects with this year? <laughs> Might be too happy. Released in summer of 1992, fa la 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 la. Batman Returns was Tim Burton's sequel to his record-breaking Batman in 1989. While folks were excited to see it, the reaction afterwards was something like this. People didn't know what to make of it. They were certainly expecting something dark, but this... Yikes. Toy companies, especially McDonald's Happy Meals, panicked because parents were so pissed off something so demented and unpleasant was being marketed to kids. Why can't we go back to more innocent times of Terminator, Robocop, and Alien Toys? You moron! Since then, people haven't really known what to make of this film. Naturally, it has its fans and its haters, but most people I talk to put it in the I don't want to think about it because I don't know what to think about it category. 
Does it make you stronger watching it? Does it make you weaker watching it? I don't know, it just clearly does... something. So naturally, I think this is the perfect film to look over this holiday season. Let's celebrate Christmas the most appropriate way I can think of. This is Batman Returns. We see Pee-wee's playhouse has changed since he entered the 1%, but his freaky occupants have not. For his wife gives birth to a bouncing baby abomination, which honestly is about as good as a Pee-wee birth can go in my opinion. <laughs> Thankfully, they had a baby cage ready. I'll assume that's an item the rich have. But he finishes off his calf food and they decide to give him up for adoption or bridge. That's, a, that's another option. <laughs> well, I'm in the Christmas spirit. Merry Christmas from Kenner. You know, this really should have been a Disney film. It would have gotten a G. He floats through the sewers and is intercepted by penguins. Yes, that will be the most normal part of the story. And we cut to years later where Gotham City is having their massive... ish... lighting of the tree. About to attend this event is Christopher Walken playing business mogul Max Shrek. Uh, named after the actor from Nosferatu, not a DreamWorks energy drink. And I gotta say, in most films he brings 80, maybe 90% walk into a role, but this flick he brings 100% walk in. Everything he says sounds like an impression of himself. That's not growth, that's a mild swelling. I could hand out more than just expensive baubles. Bruce, shame on you. Selena, you on? Come on down. Yes. You could literally change the character's name to Christopher Walken and nobody would bat an eye. How industrious. He's proposing a new power plant that I think a three-year-old designed. So he can obtain, well... More power! Um, I have a suggestion. Michelle Pfeiffer plays Selena Kyle, a dorky secretary who may be a power plant specialist? Am I the only one driven nuts? We never hear her suggestion. I'm afraid we haven't properly housebroken, Ms. Kyle. Hey, fuck you, buddy! Dad, Mr. Mayor, it's time to go down and bring joy to the masses. Oh my god, we found the only other actor bringing more walk-in than walk-in to the role. Andrew Brynjarski, Zangi from the Street Fighter movie, because this film clearly wasn't weird enough, plays Max's son, Chip. I honestly have no idea why he's a character in this. You could cut him out and not miss a thing. I just love that he does an impression of Walken straight to his face throughout the entire movie. Dad, you buy that blurry business? Time to go down and bring joy to the masses. Dad, go! Save yourself! Dad, go! Walken, the whole film, has a look like... What's with that voice? It sounds weird. Tim, tell him to stop being weird! While making a speech, the circus comes to town and attacks the crowd. I have to admit, I love that all it takes for the cops to call Batman is one of their cars being dented. What are you waiting for? The signal! Uh, sir, we have a SWAT team coming in. Look, for some reason we suck at fighting clowns! He's good at fighting clowns! Let him fight clowns! The signal is reflected in the Wayne Manor library, which looks cool, but what was the excuse he had for setting that up? Mr. Wayne, you want giant reflectors to shine the bat signal into your library, which you'll presumably be in all the time? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Okay. Batman arrives, and I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about the whole Batman killing thing. Some people have very strict rules about Batman, like he doesn't carry guns and he doesn't kill. Despite him doing both several times in the past. My personal take is, do whatever matches the version. Would Conroy or Bale kill people? No, with the exception of bullshit loopholes. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. Real humanitarian. Would Keaton and Affleck? abso friggin lootly <laughs> Affleck? Maybe going for a few too many gold stars in that department. Should he kill? No. Would he kill? Probably. I mean, people are on fire. You think this Batman's gonna be like, all right, better get out of the car, knock the guy out, get back in the car, and make sure everyone is safely subdued. No, that would've cost like five civilians. Light that bitch. Also, I'll bring up what nobody does. When Batman kills somebody in the Burton films, it's hilarious. <laughs> If you're not laughing at these, you clearly need this sign before watching. <laughs> One clown takes Selena hostage, thus Batman telepathically summons the proper tool. The Batman. Or <laughs> is it just Batman? Do I look like that Twilight fop to you? Hey Frank, you know what this alley needs? What? A face. Okay. Shrek is kidnapped and taken to an abandoned zoo. Can't imagine why this place didn't stay in business. It looks so welcoming. And he comes across the penguin played by Danny DeVito. I believe the word you're looking for is... Ah! 
I believe the majority of this film's problems are around this one character. I mean, Batman's still cool, Catwoman's still cool, even Walken impersonating Walken is still cool, but this character is written as an absolute monster, but is directed like we're supposed to have some sympathy for him. Poor DeVito does an amazing job trying to pull off both, but it's kind of like taking a disgusting villain like Baron Harkonnen from Dune and saying we're supposed to feel bad for him like Ramesses from Prince of Egypt. You gotta go for one or the other. Tragic irony. Or poetic justice, you tell me. We'll go more into that in a bit, but for now, he tells Shrek he wants to ascend into society, and if he doesn't lend him a hand, he'll lend him one. How's Fred Atkins, your old partner? He's good. Hi, Max, remember me? I'm Fred's hand. I always like to assume that's not Fred's hand, and they just assumed he killed him, so they pulled a hand off another dead person. They just so happened to guess right. He doesn't even flinch when he shakes it as a joke. That's a face of a guy who's held a lot of dead body parts. Working right. Back in the office, Selena comes across some incriminating evidence showing that Shrek wants to use the power plant to suck power from the city, not generate it. Again, I know it makes me a sick asshole, but this scene's hilarious. Huh? <laughs> huh? You know, for a second there, you really frightened me. <laughs> I feel like that's just how Christopher Walken would tell a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Honestly, I really underestimated the humor in this movie watching it again. As a kid, watching her be brought back to life by alley cats and have a mental breakdown was pretty fucked up, but as an adult, it's still fucked up, but it's really funny. Stuffing the toys down the garbage disposal, spray painting her dollhouse, even the ad about winning the boss's affection from the company owned by the boss who tried to kill her. Then your boss will be asking you to stay after work for a candlelight staff meeting for two, exclusively at Shrek's department. I feel bad for her, but it's really friggin' hilarious. Pfeiffer, honestly like everyone, finds that perfect balance of tragedy, but also hamming it up. Look at those faces she makes. She plays crazy great, but you're also kind of giggling at it, too. I also love how this raincoat is supposed to somehow cover her entire body, and I don't sew, but I think these thimbles are a lawsuit waiting to happen. I don't know about you, Miss Kitty, but I feel so much yummier. Just as Catwoman is on the rise, the Penguin is, too, staging a rescue of the mayor's baby. You gotta love this convincing performance. No! It's the hideous Penguin Man! Here! Take the baby, just don't hurt me, please. He didn't spend three weeks at Matthew Broderick's community theater for nothing. All I want in return is a chance to find my mom and dad. Mr. Wayne, something wrong? No. That was code for please help me with this tree. I'm like a million and you're literally Batman. Douche. At first, Bruce is taken by the Penguin story, but upon more research, he finds he may have a more dangerous background. Also, because of this movie, I know Vichy Soie is supposed to be cold. Cold? It's Vichy Soie, sir. It's supposed to be cold. It's supposed to be cold. It's supposed He discovers the penguin might have been involved with a bunch of child disappearances in the past. Missing children in several towns. Police have closed down. Three triangles, fairgrounds. You hear that, kids? You think Batman saved all the children at the end, but there's God! knows how many little bodies in the penguin's backlog. Merry Christmas from Play-Doh. It looks like the penguin is already up to his old trick, saying he wants the Hall of Records to find his parents, but uses it to look up all of Gotham's firstborn sons. Are you concerned about that strange, heroic penguin person? I think he knows who his parents are. Sir, you don't have to do that voice in front of me. I know who you are. Douche. Penguin does eventually find his parents, continuing to win the people over. Penguin for his parents, I'm fully at peace with myself in the world. He's like a frog that became a friend. Nah, he's more like a penguin. I have no joke, I just love how stupid that line is. Catwoman also makes some progress, testing out her fighting moves on a mugger. Thanks, I <gasps> Nice, saw you first. Give me your wallet. You make it so easy, don't you? Always waiting for some bad man to save you. Uh, hypocrite much? You really should try being dropped from a tall building. It set me on the straight and narrow. Even after a nasty fall and a psychotic breakdown, she still shows up to her job. That's just a good work ethic. Selena, Selena. <laughs> That's my name, Maximilians. Don't wear it out or I'll make you buy me a new one. 
What I like is Bruce has clearly seen her before. He even slips up and says he remembers her. Yeah, we've met. Have we? I mistook me for somebody else. You mean mistook me. But it's not until she looks and acts completely bonkers that he's suddenly like, Say, you look like you wear black leather to cope too. I remember the time I forgot to wear my underpants to school and the name of the boy who noticed was Ricky Friedberg. He's dead now. Well, they say don't put your dick in crazy, but I don't sense any drama out of her. Women. Nothing surprises me, Chip. Except your late mother. Wait, mother's dead? I got a penguin to see. Speaking of which, Shrek surprises Penguin with his bright idea of having him run for mayor. Now you might be thinking who's gonna vote for a monstrous, sex-hungry maniac who abuses people. What am I talking about? He's overqualified. <laughs> Just look at how he handles people who make fun of him. My nose could be gushing blood. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas from Diet Coke. Shrek convinces him to be mayor as he can use his henchmen to drive the current mayor into a chaotic frenzy. Burn, baby, burn! Hashtag 2020. Hey parents, McDonald's here. We know you were upset with the Happy Meal toys we had for the new movie Batman Returns. Well, we're happy to announce we've updated our toys to be more authentic to the film you saw. It's the Batman Returns Toys Redux. My favorite is the penguin after he just bit someone's nose off. It's so bloody and disturbing I hope to never sleep tonight. My favorite is Catwoman after she went insane and got shot four times trying to seek vengeance. I hope I'm that mentally unstable when I grow up. My favorite is the circus train carrying lots of little boys like me to their watery graves. I'm terrified, but I'm told to smile for the commercial, so yay! Your kids will love them. And we're not just saying that because our founder is Batman. And if you're still unsatisfied, don't worry. The following two films will gladly sacrifice art so your little pipsqueaks can have something to play with while eating Chicken McNuggets. McDonald's. Yes, you can blame us for Batman and Robin. As Penguin said, he unleashes his goons on the city to blow up stores, steal valuable goods, tap people's heads. Monsters! But thankfully, Batman was out doing some bat shopping. Maybe he was going to the bat store. Wait, that was gonna be a thing in this movie? Th they actually built that? Huh. Maybe they had a line of credit and they called it, I'm not digging up old wounds. I bet this effect will age great. <laughs> Seamless. Meanwhile, Catwoman tears apart one of Shrek's department stores and again, give Pfeiffer credit for learning how to use a whip and apparently doing all these stunts herself. Years later, she even found her old whip and showed off she still has the moves. Needs a little TLC. That shouldn't be turning me on. Maybe it should. Either way, it's turning me on. I didn't know Batman needed exciting rounding the corner music, but it sounds very nice. Piss off, Wilhelm. Me, me! He approaches the penguin, but their meetup is quickly interrupted. She's thinking, ah, oh, shit, came across the only people who wouldn't be weirded out by any of this. They have themselves a little fight, and honestly, this is so silly, I can't help but love it. How could you? I'm a woman. I'm sorry, I, I... Ugh! Oh, we'll see if I help you open a jar anytime soon! Who's the man behind the bed? That's not you. At first I found it weird that Batman would actually be attracted to this, but like the killing thing, just because he shouldn't doesn't mean he wouldn't. I mean, look at these two and tell me they wouldn't attract one another. She gets away, but not without leaving her mark. Alfred, bring me some antiseptic ointment, would you? Oh, sorry, sir. I can't understand you unless you whisper in the bat suit like you did before. Bite me, Joffrey. Penguin announces his candidacy for mayor in the most ewy way possible. Wear a button. Let me just get it on that. Uh. Ew. And Catwoman makes her way to him, proposing that they team up to take out Batman. It's chilly in here. I'll warm you. Down, Oswald. Yeah, calm down there, Quentin. Check it out. We're gonna disassemble his Batmobile and turn it into an H-bomb on wheels. 
kind of curious how he got the plans for that. Uh, are you sure you want to eBay these? He wouldn't help me with the tree. He spat out my soup. He does his bat voice at random. I'm done with the son of a bitch. Okay. I know plenty of people who'd be interested in this. Get a good price and I'll throw in some shark repellent. Catwoman eats his bird, which apparently she really did. I'd like to think I'm prompted. And they get the idea to frame it. Selena and Bruce go on a date and discuss their past relationships. Hey, girlfriend? No, had one, didn't work. See, Vicky thought. Vicky? Ice skater or stewardess? Oh, well, that's what she is now. I ruined her career after dumping me. The Ice Princess has been kidnapped. They're interrupted, though, when they discover Gotham's mascot, the Ice Princess, has been kidnapped by the Penguin. Can you confirm for us the reports we're hearing of Batman's suspected involvement in the abduction? This evidence is purely circumstantial. But just in case we're not running the bat signal. They both take off, which is great when you realize they're just gonna meet up again to fight each other. But what's even better is Bruce putting together why his usual excuse won't work. I thought I had to go to town. Tell her there's a big business deal came up or something. I'm just gonna go out of town on business for a few days. You lied to me about leaving town. No, you know what? Let her know that none is I'm gonna dumb be my girlfriend. Tell her I'm Batman. I don't care. I gotta go. A drawbridge opens up and he takes a bat suit off one of the bat hangers. Because Schumacher directed for a minute. And he tries to search for the Ice Princess during the tree relighting, which surprisingly wasn't cancelled due to a kidnapping. He locates her, but finds Catwoman is awaiting his arrival. Eat floor. Uh! High fiber. Okay, fine, with two minutes that Schumacher directed. The princess is dropped from a building, looking like Batman pushed her, and bats are released on the crowd. But, look on the plus side. This. I wonder if Wonder Woman has this problem. Mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. Who decorates an antenna? <laughs> Jesus, no wonder he couldn't save the princess. He's been walking around with that stuffed up his ass the whole time. Let's consummate our fiendish union. Penguin celebrates their framing, but he proposes a little too much, and Catwoman swipes left. You're lousy minx, and I don't think I like you anymore! Penguin hooks a helicopter onto her, but she breaks free. Is her suit made out of animantium? How many falls has she survived? And things are made worse when the Penguin's goon sees control of the Batmobile via remote control. Oh, yeah, how come the cops only show up when a Batman's driving? He eventually gets control back and transforms into a bat penis to escape. The next day, Penguin makes a speech to continue to win the people over. Did the mayor have a plan? No! He relied on a man! A Batman! I'm asking you to vote for a Birdman! But not that Birdman! That is also Batman! They fan service all the crybabies that bitched about Vicky Vale in the first one. Who let Vicky Vale into the Batcave? I'm sitting there working and I turn around, there she is. Oh, hi Vic, come on in. Just, he was confessing, she figured it out. How many millionaires can vanish out the window? Whatever, and he plays audio of the penguin cursing the people he recorded the previous night. I'll take care of the squealing, wretched, pinhead puppets of Gotham. Ah, uh, remember the days when that could ruin your career as a politician? I played this stinking city like a harp from hell. <laughs> um, fake news? Oh, that's all it took? All right, cool. Yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, why is there always someone who brings lettuce and tomatoes to a speech? Why is there always someone who brings eggs and tomatoes to a speech? Because you're a cartoon. I don't know. He escapes back to his hideout where he continues his original plan, gathering all of Gotham's firstborn sons to drown them. And if you're wondering why Firstborn Sons, it's because in the original script, Shrek and Penguin were supposed to be brothers. Him being the abandoned Firstborn and Shrek being the prosperous Secondborn. Which would have been pretty interesting in my opinion, but it was cut, so the Firstborn thing is kind of random. And we will snatch them, carry them into the sewer, and toss them into a deep, dark, watery grave! Merry Christmas from the Batman Returns Gumball Dispenser! Bruce has given an invite to Shrek's Maxcaray Ball. Yes, that's really what they call it, and yes, I am insanely jealous of that pun. As he fixes the Batmobile. May we RSVP in the resoundingly negative? Not interested. Although, Selena Kyle might be there. Mm, this is why Superman works alone. He sees Selena at the party behind Red Death. That's a nice touch. And they follow through on their kinda excuses. Listen, I'm sorry about yesterday, but I had a 
pretty big deal come through, fall through action. Did he just make a joke about a woman falling to her death? Pretty big deal come through, fall through action. Again, must be this sick. Everyone in the film is great, but Pfeiffer really does knock it out of the park with scenes like this. We're literally in a head turn. She goes from crying to laughing. I don't know anymore, Bruce. <laughs> You're crazy. They eventually put together their secret identities, but it's interrupted by the penguin who kidnaps Shrek again and reveals his evil plan. Right now, my troops are fanning out across town for your children! Yes! You hear that, Commissioner? I still feel like this is a Batman thing. But they have an incredibly slow-moving, brightly colored train. We didn't even stop the Joker when he announced where he was going to be. Let him fight the clowns! I'm Loopy! Batman does exactly that, and... I guess that's the end of that plot thread. Not entirely sure why that was in the movie at all. And he moves on to plan B. Blow up Gotham with penguins. It's a, it's a weird film. The liberation of Gotham has begun! He whips out the bat ski boat, which really must have been exciting. I mean, how many times is a bat ski boat gonna be the answer? And they jam the penguin signal, turning them around. This film's full of anticlimaxes, isn't it? I would have paid good money to see Batman punch penguins. I can't even say that without laughing. He drops the penguin into the water because everybody has to fall in this movie, and he confronts Catwoman, who's confronting Shrek. Let's just take him to the police. Let us say, split right up the center. I love you so much, I take off my mascara for you in between shots. I just couldn't live with myself. Selena chooses vengeance over love, leading to easily the best line in the movie. Selena. Selena Kyle. You're fired. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if she just left after that? Oh, fired. Oh. It's pretty clear Max has to die after Batman's revealed, and that's exactly what happens. When Selena whips out the taser from before and combines it with the electricity behind him. Bruce, shame on you. Oh, and the penguin can really hold his breath a long time. Hey, a cool drink of ice water. Merry Christmas from the Golden Book Collection! What were we thinking? This leads to, well, this scene. The penguins come out and give him a funeral march without opposable thumbs and bury him in the water. Arthur, is this a warm moment, or should we be disturbed? No shit. Danny Elfman's music is beautiful, but what tender scenes am I supposed to look back on to make me miss him? Let me get it on that. Nope, not that one. Uh -huh, not that one either. Oh, that's not a keeper. I want to find out who I am by finding my parents. Huh? Okay, all right. Him wanting to belong to society. I can feel bad about that. Oh, wait, that was a ploy to find more kids to kill, and he was faking all of this. I think he knows who his parents are. Um, bridge it is! I'll miss you? Mary! Oh, just pretend we're Nightmare Before Christmas. Bruce swears he sees Selena on the way back, but it appears to only be her cat. Merry Christmas, Mr. Way. Goodwill toward men. And women. Yep, I, uh, I wanted to be equal. Yeah. The film ends with the bat signal being lit and Catwoman staring up at it, and fun fact, this was actually a last-minute addition. Mostly because audiences wanted to slit the wrist after watching this movie. I think that was a good add-on. Batman Returns has a lot of flaws. Mostly, like I said, around the Penguin character. Which is strange, because the elements are there to make him sympathetic. They just needed to take out that every other second he was trying to kill kids thing that went nowhere. You could have had it where he just wanted to belong to society, but then the corruption of the human world doomed him. There was a Batman the Animated Series episode that kind of did that. But making him such a constant blood-hungry monster just made the message confusing, and not in a complicated way, just a very clumsy way. Aside from that, though, yes, it is silly and all over the place, but it's also visually stunning, well-acted, and hilariously demented. Some of these plot threads even pop up in Mask of the Phantasm. The idea of Batman being framed and losing someone you love to vengeance. 
even flashing the signal at the end, despite I don't think Batman's name was ever officially cleared in either version. <laughs> if he just accepted his Tim Burton going all out, given a blank check, just doing whatever he wants, there is kind of a joy in how miserable it is. It's just so crazy and so brooding and so in your face unpleasant, you can't help but laugh at it. And I think that was the idea for the most part. I know it has its problems, but I can't help but love it for going all the way in on being so dark. If you're in the mood for a twisted Christmas film that's just barely a Christmas film by every definition, this is certainly the one to check out. And why wouldn't you be? It's been that kind of year. All sorts of misery and chaos resulting in a huge mess. Barely even feels like Christmas when you consider what everybody's been through. But in a strange way, that's almost kind of comforting. We've all gone through something together. Everybody has felt some form of sacrifice. Some have lost very little, others have lost a great deal. Even if you're one of the lucky ones who didn't get the worst of it, it's hard not to think of the people who did. But we get through it. That's what humanity is good at, getting through stuff, surviving, finding a way to press on. We always find a way, we work with it. So whatever path you find and whatever way you work with it, have the best holiday you can. Keep confident, stay strong, and be creative. Those are the things worth celebrating because those are the things that get us through so much. Merry Christmas to you all. We wish you nothing but the best. Do. It makes you see all of your worst fears. Haha, <laughs> that's not enough to destroy Batman. Don't worry, Batman. I'm like totally here to save the day. Batgirl, what happened to you? Whatever. I'm like totally the same. I'm Alfred's niece from England without a British accent. No, this doesn't feel right. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> Just take a look at Mr. Freeze. Nice to see you. Oh, no. It's not too bad. You finally get to wear a back suit with nipples on it. Oh, I was drunk when I recommended that. Are you sure? Because you pay for them on your bat credit card. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all wrong. Batman is dead. Batman is dead. No, he's not. Morgan Freeman, have you come to narrate my death? That man is too powerful of a character to be destroyed, even by all this. Oh, wait, did I mention we play hockey? I don't wear hockey pads. No, Batman. More competent people bring you back to life. Impossible. There's no coming back from this. Oh, yes, there is. There's in-depth character studies. Okay, that sounds grown up. One of the greatest Joker performances of all time. Okay, that's pretty cool. And one of the most memorable scenes in all movie history. That happens after the bat nipple shit. You bet it does. Wow, and I'm assuming the Scarecrow and Batgirl are treated with dignity? Not we still get hosed. But I'm still okay, that's all that matters. Thanks for that. Dip. Well, let's see how things get back on track. This is Dark Knight Mon. Crazy to think it's been over two decades since everything went to shit with Batman Cinematic World and almost two decades since it got back on track. We're here to look over Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy to see how they change comic book movies forever. That's right, most of them. And of course, have some laughs along the way about what still works and what doesn't. But the problem is, there's five spots in March and only three movies. So, I'm looking over the other two best Batman movies, Batman and Batman Mask of the Phantasm. It's gonna be a ton of fun discussing these films, so let's not waste any time. Let's start with where it all started, Batman Begins. in 2005 with very few people talking about Batman after the last movie, Batman Begins was the breath of fresh air the franchise desperately needed. Doing well, but not breaking any records, the film was almost a proof of concept to show that there was still a fan base for a serious Batman movie. 
and in my opinion, laid the groundwork for a lot of future comic book films. Just count the story and pacing similarities between this and Iron Man and you'll see what I'm talking about. I will admit, while it's a great Batman origin story, it's hard to say it's the perfect Batman film. There's still some problems here and there, but the great moments still hold up as legitimately great. And there certainly are a lot of those moments to look over, so let's dive right into it. This is... Batman or the Nostalgia Critic or... Yeah, how exactly does this work? Oh, it's very simple. <clears throat> I am the knight. You didn't have a punchline, did you? Movie's like two and a half hours, man. I got a lot to get through. Okay, I'm gonna go find the catering table in this warped fantasy thing I made. Yeah, do I technically even exist? <laughs> this is Batman Begins. It opens with a young Bruce Wayne and one of the maid's daughter, Rachel, playing in the backyard, but he stumbles into a cave filled with bats. Thank God that's what he found down there. If it was Bugs, his costume would look very different. Because Laura knows Nolan can't tell a story in order, we flash forward to modern day where Bruce, played now by Christian Bale, finds himself in a Bhutan prison. You are in hell, Litcher Man. <laughs> and I am the devil. Mr. Devil, can you let me eat my cat vomit first? I'm sure the chefs worked very hard on it. <laughs> Okay, first problem in this movie, the action sucks. They say Nolan wanted to do the opposite of Schumacher, but sure does feel like he took his close-up jumbled cinematography from Batman Forever. Cemetery for protection! I don't need protection! Protection for them! Your shaky cam nearly killed them! The world is too small for someone like Bruce Wayne to disappear. He's approached by a man representing Ra's al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson. I think most of us figured out early on this was Ra's al Ghul, but I will admit, I thought it was going to be a bit more clever. In the comic, he uses the Lazarus Pit to stay immortal, and I thought the idea here was Ra's al Ghul was an identity that was passed down over the years. So after Ra's played by Ken Watanabe dies, this one takes his place. In a way, making Ra's al Ghul immortal. Is Ra's al Ghul immortal? Are his methods supernatural? But no, it's just a decoy. This is the original... Egyptian Raz. Hey, you know, if these pass as Egyptian, anything's possible. Someone like you is only here by choice. Whatever your original intentions, you have become truly lost. You're a YouTuber, aren't you? There is a rare blue flower that grows on the eastern slopes. He tells Bruce to bring a rare flower to a mountain village if he wishes to join the League of Shadows. Jesus, that's some intense fine print for a download. He flashes back to when he was a kid again with his mother, father, and Alfred, played by Michael Caine. One day she'll be mine. His father, who speaks entirely in platitudes. All creatures feel fear, especially the scary ones. A little bit of opera goes a long way. Why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. Never judge a book by its cover. What you see is what you get. Loose lips. Sink ships. Brags about how the Wayne family is essentially Mr. Rogers if he wasn't so lazy. The city's been suffering, so we build a new cheap public transportation system. Your father nearly bankrupted Wayne Enterprises combating poverty. Your great great grandfather was involved in the Underground Railroad. Okay, I get them being good people, but this idea that the Wayne family has midi-chlorians of goodness passed down takes away that any common person can be as virtuous as our lead. Like, you have to be born in a great bloodline of amazingness. Is that where you work? No, I work at the hospital. Oh, Jesus, yeah, that's where I put my hands on them and they can walk again. <laughs> they take Bruce to a show, and here's a shock. A kid doesn't want to stay for an opera. Go, go. We've been here for like six hours! Well, that's Wagner. It's only the overture. They exit to the back alley. As rich people leaving an opera do. Where they're approached by a mugger and shot dead in front of Bruce's eyes. I barely got a line. Bruce, don't be afraid. Cut back to modern day where we see Bruce training with the League of Shadows and I'll come I guess I never needed to know what happened in between Bruce's parents getting shot and him becoming Batman. I actually enjoyed the mystery and them keeping it vague, but this movie wanted to try something different from the others, and it does it very well. His journey is really fascinating, and you feel legit transformation and growth from him. My only gripe is Neeson's monotone does wear a little bit. You have learned to bury your guilt. I will teach you to confront it. You know how to fight six men. We can teach you how to engage 600. Ninjutsu employs explosive powders. Crime cannot be tolerated. 
He sounds like a boring version of that Fatboy Slim video. He was a farmer, and he tried to take his neighbor's land. You can go with this, or you can go with that. Your parents' death was not your fault. The will to act. You can go with this, or you can go with that. Cut back to years earlier when Bruce returns home back from college. Will you be heading back to Princeton after the hearing, sir? Or? I'm not heading back at all. I must say, sir, your progress is lacking. I mean, you're 35 and you still haven't graduated. Yeah, Bale doesn't exactly pull off a convincing college student, but to his credit, Katie Holmes as Rachel never pulls off a convincing adult. Rachel Doss, who authorized that? Tell him we'll need our own assessment on the judge's desk by morning. I can't say she's bad in this, but she has the DiCaprio problem. She's so young looking, it looks like she's trick-or-treating half the time. What chance does Gotham have when the good people do nothing? That and I never noticed. She smirks at moments she really shouldn't smirk. The Falcone may not have killed your parents. The man I loved, he never came back at all. My boss has been missing for two days. Your father would be ashamed of you. Why are you saying that like you won a really sick bet? Bruce goes to a hearing for the man who killed his parents, who's being set free because he handed over information about a mob boss named Falcone. Bruce is about to get revenge, but literally misses his shot. Falcone says hi. Dude, that was my kill! He goes to confront Falcone, played by Tom Wilkinson. But big surprise, he ain't all that scared. Not everyone at Gotham's afraid of you. A couple off-duty cops and a judge. Now, I wouldn't have a second right Now, that's power you can't buy. I really love this scene because it's explaining a lot of character motivation, but it's done by someone I believe would do it like this. He's telling him all this because it's Bruce Wayne and he did have the guts to approach him. But he's also out of his league, not aware of the type of power he has. And he would show off that power. Because your mommy and your daddy got shot. You know about the ugly side of life, but you don't. You've never tasted desperate. The pro and con of Nolan's writing is that he lets the story do all the work and hopefully character follows with it. This scene is a perfect example of that working. It sets everything in motion perfectly. You feel Bruce's frustration, but no, Falcone is right. And he would gloat about it. Don't come down here with your anger, trying to prove something to yourself. Ah, the original warning that we're gonna have for social media. He gives his coat and money to a homeless man. It's a nice coat. Maybe I'll start a costume shop with this. I might visit you if you do. And he enters sort of the crime world. What was your friend you want? Tell that to the guy who owned these. Get it? He stole from himself, so he didn't really become a criminal! <laughs> Again, I would have liked him more if he really did hit rock bottom, but it does show him stealing to help someone, probably giving birth to the idea of being a vigilante. Surprisingly, that is one of the more believable elements in this. There's so much corruption from the people who are supposed to be helping that you do see why he would go this route. He also shows he'd do anything for the League of Shadows, but he won't do that! Your compassion is a weakness your enemies will not share. That's why it's so important. Jesus, some of these lines are good. <laughs> they make the mistake of explaining that they're going to destroy Gotham before he kills the guy proving his loyalty. As they see it as a city so corrupt it must be severed from the rest of the world. Like Constantinople or Rome before it, and must be allowed to die. It is one we performed for centuries. Well, for the people who took down Rome and Constantinople, they sure are taken down by one guy with a sword pretty easily. You cause the falls of empires, but you don't put a sheet of glass over the flammables to stop the fall of yours? God! He saves the artist, not yet known as Roz, and contacts Alfred after years of being away. I'm flesh and blood, I can be ignored, I can be destroyed, but as a symbol. I'm fine, by the way. 70 years alone, and it's still me, me, me. Can't wait till he finds out what influences are. He'll fit right in. Back at Gotham, we see Killian Murphy plays Dr. Crane. Hello, caller. I'm killing you. Who's good, and I can see him playing the Scarecrow maybe 10 years later. But as of this film, he kind of has the same problem as Katie Holmes. He looks too young. That, and did someone give him all of them like in a Looney Tunes short? He looks like a wax sculpture of Zach Braff about to kiss me. This is legit uncomfortable, but not the way the Scarecrow should be uncomfortable. Speaking of uncomfortable, not even one day back and Bruce is already stalking his ex. We've been through all that. It's then that you realize that American Psycho is just one of Bruce's personalities to get Rachel's attention. 
From here, Bruce does all the stuff you want to see Bruce do. He returns to his millions, finds a gadget guy played by Morgan Freeman, and puts the Batcave together. It takes about 50 minutes to get here, but by God, it's been built up great, and there is nothing cooler than seeing him put all this shit together. Again, I really feel like Iron Man and other future comic book hero movies really borrowed a lot from this. Granted, when he's trying to help Sergeant Gordon, played by Gary Oldman, he doesn't exactly have his graceful landing yet. Yikes! And away! Yikes! And away! Yikes! And away! As Falcone inspects, let's face it, the real reason we all suspect Build-A-Bear is still around. Bruce decides to let the bat out of the bag. What the hell are you? I'm Batman. No, you're not the guy from Twilight is. I don't know if I'll ever feel comfortable saying that. So weirdly, Batman Begins goes from great to just good, ironically, when Batman Begins. Don't get me wrong, this Batman is a lot better than the last one, and I adore how well they got the comic book poses down. But not only is the costume kind of awkward, except for Keaton's, I don't think any of the movie costumes look that great. But as everyone has pointed out, that voice. This is just the beginning. If they hit the whole city with toxin, there's nothing to stop Gotham tearing itself apart. Sometimes it sounds okay, and ironically it's when it just sounds like Bale's normal voice. Which is already a pretty cool sounding voice. I don't have the luxury of friends. Get these to Gordon. One for Gordon to inoculate himself, the other for mass production. But other times, he clearly needed to re-record when his voice was going, or add some bass, or just stop sounding like a geeky dweeb trying to sound tough. Taste of your medicine, doctor. Where were the other drugs going? Oh, look, he's doing his Batman voice. Look at this scene. He's shaking his head like he's boss Nass. It's just hilarious. Cops only go there when they're in force. Do I look like a cop? And look, I don't blame Bale. When you're in such a strange setup, you have to put a lot of trust in your director. And I just don't think Nolan ever quite figured out how to not make this look and sound a little silly. If not, very silly. <laughs> oh, and like I said, the action still sucks. I can make out more if the Blair Witch was shooting Cloverfield. But funny enough, when he's Bruce Wayne, the film gets insanely good again. First off, I love that this is the first Batman film that acknowledges the son of a bitch has to sleep. That's your nocturnal. That's maybe. But even for billionaire playboys, three o'clock is pushing it. Not on a Twitch streamer schedule. I also love he has to sacrifice a lot of his public image. He has to look heartless to people, even the ones he loves to distract from who he really is. It's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. Or who you do. She seems really nice. I don't want to finish that joke. Speaking of people I'm sure are very nice in real life. Everybody's been talking about you. Good luck with that domestic dispute. I hear that stuff can really screw you up as a kid. He tries to bust Dr. Crane, who puts on a scarecrow mask when spraying a fear gas on his victims, and for what can cinematically be done with this character, this is pretty weak. I don't know if it was a budget thing or if Nolan thought it wouldn't be realistic enough, but just about everything around the scarecrow, outside of the actor, bites. How many amazing visuals have been utilized with this character? Everything from the costumes to the hallucinations have usually been spectacular. This could have been like Batman fighting Freddy Krueger. There is so much you could have done with this imagery. This looks like a broken Snapchat filter. It's lame as hell. You need to lighten up. Tell all your friends about me! Alfred picks up Bruce and calls Lucius Fox to help make an antidote for the gas. Not since Vicky Vale was led into the Batcave has nobody with any sense ever cared about Alfred letting someone in. There's something I think you should see. At the insane asylum, Rachel is getting too close to Crane's operation, and he sprays her with the same gas. The scene again proves this guy could have been a fun main villain if they only gave him more time. He's here. Who? The Batman. 
He looks like he's gonna sing and tick, tick, boom. God, I wish there was more of this crazy in the film. We get the one cool image from the fear gas. Who are you working for? Okay, now I'm convinced a Batman Beyond movie has to happen. But the cops are called and Batman tries to get Rachel to safety. Ha oh, ha, you crazies are in there. I'm in a bat suit and I'm out here. He gets his hot new ride. And while the idea for this chase is cool, again, it's not put together that well. The shots seem good enough, but the editing is way too fast and random to appreciate what we're seeing. He freaking jumps on rooftops in this, and it feels like nothing. It is so wowless. Take this scene where he bursts through a building window, and then it just cuts to him on a bridge. Let me enjoy that damage. This is the Batman equivalent of that Godzilla film where they cut away in the middle of him destroying something. It probably goes without saying this is done a lot better in the next one, but in this film, it is sadly very blasé. Arrow on the ground. I lost him. Oh my god, it just disappeared! It's a ghost car! Stay calm. Breathe slowly. <laughs> yes, woman sprayed with fear gas. Listen to the giant bat saying, Don't be afraid! Breathe slowly! He gets Rachel the antidote while also getting ready for his birthday party. Ironically, they got him a Superman cake. Those are Bruce Wayne's guests out there, sir. You have a name to maintain. I don't care about my name. I really like the speech Alfred gives about keeping his father's name alive. Not Martha, that bitch. Her two lines can go straight to hell. But his father's kindness must be preserved. It's not just your name, sir. It's your father's name, and it's all that's left of him. Don't destroy. It's a very powerful scene that is contradicted around every corner. <laughs> Literally in the next scene, he finds the now revealed Ra's al Ghul returns and pretends to be drunk and send everybody home. Two-faced friends, you sycophantic suck-ups. The party's over, get out. Later they claim he burned down his own house, so it's kind of odd making such a big deal out of this only to have to shit on it constantly. <laughs> oh well, at least Rachel gets out okay. Not that it looks that way. Little the worse for wear, I'm afraid. Good to know, Cosby. This totally wouldn't fly now. You are gonna release Crane's poison on the entire city. Then watch Gotham tear itself apart through fear. So there's two really weird things about this scene. One is the League burns Bruce's house down and he literally just stands there letting them do it. Create enough hunger and everyone becomes a criminal. Um, stop. Well, I'm Batman, that's all I can do. And I get their plan about destroying Gotham because it's too massive and crime infested, but then they openly say they played a part in that. With Gotham, we tried a new one, economics. We underestimated certain of Gotham's citizens, such as your parents. Okay, first of all, Mother Teresa, Mary, and Gandhi wouldn't be as sacred as these two. Second, bad economies are often what leads to high crime. This is like punishing a kid for being no good after teaching him every day how to be no good. Isn't your solution also the problem? Bruce and Alfred get out of the burning building and it's up to Batman to stop the League from unleashing the gas on the city. Even Gordon tries to help. I'm gonna stop him from loading that train, but I may need your help. What do you need? Can you drive stick? Thus Gotham perished because Gordon couldn't drive stick. Okay, at least we get something close to a good scarecrow here. There's nothing to fear, but fear itself. All right, that's pretty cool. And we're back to sucking again. Sorry, comic book fans. We didn't want to scare you with too much cool. Holy shit, there's two Batman movies I'm in. Bruce reveals to Rachel who he is in his lame as Brando impression. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do. I, <laughs> I can't even finish that. And he tries stopping Roz from crashing a train filled with gas into the main water supply under the Chicago Board of Trade building. Well, well, you took my advice about theatricality a bit, literally. Obviously you didn't duck face. He gets Roz alone on the train with Gordon shooting the track so that it plummets before hitting the building. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. But you created the circumstances in which I no, die. No, 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 we no, both no, know no, your ethical loophole no, 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 is no, no, bullshit. No, no, no. The night is saved. Rachel visits him the next day, and if you really 
don't want people to know you're Batman, maybe don't leave a mask imprint on your face. I never stopped thinking about you. Well, I guess they're an item now. And I loved. He never came back at all. You do know you just kissed me, right? So I guess they're just friends because that's all I have to yada yada yada. And Gordon sets up a new toy. What about Escalation? Escalation. If we start carrying semi-automatics, they buy automatics. We make a good movie about Escalation, we rehash the Razo Ghoul bullshit in the following one. And I won't lie, when I first saw this, I thought it was some of the weakest sequel baiting I ever saw. And now, I can't help but get chills every time I see it. Take this guy. Got a taste for the theatrical, like you. I'll look into it. He's also mailing anal beads and used condoms. Oh hell no, I ain't going near that prick. And that was Batman Begins. Flawed, but man, the good stuff really does stay with you. It is funny, but fitting that in a franchise where the Batman stuff is usually the best, the Bruce Wayne stuff would stand out as more powerful. And even then, the Batman stuff isn't awful by any means, it's just a little off. A lot of that would be corrected by the next one, but as this film goes, there's still so many things that are burned into my memory. So many lines, so many lessons, so many struggles between strength and weakness. This truly is a great film about self-discovery and growth. Again, not perfect, but there are lines from this movie that are always going to stick with me. When I think of struggle and overcoming personal demons, this movie's story and visuals do come to mind. And I think it does for a lot of other people who love comic book heroes. As, like I said, I really think the blueprint for a lot of superhero movies of the past 15 years or so came from this. It's a good start to a good reboot, and of course the best was yet to come. I'm a Nostalgia Critic and Dark Knight Month has just begun! <laughs> Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember, so you don't have to. This is one of my favorite movies. Released in 2008 under a buttload of hype, I'll admit I didn't think this movie was going to be anything that special. I liked Batman Begins, but thought ironically the Batman parts were a little awkward. So with him obviously being more prominent in this one with the Joker who didn't fall into a bat of chemicals, I was already throwing up my hands like a man baby saying this ain't gonna work. But man, did it win me over fast. The acting, the dialogue, the visuals, the intensity, even the action were not just improved on, they were a spectacle. This is what got the mass public saying maybe superhero movies can be more adult than we thought. Every decade or so a comic book movie comes along that does that, and I kinda love it's usually a Batman movie. With that said, like most things declare flawless, I can't quite say this is flawless. There are still a few hiccups when it comes to the story, and little things like poor Bale's bat voice. This city just showed you that it's full of people. Uh, that's a shame. But it goes without saying, this movie left a big impact not only on comic book flicks, but just cinema in general. It challenged how seriously we took heroes and villains that were seen as entertainment for children and teens, and showed there were strong reasons we should still see them as heroes and villains as adults. I'm pretty excited to look this over again, so let's jump right into it. Let's look at the movie that clearly hasn't gotten enough attention, The Dark Knight. It opens with a robbery at one of the mob banks in Gotham. It should be pointed out part of this movie was shot in IMAX, and if they ever release it again on an IMAX screen, it's definitely worth it. I think most people have pointed out the Joker's mask is from an old Adam West episode, and I do legit love that once you know which one he is, the camera does smartly follow him. Like upon second viewing, you are curious of what his reactions are, even if it's all just body language. I know why they call him the Joker. So why do they call him the Joker? I heard he wears makeup. Makeup? Yeah, to scare people. You know, war paint. This scene's pretty awesome, I was shocked to find it's only five minutes long. So much happens, I swear it was double that. You'll find they condense a lot of information tight and efficiently in this movie, which until the last fourth works to its benefit, but we'll get to that in a bit. You don't any idea who you're stealing from? After taking down a random William Fitchner cameo, we find the Joker manipulated the gangsters to take each other out, until he's the only one left to do a badass reveal. 
Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. As many have pointed out, the plans of the Joker, played by Heath Ledger in his final role, are very easy to pick apart. How did he know there'd be a gap in the buses? How did he know where the choppers would be for the wires? How did he know the exact location of where to stand so that explosion wouldn't kill him? And this is where I just shrug and say, comic book shit. Yes, this is meant to be more realistic, but it is still a guy who flies around as a bat, battling a clown. I give leeway on the technicals because comic book movies are supposed to be exaggerated to heighten the effect. So these details really don't bother me. What does bother me is the Scarecrow once again getting the shaft. Despite being in all three movies, he somehow never gets enough time and always comes across as underwhelming. But not as underwhelming as Batman. Wow, Bale really let himself go. Was he getting an early star for his Cheney role? No, these are other vigilantes who want to help. One of the many elements taken from the comics. But the real Batman shows up and... I don't know, it doesn't look that much better. I know I mocked before how silly the suit looks, but in this one, I think it shows the most. I mean, come on. He looks funny. It's not bad all the time, but when they don't know how to shoot him, they really don't know how to shoot him. If I was Gordon, I'd be like, several of these banks were, ro were robbed by a, by a man in clown makeup. <laughs> Who's ironically not as funny as, don't look at me, I'm gonna pee my pants. The costume does get an upgrade later, which isn't great, but I can at least look at him without thinking garage sale cosplay. And how about those vocals? What's the difference between you and me? I'm not wearing hockey pants. I am doing my best Patty and Selma voice though. Meh, <laughs> meh. We're introduced to District Attorney Harvey Dent, played by Aaron Eckhart. And I'm not gonna lie, his intro made me wonder if critics were wrong when I saw this movie. I see you hostile. Get him out of here. But your honor, I'm not done. <laughs> I find you guilty of being a badass mother! Harvey! 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 Even for a comic book movie that was uncomfortably dumb, but it does get back on track pretty fast. As this film just as easily could have been called Gotham City, because a surprisingly good chunk of it is showing people working behind the scenes trying to take down the mob, using clever legal action. And it's legitimately interesting to watch. In a RICO case, if you can charge one of the conspirators with a felony, you can charge all of them with a The movie cleverly utilizes the slow burn, building up to the Joker and why the mob would turn to him. Bruce even takes a liking to Dent, and it's not all because he's dating his ex, Rachel. Played this time by Maggie Gyllenhaal. When their enemies were at the gates, the Romans would suspend democracy and appoint one man to protect the city. Before the League of Shadows took them down, oh yeah, that's canon. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Painfully poignant, yet poignantly painful. While the mob scrambles to figure out how to keep their money safe from Dent, the Joker, fresh off of robbing them, says for half the money he can help them out. But not before a magic trick. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Ta -da! I've seen this trick before, it's in his eye. It's simple, we uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> I have an army of pencils ready to take him down. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but Ledger really does dominate every scene he's in. So many of these weird voices and tics so easily could have backfired, but it adds to the believability that he's intelligent, yet clearly crazy. Anytime he puts his life on the line, I totally believe he'd be okay with dying because he'd be doing what he loves, and he'd probably see it as funny in the end. Speaking of which, the dude is funny. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. It's not even that clever a line, yet he made it hilarious. Speaking of hilarious, this is another scene where the Batman costume just cracks me up. Harvey calls him with the bat signal, and he just stands there while Harvey and Gordon talk. You're sitting down there with scum like Wurtz and Ramirez, and you're talking... Oh yeah, Gordon. God, this makes me laugh. He's like a kid waiting for mom and dad to look at his drawing. I drew a picture of a like rainbow. And and talking... It's all black. Oh, yeah, Gordon. Green Lantern thought it looked pretty. Meanwhile, we see one of the mobsters, played by Michael J. White, just does not have the best luck with clowns. You wanna know how I got these scars? Oh god, not another Joker impression. Mommy gets the kitchen knife to defend herself. He doesn't like that. The Joker changes his backstory constantly, once again a clever holdover from the comic. But I think what makes them especially creepy is he tells them like they really happened. 
any of these could have been the actual story, and you would believe it because he's so dedicated to convincing his victims it's real. He probably would slip in the real story just for his own personal laugh. She can't stand the sight of me. She leaves. Now I see the funny side. I'll also say, while the music in Batman movies is usually great, the Joker's theme takes it to a whole new level. In my opinion, a good third of what makes him scary is that disturbing drone that half the time sounds like a broken hairdryer. But Jesus, it's a scary-ass broken hairdryer. <laughs> you have nothing to threaten me with. Meanwhile, Bruce flies to Hong Kong to try and get the mob boss who is holding all the Mafia's money. They use sonar technology to nab him, leading to a line that's honestly too smart for its own good. Sonar. Just like a uh... submarine, Mr. Wayne. Like a submarine. I have no joke. I think people just miss how obnoxiously clever that is. Batman breaks into the mobster's building and uses what's like a submarine for the air. Or a flying animal, like a pigeon. Well, that could have gone better. He's dropped off to the cops, where he tries to make a deal with Rachel, Harvey, and Gordon. Wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be a Joker story? There we go. Be aware, the image is disturbing. Oh my god, I died? One of the bad imposters is murdered, and the Joker will continue to kill every day until Batman reveals himself. I don't care if it turns into a found footage movie, this is the creepiest scene in the flick. Look at me. Look at me! While rehearsing, Kane admitted he forgot his lines because he was so scared shitless of Heath's performance. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> <laughs> Lines, schmines, I'm forgetting I have bladder control right now! The Joker kills off a lot of big names upholding the law, naturally in a comedic way. Get in, open it, it'll tell you where you're headed. Oh, I get And he tries to kill Harvey Dent as well, but Batman is there to stop him. Let her go. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> Damn it, I should have said, please throw her off the building so I can save her and she'd date me. That would have been more specific survive what they clearly should not have survived, but again, comic book movie. And Bruce tries to figure out more who this Joker, supposedly working for the mob, is. You hammered them to the point of desperation, and in their desperation, they turned to a man they didn't fully understand. Isn't that the intro to, like, every Trump book now? <laughs> Two more people end up dead, and the Joker puts an obituary for the mayor in the paper. That somehow nobody stopped! Where was the editor that day? And one of Wayne's employees notices something a little odd while doing some research. What are you building for him now? Uh, a rocket ship? I want... A rocket ship. Ten million dollars. Fox tells the guy nobody would believe him, and he... believes him. Yeah, it's a little odd, but I guess I can buy it. And at the commissioner's funeral, everyone is seeing if the Joker will follow through with killing the mayor. Commissioner Loeb dedicated his life to law enforcement and to the protection of his community. Oh, this has all been a misunderstanding. It's not Batman he was after, it's Batman well. <laughs> the Joker does get his shot, but it's not for the mayor, it's for Gordon. His family sadly has to be told the bad news. You brought this craziness on us! You did! You brought this on <laughs> At least I don't wear hockey pads. nightclub to confront one of the mobsters working with the Joker. Why is nobody doing the bat to see? Meanwhile, Harvey, kind of playing to the split personality thing, but not a ton, threatens one of the Joker's men using a trick coin, saying he has a 50-50 chance of living. You're the symbol of hope. I could never be. If anyone saw this, everything would be undone. A man in a bat suit talking in a silly voice is saying, you're acting crazy! Batman says he'll turn himself in to stop the bloodshed, but not before hitting on Rachel one more time. You know that day that you once told me about when Gotham would no longer need Batman? You can't ask me to wait for that. It's happening now. I'll just say it, Bruce's simp romance with her is kind of pathetic. She's seeing someone else, she seems happy, he's now going to prison, yet he constantly makes a play that maybe they can work out. You once told me that if the day came when I was finished, that we'd be together. Bruce, don't make me your one hope for a normal life. Did you mean it? <laughs> Did you mean it when you said you marry me when we grow up? This is kind of embarrassing. 
maybe that's the idea? Like, despite all his brilliant badassness, this is the one area where he's kind of a desperate dork. But with so much else going on in these movies, their chemistry has never been that strong. If you turn yourself in, they're not gonna let us be together. I need someone more mentally sound, like a guy who would kill a man literally on the turn of a dime. In a surprise twist, though, Harvey tells everyone that he's Batman. I am the Batman. I really love that Nolan realizes the trick to get a good Two-Face is to get Harvey down. He knows in order to make the transformation more painful, he needs to be relatable. And a lot of time is dedicated to him being portrayed as heroic and likable. And not to a fake degree. For the most part. Your Honor, I'm not done. <laughs> Just stop reminding me that Clip's in this movie. The Joker rigs it where they have to take the lower route. That lower fifth will be like turkeys on Thanksgiving down there. Which... They clearly don't! There's tons of ways around this! And the Joker chases them, trying to blow open the truck. These things are built for that, right? He's gonna need something a lot bigger to get through this. I heard that. But Batman shows up, and where I really bashed the action in the first film, I can say not only is it a lot better in this one, but it has one of my favorite action sequences of all time. This chase is so well laid out, keeps the adrenaline high, and brilliantly has no music so you can focus only on what you're seeing. Again, the music is great in this, but cutting it out here makes everything strangely more epic. There's not even much dialogue. The language of the scene is practically nothing but crashes and explosions. also edited much better. In the last one, everything was so shaky and cut around too quick. Here, you can make out everything and really feel like you're riding alongside them. When Batman crashes through a window, it doesn't just cut randomly to somewhere else. You actually get to follow him through the window this time. You get to experience what he's experiencing. Look at the clowns firing at them. It's like you're in a live action video game. To a point where every time I drive a lower whacker, I can't help but get a little bit of an adrenaline rush because I always think of this scene. On top of that, almost all of it is really there. Yes, there was some model work and a few moments of CG, but they were used only when they had to be. They went the extra mile and actually had all these cars blowing up or crashing. You simply feel more immersed when you know what you're looking at is really there. Oh, you wanna play? Come on. It all builds up to a topper that everybody saw in the trailer, but you got so wrapped up, you forgot it was coming. And everybody roared in the theater when it finally happened. <laughs> this leads to the ultimate showdown shit Gotham has ever had, with Batman charging towards the Joker. This leads to, I'll completely admit, a surprise that shocked the hell out of me. We got you, you son of a bitch. Again, the crowd went nuts here. I think it shows a movie is really working when there isn't a character you're not rooting for. It's kind of like the Coyote and Roadrunner, because everything with me is for some reason. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad. If they're passionate and interesting, you do want them to succeed in one way or another. Things go south, though, when both Harvey and Rachel disappear. Thus, the Joker and Batman finally have a sit-down. This is basically a funhouse mirror version of Heat, but who gives a shit? It's great. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. Joker says he's trying to make a point as an agent of chaos, which is a little contradictory. If you're an agent of chaos, you shouldn't have a point. But he does go back and forth between proving something and just spreading madness that I think it kind of acquits itself. Don't worry, I'm gonna tell you where they are. And that's the point. He tells them where Harvey and Rachel are as they're both in separate buildings about to be blown up. Batman goes to save Rachel, but discovers the Joker switched the addresses. Some... Okay, so even when this movie came out, the trope of killing the love interest was already kind of played, but not so often in comic book movies. I guess you could argue Lois Lane, but she comes right back, so I don't think it really counts. In my opinion, this does what Spider-Man didn't have the balls to do, and Amazing Spider-Man 2 was late to the party with. My only problem? He doesn't mourn her that much. Yeah, we get him looking over the wreckage and sulking in his room a bit, but Alfred's like, eh, you can take it, and it's never brought up again by him. Didn't you think there might be some casualties? Things were always gonna get worse before they got better. 
Honestly, Harvey takes it a lot harder, which makes sense as this, mixed with the fact that his face got blown off, drives him insane. And this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think maybe the movie should have ended here. This is the emotional height of the film, the Joker escapes, Harvey is scarred. We're at an hour 40 minutes, a perfect running time. Imagine if it just stopped like this. That would have been goddamn chilling. Seeing how they build up another one at the end anyway, I feel like this could have worked. But instead, we have 50 minutes left, and honestly, what's in this 50 minutes could have filled a whole other film. I guess because they wanted to squeeze in so much, it's condensed in the final third. But like I said before, it is condensed well. Not only is half of Harvey's face scarred and a pretty great effect that still holds up, but his double-sided coin is too. I love this because it represents how now he can't play tricks, he can't make his own luck. It worked for a while, but it cost him dearly, and now he's spun into the opposite, where everything is one way or another, brought on by chance. I told you, I'm a man of my word. I just Scrooge McDucked myself. As you'd expect though, he sets the money ablaze and calls in on a talk show with the employee from earlier saying he's gonna reveal who Batman is. Joker says he likes the mystery now, and if the guy isn't dead in an hour, he'll blow up a hospital. Yeah, like I said, they tried to squeeze in a lot in this last third. Mission. With people scrambling, both evacuating hospitals and trying to kill this guy, Bruce does manage to save him, but make it look like it was an accident. That's a very brave thing you did. You trying to catch the light? Hey, thanks, Batman. I guess I ruined that. With the Joker wearing easily the funniest costume in the movie. Hi. And yes, this was a popular cosplay for a while. He convinces Harvey that he's just a mad dog and he should take vengeance out on those who let him off his leash. This begins Harvey's coin flipping and I do like he puts the Joker in his trial of chance too. It really does make sense a villain based on chaos and a villain based on chance would fit well in the same movie. You live, you die. Mm, now we're talking. Of course, he gets lucky, Harvey escapes, and the Joker blows up the hospital that again really was demolished and looks amazing. There is a rumor that the explosions accidentally stopped and Ledger improvised the scene of him hitting the detonator until they went off again. But look at the camera work, look at the staging, look at how many explosions there are. That's not how this works. Nolan even said they purposefully had it stop so they could set the demolition part up while keeping Ledger safe. Even if the rumor isn't true though, it's still a spectacular moment. But then we get another climax. Yeah, honestly, the whole third act is just one long climax. We're after the Joker kidnaps Anthony Michael Hall. If you don't want to be in the game, get out now. Random. He puts a bomb on two fairies who must make a choice which boat will blow up. And if they don't choose in an hour, they'll both blow up. And you might want to decide quickly because the people on the other boat may not be quite so noble. First off, this kind of feels like a two-faced plan, like you're forced to choose one or the other. And second, this is where the movie stops being great and instead just becomes good. We're introduced to this idea of Batman using everyone's cell phones to track everything. This alone could be an interesting movie instead of just the last half hour. This is wrong. I've got to find this man. I'm also gonna take a wild guess and say, this is a commentary on the George W. Bush administration. Harvey starts killing the people who wronged him in ways I still don't fully understand. You driver. Did he get out of the car or what? What happened there? The people on the ferry are debating what to do like it's a Saw movie. The hostages are switched with the henchmen. We have to have a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the Joker. Even though it's all done well after the hospital bit, I'm kind of done. This would have been a great climax in another Dark Knight movie, but they squeezed it all in here and that's what it feels like. It feels like it's squeezed in. The little leeway I'll give it is that it is like what the previous film said. It is about escalation. The chaos never stops. It's relentless. Everything seems spinning out of control and crumbling with Batman trying to pick up the pieces. That is essentially the Joker. I just think there were better ways to do it than to just add an act four. But it is still very intense and keeps your interest. As after neither fairy blows the other up and Batman stops the Joker from detonating them both, the Joker reveals how destroying Harvey was his ace in the hole. 
All it takes is a little push. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, when I saw this clip in the trailer, I was saying to myself, did they make the Joker fly in this? <laughs> Even though the Joker's arrested, Harvey kidnaps Gordon's family and gives them the same coin toss as the others. If you're not going to hurt my family, just the person you love most. Is it your wife? It can't be your daughter. We haven't decided if she's going to be Batgirl in the future or not. We're definitely going to screw up Robin, but we have to hold out on this one. You don't want to hurt the boy, Harvey. <laughs> Your mother's in here with us, Karis. Would you like to leave a message? <laughs> Batman arrives and through a violent tussle, Harvey falls to his death. To save his reputation, Batman tells Gordon that the story has to be that he killed Harvey's victims. I killed those people. You're not. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. There is an irony that they're saying spying on people is wrong, but lying about who killed someone is fine. But you get the idea of the lesson. He's taking a hit for Gotham. It's about endurance. It's about sacrifice. It's about making people even more freaked out about fake news. Okay, this didn't age that great. But it's the thought that counts. A watchful protector. A dark knight. And that was the dark knight. Despite his few problems, I still think it's fantastic. This really did change how serious people took superhero movies. It hit just the right notes at just the right time. The lines are so quotable, the dilemma is so intriguing, the characters so memorable. For a while, this Joker became an icon of, shall we say, meaningful madness. Despite being a villain, he reflected a sort of anti-authoritative chaos that struck a chord at that point in time. The same way Phoenix would in his own way at a different point in time. Well, okay, I can't say it's perfection, the amazing moments overshadow all of the flaws and gave you an amazing experience that changed the cinematic landscape of this genre. It's still one of my all-time favorites, and I know I'm not alone. If you haven't watched it in a while, pop it in again and watch one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. I'm a nostalgia critic, guy, remember it so you don't have to. Betray you, you are now seeing what you fear. The scarecrow's fear taps and strikes again. Here's one of your fears now, the villain from Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. It's Batgirl? Oh, sorry. And an even bigger apology for ruining Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. It was like hard. Soon we will destroy the Batman franchise with bat credit cards, bat nipples, and bat hockey pads! <laughs> Didn't we just do this? What's that? Didn't we literally just do this plan like two or these ago? Yeah, like some characters are different, but isn't this like the same thing? How dare you? This is far more expensive! And far more familiar. Look, look, you know how everyone said the one with the Joker is one of the greatest things ever made? Yeah. Well, we're taking inspiration of the lesser one before that. Isn't that, like, backwards? Of course! It's the most Christopher Nolan thing to do! Whatever, you're gonna get hate for this no matter what. I suppose you're right. Roll the thing. When the much-anticipated Dark Knight Rises came out in 2012 after one of the greatest comic book movies ever made and another runaway blockbuster, the hype behind Christopher Nolan's third and final Batman film was immeasurable. And I will say, the people who loved it insanely loved it, and the people who didn't, I think were given the same treatment as the folks on the Gotham Bridge. I, as you probably guessed, was one of those people who didn't care for it. In fact, I hated it. I loved The Dark Knight so much that I was ruthless on this film. I haven't even watched it since it first came out. Well, ten years later, I put it on again, and I have softened a bit. The acting is pretty good, the size and scale are massive. I'll even go so far as to say the majority of this movie is very impressive to watch. In fact, upon revisiting it, I think it only has one problem. The script. That's all. Just the words, choices, and basic root element of cinematic storytelling sucks. But aside from that, it's really good! Okay, I know I'm gonna get ripped apart for this, so I'll try to praise what is legit awesome about this film. But I'm not gonna pretend the stuff I think is bad isn't bad. As always, I'll be as honest as I can, for better or worse. Hey, what are you doing? 
trying to hide yourself so you're not connected with my opinions on this movie, aren't you? Hey, if you want to ruin all that DC goodwill you've built up, then kick me out of it! Yeah, fool me once, right? <sighs> okay, fair enough. This is my solo? Yep! Definitely solo. Review of Dark Knight Rises. The movie opens randomly reminding us that Harvey is dead. I believed in Harvey Dent. Thanks. Just throw this in there too in case we forget. But it gets pretty cool with an intro clearly trying to top the bank robbery opening in the last one, but who cares, it kicks ass. CIA agents capture the mercenary known as Bane, played by Tom Hardy, and try to make him think they're killing his henchmen. A lot of loyalty for a hired gun! Well, perhaps he's wondering why someone would shoot a man before throwing him out of a plane. Or how a voice and a mask can sound like 20 sound filters on top of each other. If you're wondering why he sounds like he's clearly in a recording booth, it's because there was a lot of complaints that Bane was too hard to understand in the trailers. When Gotham is ashes, you have my permission to die. This dude does do a lot of talking, so my guess is they brought him back and re-recorded or re-altered his voice several times. If I pull that off, will you die? It would be extremely painful. You're a big guy. For you. I actually really like his voice despite everybody's impressions. Bane in the Harley Quinn show is entirely written around how hilarious it sounds. I am cutting this card! Blades are dull. I will bend it! But again, it's a Batman villain. I want him to sound a little weird. What am I gonna say, the Joker sounds too high pitch or the Penguin grunts too much? Their silly voices are part of what makes them distinct. With that said, it is great when his voice breaks and he sounds like a drunk Sean Connery from Red October belching helium. Of course! The Batman, to my shame, police is mobile! Opportunity! If Soda Popinski had a voice! It turns out Bane just needs the doctor on this flight and he arranges the plane to be rotisserie by another plane. I honestly have no troubles with this scene, it's pretty sweet. Did you like my impression of a creaking door? No! Oh, they expect one of us in the wreckage, brother! The recruiter with the pamphlet should have told you! <laughs> yes, you can question the logistics of this plan, but let's use the same rules as Dark Knight. It's a comic book movie, so anything heightened that makes the characters look smarter or stronger is fine. However, anything heightened that makes the characters look stupid or lazy, I'm going to call out. Because that's not fun, that's stupid or lazy. Like at Wayne Manor, how Gordon is about to tell a group of cops he lied about Harvey Dent and the Batman for eight years. Maybe the time isn't right. Don't worry, he's not that stupid. He'll just carry it around on missions. So a criminal may find it and read it later. Not to go into spoilers, but a criminal finds it and reads it later. The mayor's gonna dump him in the spring. He must be popular with his wife. Not really. She took the kids and left for Cleveland. Yeah, that's right. Gordon's family left him. Isn't that exactly what you were hoping for at the end of Dark Knight? Oh my god, the suspense. I hope after this they get divorced. To be fair, he did pretend to be dead to protect their lives, resulting in their lives being threatened, but piss off, comic books! Ever lay eyes on Wayne at one of these things? No one has. Not in years. Bruce Wayne has stayed out of the game for eight years, and all the aches and pains catch up with him, forcing him to walk with a cane. And a stick to keep his balance. I don't care, it's mine! It's mine! It's my bad joke, and I love him! But Selena Kyle, played by Anne Hathaway, plays never once in this movie called Catwoman, who tries to get Wayne's fingerprints. Call me crazy, but I figure Batman and or Bruce Wayne would have better security than this. You wouldn't beat up a woman any more than I would beat up a cripple. I was the Dark Knight! Good night, Mr. Wayne. So I know some people love or hate Anne Hathaway, and I'm honestly indifferent to her. So when I first saw her in this, that was my reaction. Indifference. She was just another Catwoman to me. Didn't leave that big an impression. Watching it again, she's both a little worse and a little better than I remember. Put bluntly, she sucks as a villain. You gotta be kidding me. No guns, no killing. Where's the fun in that? I never buy it. It looks like an act. She plays evil the same way a villain at a kid's birthday party plays evil. It's clearly for show. Still don't trust me, huh? How can we change that? However, I do kind of buy her as a badass hero. That woman always flip-flops between sides, and when she fights, or even just walks alongside Batman, it does look pretty cool. I'd probably buy her more as a warped version of Batwoman or Batgirl or something. Speaking of which, can I be Robin? You got something you want to ask me, Officer Blake? Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays Officer Blake. You should use your full name, Robin. Holy self-service. Who figures out what nobody else in Gotham could? Bruce Wayne is Batman. How? Just... just the look on his face. My mom died when I was small. I'd seen that look on your face before. 
It's the same one I taught myself. Right when I saw you, I knew who you really were. Oh, God damn this script. Mm, 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 God damn this script. Mm. I know I said I wouldn't attack any heightened elements in this, but this isn't heightened. This is freaking supernatural. He figured it out having never seen or heard Batman, but just by looking at Wayne's face. Holy underwritten metropolis. And the funny thing is, this wouldn't be hard to fix. Just have Batman walk by him at one point and Blake be like, I recognize that chin. That'd work. I'd buy that. At least he would have seen the two to compare them. But this psych kid is a damn miracle. He could have made millions outing other superheroes just by looking at them. Diana Prince, Clark Kent, Peter Parker, Jennifer Waters. Congratulations. All these heroes are being hunted down and or destroyed. Uh. Don't talk. You've done enough. Speaking of which, and I do literally mean speaking of which, you notice how much damn talking there is until Batman shows up? It takes him 45 minutes to appear, which is honestly fine as the other movies took their time setting up stuff too. But it always felt like something was moving forward in those movies. Bruce was having flashbacks or traveling place to place before he became Batman. Gotham's law enforcement were trying to take down the mob with Batman's help before the Joker story really got going. This is literally just people sitting around explaining exposition. Maybe for a second you'll see Catwoman do something or Bane do something, but it's mostly just people in one spot yapping. Try to talk to a man who threw away your investment. Do you understand only money? And the power you think it goes about. by his gut, and it continues to bother him no matter what. When you and Dad like. cleaned up the streets, you clean them good. I'm not hearing a question. A lot of guys were going down the tunnels. The made. foundation is funded by the profits of Wayne. Even Wayne. before you became a recluse, you never came to this. You came here yeah, from your walk up in Old Town, a modest place. You me. should hear the rumors surrounding. <laughs> Hey, I bet the story about Alfred hoping to see Bruce and a loved one in Florence will be how the movie ends. How do I know? Because it's the only time we cut away from somebody talking. And honestly, I'd be more lenient about it if the characters were as interesting as Dark Knight or Batman Begins. All the new characters introduced in those movies were really engaging. Even the gangsters, which you've seen a million of in these films, all have distinct memorable personalities. All the new characters here are forgettably generic. We got Blake. He's tough. One of Bruce's biggest investors, Miranda. She's tough. Selena is fake tough. I completely forgot Daggett was in this movie, and that's one of my favorite Batman villains. He's well, clearly you don't know much of anything, do you? Where's Bane? Annoyingly whiny and tough. I guess there's Matthew Modine, who does have a pretty good arc by the end, but until that point, he's also pretty whiny when not tough. I'll give it this, I am happy when Batman shows up. Not because he's gonna save any of these boring people, but because something is finally happening. But this does raise the question, how will he get past years of being physically disabled? <laughs> Better, off we go. Okay, so far so good. His tumblers turn into chitty chitty bang bang, that's cool. He has arguably the best line in the movie. Let's go to hell. So that's what that feels like. That's way too funny, it has to be from the comics. Yeah, still good scene. They just don't care. Yes, he still has that voice, and yes, he still mouth breathes so much I can't help but make this sound. <laughs> but it's still good to have Batman in this Batman movie. And all it'll cost you is an Alfred. You leave me? You're not Batman anymore. You have to find another way. Yeah, remember the Alfred that said endure, take it, Batman can make the choice no one else can? You spat in the faces of Gotham's criminals. Didn't you think there might be some casualties? Things were always gonna get worse before they got better. Well now it's give up! Let someone else do it! No one cuddles me at night anymore! What if before she died, she wrote a letter saying she chose Harvey Dent over you? I give credit that this movie reneges a little bit on the lies told at the end of the last one, as I never knew what to think of that ending, and clearly the writers didn't know either, as both the truth about Rachel and later Dent are revealed. Maybe it's time we all stop trying to outsmart the truth and let it have its day. The acting here is also top notch from both Kane and Bale. But Alfred doesn't want Bruce to die, so he won't help him anymore, leaving him to die. I know what this means. Your hatred, but it might also mean saving your life. Now, Timmy, I'm tired of catching you every time you jump from the bookcase, so I'm not going to catch you this time saving your life. What's Bruce been doing those eight years out of the limelight? Well, not protecting his finances because now he's completely broke. <laughs> they bring Miranda, who may end up owning the company, to Applied Sciences, and I will admit I forgot how awesome this show was. 
This is it, isn't it? No, this is goddamn Fox, who will soon be Disney. They show her investment is going to a machine that can create clean, renewable energy. Or blow up the world. Someone will figure out a way to make this power source into a nuclear weapon. I prefer you back to eh, comics! Miranda does end up owning the company as well as Bruce's Little Wayne. That is, if he can figure out how to get inside his house without Alfred. Do you have keys? Never need enough. Batman, everybody! Despite the two having absolutely no chemistry, they decide to bonk. And yes, there is technically a reason she does it, but again, how did Batman not figure it out? And he tells Selina if she helps him find Bane, he'll help clear her name so that she can go back to feeding her... Hey. She doesn't even own a cat! She leads him to Bane, all right, by trapping him so he has to face him alone. Bane reveals he's from the League of Shadows and... I'm sorry, but in a choice I just can't get behind. He's a massive simp for Ra's al Ghul. I am the League of Shadows. Yeah, he just wants to destroy Gotham for the same reason Ra's did. Crime, corruption, economic inequality, which didn't the League say they kind of caused? With Gotham we tried a new one, economics. And instead of making him a unique epic villain, they just make him a basic bitch for a previous one. I'm here to fulfill Ra's al Ghul's destiny! Imagine if Killmonger in Black Panther was like, I will fulfill Baron Zemo's legacy. You'd miss all this amazing stuff that makes him one of a kind. It just wouldn't feel as grand or new. Also, The Dark Knight, said by many to be one of the greatest comic book movies ever, kind of feels like a detour now, doesn't it? League of Shadows wants to destroy the city. Defeated. Joker wants to drive everyone mad. Stopped. League of Shadows wants to destroy the city. Oh shit! Just when I thought I saw everything, I get to see it again! It does lead to some cool stuff, though. I love how Bane knows all Batman's moves because they were trained by the same people. This fight scene in general is pretty great. Okay, it looks a little fake, but both actors are into it, you feel the intensity. And though Hardy said he hated beating up his childhood hero, he sure does sound like he's having a ball. Shadows betray you because they belong to me. Oh man, you beat him to his hangover face! You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. But that pesky writing, where is all this taking place without him ever knowing? Your precious armory, gratefully accepted. World's greatest detect. How much work did Alfred do? I was wondering what would break first, your spirit or your money. Oh, I should have wore hockey pants. to leave Gotham, but is picked up by the police. The Dent Act allows non-segregation based on extraordinary need. You wanna hold my hand? Ah! This is really stupid. And Bruce is taken to a faraway prison where Bane was raised. He'll, of course, let Bruce watch the destruction of Gotham because comic villains are morons and kill him off after. Prisoners try to get out of the giant plot hole this movie keeps digging for itself and Bruce is told of the one prisoner who did. He says there is one who did. A child. A girl, that is very important. Yeah, all right, we'll get to that twist later, but for now, he thinks it's Bane, whom the police think they have surrounded, so they literally throw in every cop in the city. Their words, not mine. Every cop in the city's down in those tunnels. This is so stupid, it actually looks funny. How can you not laugh at all of this giant city's cops going to one bust? Even the reporters are like, are you high? We're seeing literally thousands of police heading into the sewers. Mr. Mayor, we're literally thousands of police. It's a training exercise. No, I swear, there was a scene cut from the movie where she says, are you high? Big shock, this wasn't such a good idea. As a bunch of explosions trap them in the tunnels, blow up Gotham's bridges, and for some reason cut up this cool shot from the trailer. Why'd you do that? That one take was amazing. This bomb is armed, and the identity of the trigger man is a mystery. Well, this is a weird halftime show. The doctor from earlier turns the energy source into a bomb and Bane says he'll detonate it if anyone tries to get in or out of Gotham. 
He reads Gordon's letter about how Batman was innocent and Dent went insane, which, I mean, he is a supervillain. He could be lying. But whatever, this gets Gotham up in arms and is returned to the people who feel wrong. The rich are poor, the poor are rich, the guilty innocent, the innocent guilty, getting across the incredible message of... Inequality sucks! Yeah, kind of like Occupy Wall Street, which they said they weren't inspired by, and I do believe them. They're doing the same thing, pointing out similar problems, but not really offering solutions. Even though this had no connection to that movement, it was clearly on their minds the same time it was on all these other people's minds. There was just something about that place and time that got people talking about it. Maybe that's why a lot of these characters' choices seem so dumb. They're letting the commentary drive the characters rather than the characters drive the commentary. With that said, what is Batman gonna do? I mean, Bane broke his back, recreating one of the most iconic comic book scenes ever. What do they seem to have down there? A rope? It's gonna take years of physical therapy to- <laughs> Better. Let's climb out of here. Oh, I broke my back again! For several months, Gotham is ripped apart, and Bruce tries to escape with the other prisoners chanting, but he never makes it. When he's told the child made it without a rope, he decides no snot-nosed pipsqueak is gonna upstage him. Who's that me? Rise. You've been down there for months, and now you ask what that means? If I was digging out of prison and my cellmate said dick cabbage every time I did, day one I'd be like, what's dick cabbage? I'm kinda curious what that's about. How much work did Alfred do again? He climbs up without a rope. Yeah, okay. And he, of course, makes it out. Just in time, too, as the best cameo in the movie says Gordon is on thin ice and sentences him to death. By thin ice. This blocks the remote detonator signal to the bomb. Get it onto it before sunrise. So a lot of people ask how did Bruce get back to Gotham and how's he able to walk on that thin ice when everybody else falls through? Well, one they did show, he actually can walk on thin ice. Not gonna lie, I was pretty impressed by that callback. Number two, he's Batman. He got back because he's Batman. Impossible. Can't believe my prison with no guards and a giant hole a child jumped out of didn't work! After what, the tenth time I asked how Nolan could never tell Bale Batman looks hilarious with his mouth open? I'm so baked. They get all the cops out of the tunnel. Again, maybe should have killed them, Bane. And the battle for Gotham begins. <laughs> I'll say this too, you really do see the money on the screen. Not only is it impressive that all those people are really there and not CG'd in, and that there was at least an attempt to make it about the city and not just Batman, but the effects for being 10 years old hold up pretty good. If anything leading up to this made a lick of sense, I'd totally be invested. Go, go. Is he back? Is Spider-Man back? I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Greatest detective finally puts together, maybe hitting Bane's mask will work. Yeah, even the CIA agent figured that out right away. If I pull that off, will you die? And he finally gets him down for the count. Where's the trigger? What? I never gave it to an ordinary citizen. What? Where Ironically, I can't understand you. Tell me where the trigger is. Then you have my permission to die. So that's what that feels like. But we get our big twist, I guess. It was Miranda all along. My mother named me Talia before she was killed. It turns out she's the kid that escaped and she's the daughter of Ra's al Ghul and... I don't know, I, I, is this what you wanted? Catwoman and Bane in a movie together and it's a last minute twist daughter of a villain from two movies ago that's our mastermind? This isn't like Marvel where there's like five dozen films to try this out on. This is the climax of only three movies. With a roster of amazing villains and we're ending with her? Okay, you got 10 minutes of climax left. Maybe the writing for her will be really stellar. His only crime was that he loved me. That is a fake line. You put that in as a joke. These are Oscar nominated writers! They're ready to go up with the city as she gets ready to set off the bomb with her detonator. <laughs> Where's the kaboom? Gordon turned off the bomb, so she rushes to find him, which is good. She shouldn't have to see Bane go out like a bitch. About the whole no guns thing. I'm not sure I feel as strongly about it as you do. Mmm, 
Mmm, that's an orgasm of lame. Well, it's gonna take Bruce a while to recover with that knife in his side better. But they discover the bomb is activated, and naturally, Batman has to sacrifice himself, flying the bomb away from the city. I'm still so baked. After his supposed death, I guess they throw a Great Gatsby funeral because almost no one attends. Probably because people are too busy going to Batman's memorial. And nobody puts together they died on the same day. Honestly, it's a little douchey even after he's dead, none of his friends say, oh, by the way, this guy was Batman, he was a good dude. I mean, they literally made a statue out of him. I don't think they're gonna charge you with anything. It's not even an accurate likeness, his mouth is closed. I'm so sorry. I failed you. You trusted me, and I failed you. I mean, you did. How's that whole, I'm gonna leave you to kill yourself so you don't kill yourself thing work out? Wayne Manor is turned into a center for at-risk kids led by Blake. Robin. Oh, blow me. Where he discovers the Batcave below. And if you're like me, you know when this movie really should have ended. I know that's like the ending to Inception, but Christopher Nolan has shown us he likes doing the same thing over and over, so why not here? It'd be so good if it was left open. Did he see him? Did he not? Was Selena there? Was someone else he found there? Your imagination and your interpretation of the characters would fill in the blank. But instead, Bruce found the exact cafe he went to in Florence. Absolutely nobody recognizes a face that was constantly on magazines. And this trilogy finally ends. Folks, I tried. I just can't get into it. I will admit there are a lot of things to take into consideration. Trying to up the spectacle of the Dark Knight, trying to be respectful and not bring back Heath Ledger's Joker. Trying to tie things together when you can't use the storyline of your most iconic villain. But I really think they should have just done a villain from scratch and not connect him to a villain from the first film. Or if you're gonna do that, do the Scarecrow, damn it! Yeah, I know I never shut up about him, but that is the only first movie villain you could get material from to fill a sequel. At least in a way that'd be satisfying. I think it wanted to up the commentary, up the effects, up the size, and in the process of figuring out the technicals, it lost the human connection. But like I said, that is all on a script level. And yes, that's one of the most important things, but watching it again, I was impressed with how many elements did hold up in terms of technology, size, scale, and performances. You legit feel the effort with every frame. It in no way feels like a lazy movie. Just a misguided one. And even then, that's just my take. I know a lot of people who love this film, and if it really moved you in a profound way, I'm not gonna stand in front of that. Its heart is in the right place, and it's clearly trying to do right by Batman. With that said, do you think it did do right all these years later? Were you like me and felt it couldn't live up to the hype, or do you feel like it followed through on all its epicness? Also, how do you rank the Dark Knight films? I know my ranking's pretty obvious, but I'd love to know yours. Whatever your thoughts on the Nolan trilogy, I think we all owe him a big thing for bringing back Batman into the cinematic spotlight, reminding us why we love the shadow of such a powerful symbol. Okay, that was the Dark Knight Trilogy. Why are we all still here? Oh, did you think that was it? Kinda, yeah. But I have an amazing twist for you. I am, in fact, not the real villain. Oh, we didn't really care if you were. It was an unsung hero who was in the movie under your nose the whole time. Okay, who? Hey, guys. Tony from Hack the Movies here. Wait, how is he the villain? He wasn't even in Dark Knight Rises. Oh, yes, I was. I so rarely talk about it. Here's the bandana I wore while shooting, and here's a couple pictures I took from the set. Just watch the stadium scene. I'm right there, behind the goalpost. Unexpected, isn't it? I guess. Therefore epic. Not really. Oh, our friends have betrayed us, Tony, from Hack the Movies. It's hard being the glue that holds a film together. We must rectify this, Tony, from Hack the Movies. You are the twist villain everybody wanted to see. I didn't even know he was in the film. So tell me what I must do for my epic conclusion. Uh, maybe you can review the other two best Batman movies. Of course! It'll be something new and unexpected! You totally announced that at the beginning of the month. But has he talked about those films before? Multiple times. Then we are following the Nolan model. Repeat, repeat, and repeat. Repeat. You know, I was happier when I literally didn't exist. <gasps> I was played by Matt. Does this mean I'll disappear too? The world is too small for the star of the Dark Knight Rises to disappear! Oh, good! 
Who are you? I'm not sure anymore. Are you my mommy? Why is this still going? Because I love doing this voice. Well, stop it. Bye, voice. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember? So you don't have to. Well, this might be one of my favorite Batman movies, but this one is still my all-time favorite. I was eight years old when I saw this on the big screen, and it was one of the coolest experiences of my life. It changed the way I look at comic book heroes who, aside from Superman, were not given much respect on the big screen. And even then they botched that up. If I'm right, I think this is the first PG-13 superhero movie. I know objectively there's better made Batman films, but not only does this one have THE definitive live-action Batman Michael Keaton, who people bitched a shit show about when he was chosen, and now we're crying with joy when he comes back, but this did arguably change comic book movies. Before this film, the only live-action Batman we had was the Adam West show, which is great, but it's all we have. There was actually debate whether to go the same route with this, focusing on the campy humor rather than any drama. Thankfully, the comics were bringing back the darker roots, in fact, going even darker with it, which inspired the studio to choose a dark but still relatively new director named Tim Burton. He said he modeled a lot of this movie after The Killing Joke, and years later you could argue it's a better Killing Joke movie than, well, The Killing Joke. Where Nolan focused more on vocal storytelling, Burton focused more on visual storytelling. So much of the characters are brought out not by long conversations, but rather few choice words and phenomenal expressions. There's so much awesome to talk about with this movie and so little time. So let's jump right in. This is my all time favorite Batman film, Batman. Screw that shit, it's just Batman. No other film is called Batman. Doesn't count, it's called the movie. First off, I really should talk about the music. I know I've made a joke or two about Danny Elfman over the years, but the late 80s and early 90s really were his peak. And this is arguably his best ever. With Zimmer's theme, I always think of Batman brooding and walking. Elfman's theme, I think of him brooding and punching. It gets your adrenaline up while also being grand and gothic. And that is Batman to me. I also love that Kim Basinger's costumes get a credit. Because when I think of costumes in Batman, clearly hers is what sticks out to me. <laughs> We're shown my all-time favorite, Gotham City. It's smoky, it's gothic, it's dirty, it's literally dripping with atmosphere. It's like Fritz Lang's Metropolis if it was going to mug you. Taxi! Taxi! Fans of the comic were no doubt tricked, thinking this was Bruce's parents about to be killed. But it's a separate family trying to fight prostitutes hitting on little kids. Hi, honey. That's ewier than I remember. They missed it. Give me a dollar. Come on. They missed it. How about it? One dollar. Oh, so that's where Dewey went. Ah! The family is still mugged, though, and this looks like a job for Batman. The animated series. Yeah, like most Burton movies, the effects range from spectacular to laughably bad. Burton himself admitted he kind of likes switching up the quality of his effects to give them a bit of a B-movie feel. Sometimes it works, like this is one of my favorite shots, but if you look close, you can see the keying makes it invisible. That's kind of a fun thing if you're paying attention. Stuff like this, though, even the 80s was calling up saying, What you doing? Hey, let's beat it, man. I don't like it up here. We get our first mention of Batman with the crooks afraid of what happened to a criminal named Johnny Gobbs. Johnny Gobbs got ripped and took a walk off a roof. I heard the bat got him. The bat? Oh man, give me a break, will you? See, that's what I love about this movie. It is dark, but it's not afraid to be a comic book. Nolan took a lot from the comics, arguably more than Burton, but in terms of style, he wanted it to be more realistic. This one takes itself seriously, but never too seriously. And these are classic comic book setups, or even radio play setups. Which figures too, as there were crossovers with that as well. Batman, played by Michael Keaton, shows up to kick some ass. No, he gets back up and whoops them with a white flash, which is a holdover from a later fight scene where the camera's taking pictures. But Burton thought it made the fight look cooler, so he used it here too. Maybe the flash went by to warn him about Lois Lane, I don't know. Say hi to Johnny Gobbs for me. What are you? I'm Batman. Then I'm hard as hell. 
Not only is Keaton the best live action Batman, but this is the only live action Batman suit I can take seriously. Returns is pretty much the same, and alright, Affleck was okay. But this one looks intimidating, arguably works Keaton's eyebrows into the mask, looks like a costume that's seen some fights, and of course, has that weird ass bat turn. <laughs> Keaton said the outfit was so stiff he couldn't turn his head, resulting in a pretty funny line in Dark Knight. You want to be able to turn your head. I sure made backing out of the driveway easier. Here, they just said it makes him move otherworldly. Again, it embraces the comic book environment, so it's like he's always keeping a symmetrical, imposing stance. It still looks awesome, even if the bat symbol is a little wrong. Not gonna lie, it kinda looks like he grew some bat dicks. The words Gotham City are synonymous with crime. Cut to a fundraiser for Harvey Dent, played by Billy D. Williams, which Bruce Wayne is not attending. Well, if he's not gonna see what one of his future foes looks like, he's like the rest of us. People of Gotham City, I'm a man of few words. Thank you. We're introduced to crooked cop Lieutenant Eckhart, played by William Hookins, and Alexander Knox, played by Robert Wall. Don't be writing this stuff in your newspaper, Knox. It'll ruin your already useless reputation. We got top men on this. Lieutenant, is there a six foot bat in Gotham City? And if so, is he on the police payroll? Is it true you're okay with the name Porkins? Who names the character Porkins? It looks like Knox isn't respected for his story on the Batman, as they even make drawings about him down at the office. Knox, I got something for you. <laughs> Very fun. Shouldn't there be two signatures on there? He's introduced to Vicky Vale, played by Kim Basinger, fresh off of covering a Frank Miller in-joke. And yeah, okay, not every line in this is terrific. I, I just loved your story, and I, I, I like bats. She said that like she runs a site dedicated to a bat fetish. After fighting off a slew of lines that wouldn't fly today. Hello, Lance. You want me to pose nude? You're gonna need a long lens. First, I'll take you to dinner and then we'll walk the trail. Will you marry me? Funny, it's usually the guy dressed as Batman who talks to women like this. We see mob boss Carl Grissom, played by Jack Palance, wants gangster Jack Napier, played by Jack Nicholson, to do a bust at Access Chemicals, which is really a setup for him sleeping with his lover. This is the only one in the movie who can give Nicholson's overacting a run for his money. He's the only actor I've seen who can scream whispers. Makes a connection with us and someone I can trust. What kind of damage? You're lucky, Dak. Never play a game of telephone with this guy. She sells seashells. At Wayne Manor's fundraiser to save the Gotham City Festival, we're introduced to Bruce Wayne out of costume this time. I love that our introduction is him not always knowing who he is. Could you tell me which of these guys is Bruce Wayne? Well, I'm not sure. Okay, for a photojournalist, you really should have done some research. He does come forward, though, as he eavesdrops on Vale and Knox, quietly making fun of his art collection. Oh, where'd this come from? I have no idea. It's Japanese. How do you know? Because I was in Gung Ho. Keaton said once he got Bruce Wayne down, Batman was very easy to figure out. And again, he's probably the best live action Bruce Wayne as well, because he's so charming and likable, but just a hint off. Oh, I read your work. I like it. I like it a lot. Oh, thanks. Can I have a grant? <laughs> <laughs> Give Knox a grant. If you told me any of these Bruce Waynes were Batman, I'd easily believe it. But he would be a legit surprise. But not to the point where I wouldn't buy it. Maybe that's one of the reasons he was chosen. You so wouldn't believe he's Batman that the public literally refused he was Batman. Later that night, Jack finds out he's been double-crossed and the cops show up. Freeze! Do we look like Arnold with an ice joke book to you? We get an action sequence where Batman once again shows up and, in my opinion, everything about these two characters can be summed up here where Batman grabs Jack but his assistant Bob tells him to put him down. Nice outfit. Everything you need to know about these two is in those two glances. With Nolan's films, they have to talk philosophy, psychology, symbols, meanings, a ton to know what they're all about. And again, don't get me wrong, it works fine there. But all you need here is these two looks to understand fully what these people are like. Jack's not even the Joker yet, and I feel like I know what he's all about just from that reaction. And Keaton's still the only Batman who can smile without looking like a dumbass. <laughs> Jack gets knocked into a vat of chemicals and, let's say, doesn't take it well. <laughs> you 
see what I have to work with here. Fun fact, the instruments on that table are the same used by the dentist in Little Shop of Horrors, which Jack was in the original version of. Intentional? I don't know. Fantastic? Yes. Vicky and Bruce have a date at his house, and while yes, a lot of her role in the action scenes is just screaming. <laughs> Stop it. Get some help. She does add an anchor of credibility to what's, let's face it, a group of weird-ass people. Do you like eating in here? No, no, the truth, I don't think I've ever been in this room before. <laughs> she feels like a real person, as does Alfred, played by Michael Goff. Both of them allow a break from so much madness and bring a believable amount of heart to the film. I don't remember really caring much when Rachel and Wayne talked in the Nolan films. It always felt like it was just a way to move the story forward. Here, it's to reveal more about who they are, and it always feels like a legitimately warm conversation. It sort of reminds me of my grandfather. Mm. Were you close to him? Yeah, I used to spend summers with him and my grandmother. They had a, a house on the lake. I just saw a man get chemically scarred into a clown, and I would love to know more about her grandfather. Even to this day, I can't decide if this is really clever or the stupidest scene in the movie. I also eat insects. Jack returns as the Joker killing Grissom, and by God, this might be the most fun I've seen a Joker have since Cesar Romero. <laughs> I have a theory that each actor takes something from the previous Joker that results in a positive Get out of here! but also somehow unique performance. Apparently he improvised a lot of the weird movements and sounds, making it unquestionably Jack, but unquestionably fun too. Yes, he's creepy and killing people, but it looks like he's having such a ball laughing at his own jokes, it's kind of contagious. He's like a walking homicidal dad joke. You just laugh because of how hard he's laughing. You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. <laughs> Again, in contrast to Nolan's films, there's a big thing about Joker making a point and spreading chaos. In this one, his plan just is chaos. Sometimes he's an artist, sometimes he's an entertainer, sometimes he's a gangster, sometimes he's in love with someone, other times he'll just throw her out without thinking twice. I like you never know what's coming your way, because I don't think he always knows. Can't make it then either, I've got a very important meeting today. The next day Bruce tells Vicky he's going to be out of town for a few days so they can't hang out. I'll talk to you guys when you get back. Back, Miss Vale? We're going to be here for quite a while. Thanks, Alfred! Just tell him Batman while you're at it! Speaking of which, Vale follows Bruce and sees he's the world's most romantic litter bug. Why is he dating a sidewalk? At a press conference with the mascot of Godfather's Pizza. Mr. Grissom asked me to take over the operation of his businesses until he returns. Again, I love how comic booky this is. A bunch of mimes perform to distract the people from Bob taking pictures. Even though they'd probably be drawing more attention to him the way this is set up. Grissom's signature is perfectly legitimate. It is legitimate! The Joker takes out the owner of Grissom's business, and it's here Bruce makes an amazing discovery. Mimes don't talk? most colorless new set. Reports are coming in that models are dying in a very strange way. The fashion world was stunned today by the sudden deaths of models Candy Walker and Amanda Keeler. Authorities suspect condiment man. In Gotham were discovered today. It looks like the Joker has contaminated a bunch of beauty products, killing the people who use them, forcing newscasters to stop wearing makeup, which is pretty hilarious. And Batman looks at more info on Jack Napier. Idiot, if he just turned that page, he'd find the man who killed his parents! Seriously, that's an amazing detail. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna be ten minutes late to the museum, okay? He has to get ready, though, for the date he's not going on. I'm not meeting her today. Yeah, for the world's greatest detective, he sure does take his sweet time putting together what's going on. Costing a lot of lives at the... Flugelheim Museum? They just want other museums to stop making fun of the Guggenheim's name. It's, of course, the Joker who meets up with Vale after doctoring up the art, then undoctoring it, 
And did I mention Prince did all the songs in this? Don't worry, if not, Prince will make it clear. He always sounds like Minnie Mouse if her purse got stolen. <laughs> a Batman and Joker movie, but in real life, we know Prince was both. Joker makes the moves on Vale, saying he wants her to photograph his work. You will take pictures and record my work. You will join me in the avant-garde, the new aesthetic. Can we just give an honorary Oscar to the guy who has to have his face down in the lasagna this whole scene? That dude is surprisingly convincing. <laughs> Batman breaks in to save the day. Hold on. It should be pointed out that Keaton suggested having a different voice for Batman so people wouldn't recognize him as Wayne. Up until that point, Batman just had the same speaking voice as Bruce Wayne. Think about it, Kevin Conroy altering his voice might not have happened if Keaton didn't come up with this idea. I personally want to thank him for not only doing it so well, but for inspiring others who didn't do it so well. Where were the other drugs going? I know I've made enough jokes about that. Oh, don't worry, there's still more coming. The two of them get into my personal favorite Batmobile. Fun fact, when they showed this model to Burton, he said, that looks great. Where's the door? Shit. The top opens up. Yeah, that's it. A last man addition, but it worked out pretty good. Oh, my cabbages! How much do you weigh? About 108, I think. Speaking of models having this on Blu-ray, did not do these models any favors. Didn't I see Dark Helmet playing with those? Stunt Double is also, shall we say, a little John McCaney, but he gives us a kick-ass fight scene, so I can't complain. Ah! You weigh a little more than 108. And that was the last we ever saw of Batman. He takes her to the Batcave, again to some of the greatest music you will ever hear. How good is it, it made the Batman and Robin trailer look epic? When Venom meets vengeance. <laughs> That's no small feat. And he says he cracked the Joker's code, but that's not the only reason he brought her there. There is something else you have that I want. What? This is the point where every parent that brought their kid went, no. No, he just took the film she shot of him from her bra. That's still kind of bad. If I bring something to you, can we make the evening edition? She gets the info to the press, and Bruce thinks about telling her the truth. It's not easy confessing a lie, though, when you've already lied about so much. Listen, I came over to clear a few things. I don't know who you think you are. I'm Batman. Oh, I didn't want it to come out that way. It's a testament to Keaton's charm that he can tell her to shut up. You're a real nice girl, and I like you a lot. But for right now, shut up. And literally seconds later, she's comforting him. Hey, it's OK. You can tell me. Shut up. But the Joker interrupts, and as I think many have pointed out before, their three confrontations are once as Batman and Napier, second as Bruce and Joker, and finally as Batman and Joker. And you gotta love a scene where the idea is who can out-crazy the other. Mean kid. Bad seed. I like him already. <laughs> it's like a challenge for whose eyebrows can hit the ceiling first. This light shot! Now you wanna get nuts? Come on! Let's get nuts. He just went full Beetlejuice. Never go full Beetlejuice! The Joker shoots him, but Vale discovers later that he's gone, leaving a bulletproof plate behind. I had to wait for a bomb squad before opening that. <laughs> okay, that was pretty funny. Later, she discovers that Bruce's parents, or at least father, was murdered. Boy, the mother really does get the shaft in these movies. I wouldn't be surprised if the article read, oh, and some broad he married. Don't worry, Snyder would overcorrect this in the future. Public safety. Joker here. The next day, Joker makes another threat, which at this point, Gotham is so used to crime they don't even listen to it. Until he says he's gonna drop millions in cash on the crowd. I will dump 20 million in cash on the crowd. Again, I feel like this has more timeless commentary than the hours of discussion from Dark Knight Rises. A corrupt world will forgive anything if you corrupt them even further. But Bruce figures out two things. One, Jack Napier killed his parents when he was a boy. And two, Foot Life Frenzy is the longest running show in Gotham. Let's go, Jack! I'll admit I go back and forth between what I think with the Joker killing his folks. I like that it's usually a low level criminal who, in some versions, is never found, but it does tie things together pretty nicely in a self contained movie, seeing how they both, in an ironic way, created each other. I made you. You made me first. 
but just as Bruce discovers who the Joker really is, Vale discovers who Bruce really is. Tell me if I'm crazy, but that wasn't just another night for either of us, was it? For whatever reason, people really lost their minds when Alfred let Vale into the Batcave. But what, she didn't put it together by now? He was literally about to tell her, and honestly, I thought him being bulletproof and disappearing out the window was his way of telling her. But nope. Fans made such a shit show about something nobody cares about years later that they even referenced it in the sequel. Who let Vicky Vale into the Batcave? I'm sitting there working and I turn around, there she is. Oh, hi Vic, come on in. Yes, fixing problems fans have in a sequel always turns out great. They have again what feels like a really honest conversation. None of these lines are clever or flashy, they just talk like real people. But I don't know what to think of all this. I really don't. Look, sometimes I don't know what to think about this. They say casting me will destroy Batman, but this is okay. They try to make amends, and Batman heads to Axis Chemicals to blow them sky high. <laughs> yeah, 80s Batman believes in killing, guns, and Looney Tunes style explosions. <laughs> I smell a bat in the next lineup. But the Joker. And his Kenner accessories not included. Get out in time and start poisoning the city with toxic gas on the crowd. In a deleted scene, he knocks out the cops so they don't stop him and the money is fake. Actually putting his face on the one dollar bill. The cop thing would have been a nice explanation, but I like more that this was probably the mob's money. Like he was wasting it all on this one joke. It's kind of Ledger-esque. Just a side note, this is one of my favorite shots of the movie. I want to see the HBO logo in the sky at the end of that. Nevertheless, Batman uses the Batplane to take the balloons down, or rather up. This doesn't please the Joker at all. Bob, it's gone. A moment of silence for the best hench person until Harley Quinn. Bobby's dead! Show some respect! Joker takes out Batman with, what else, a joke, and sends him crashing to the ground and taking Vicky hostage. I've got to get you to the church on time. If I had to pick which version of Batman had a My Fair Lady reference, it would not be this one. Batman is alive, though. I love the smoke he spits out. And he quietly sneaks up to our village. Admittedly, that is the dumbest thing he does in the movie. Joker sends one of the bells crashing down, blocking the cops from going further. If I can't move it, none of you can. They get their Toontown lights, though, and shine it on Batman, fighting off the last of the henchmen. However the hell they got up there. I am. Going over here, apparently. As I was saying, I am Batman! Oh, sorry! You can be Batman! You wanna be Batman? You're not Batman! He defeats him, though, and finally makes his way to the Joker. Theo tries to distract him, and I love this look she gives, as if, like, what does he do in this suit? Oh, God, don't think about it. <laughs> Batman admits Joker killed his parents, and this really is a moment that maybe needed to quote another Batman property. You killed my parents. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? I know it didn't exist yet, but that's no excuse. Batman shoves him off a cliff, only to have the Joker shove him off a cliff. But Batman still has one trick up his sleeve. I'll admit, I bust a gut every time I hear the Joker go from laughing hysterically to just saying, shit. I don't know how many Jokers have just straight out said shit, but there needs to be more. This is a great drawn out death. You love seeing him laugh while he struggles, but it's also very satisfying because Batman's seeing the killer of his parents get his very slow comeuppance. <laughs> yeah, until it turns into a rope action movie. Batman and Vale fall too, but he uses his grappling hook to save them. <laughs> we'll be okay, as long as you weigh 108. <laughs> No, the day is saved, and the cops now have a great connection with the Cape Crusader. We've received a letter from Batman this morning. It just says, I'm Batman. 
They turn on the bat signal, Vicky goes to visit Bruce, one of the worst transitions I've ever seen in anything takes place. But who cares, the music's amazing, and this is one hell of a final shot. And that was Batman, all these years later. Still my favorite. This is what got Batman, as we know him today, the dark brooding Cape Crusader, into the mainstream again. The makers of Batman the Animated Series admitted without this film, they wouldn't have the show as we know it. Almost everything connected to Batman in media has this dark, gritty tone. In fact, the challenge now seems to be how far can they go to make it even darker. This also brought comic book movies into the mainstream, as they exploded shortly after. Most comic book movies took the formula of not telling an origin story, but rather just starting out with the hero already fighting crime. So many superhero movies afterwards owe their popularity because this film was such a massive hit. I love it's more of a show don't tell kind of flick. I love how the Joker is always loud in the open where Batman is always quiet in the shadows. I love how so much of this movie's strengths is in its performances and its visuals. That's not at all to say the script is bad. I actually argue it lets the characters just be characters and not lectures about the characters. I clearly love Nolan's Dark Knight, but for me, there's only one original, Batman. With that said, just because this is my personal favorite Batman movie doesn't mean it's objectively the best. <laughs>
I shouldn't trust anybody. Dude, we're so close to wrapping up Dark Knight Month. Okay, but I'm gonna get down to the bottom of who this phantasm really is. Oh, a sandbag? Why would there be a sandbag in a hallway? Let's take a look at Batman Mask of the Phantasm. This intro is pretty fantastic. A lot of CGI in the early 90s doesn't age that well, but with the Art Deco style of the city, this blends pretty great. The music by the great Shirley Walker keeps the tradition that the soundtrack to a Batman movie is always spectacular. Plus, there's a rumor that the Latin in the choir is really just the names of the music team backwards. Everybody knows if you play the music backwards, it's really just a recipe for muffins. In Latin. By the devil. After that epic opening, the movie wastes no time getting started, as Batman, played by Kevin Conroy, stops a gangster named Chucky Saul, played by Dick Miller, from creating counterfeit money. Ha! You should have shot where I was going to be! Still the best Batman. Chucky Saul. Saul is approached, though, by the Phantasm, cleverly voiced by Stacy Keach, who also voices Carl Beaumont. This works on a few levels when you realize who the Phantasm is, and yes, we are gonna go into spoilers about who it is because, well, if the friggin' action figure did it, so can we. I should also point out, this is Warner Brothers' first animated PG movie, and it earns it. There's not only a decent body count in this, but some of these deaths are impressively violent. But, you know, Sing 2 has the same rating. What was in Sing 2? I'm sorry, what requires parental guidance in Sing 2? Rude. Rude? This is a guy who gets squashed by a statue in his own grave. But shit, be careful, parents. Rude! The Phantasm decides to better kill Saul. Nope, gonna make it work. And gets away from Batman just in time. Well, I can't follow that, I'll just call it a day. Councilman Arthur Reed, played by Hart Bachner, thinks Batman killed Saul and tries to get a nationwide manhunt going for him. A lot of people, including the police, I might add, think Batman's as unstable as the crooks he brings in. He's just doing this so more people will call his girlfriend. Later at a party in Wayne Manor, Bruce wines and dines many of his lady friends. Oh, never say the M word in front of Bruce. Haven't you ever thought about marriage? A jilted lover is pissed off that he vanished out of nowhere as Reed takes this opportunity to open up an old wound. At least since that one girl, Andrea Beaumont. How'd you let her get loose? Thanks for the handkerchief, Arthur. You know where you can stick it. Now that was very rude. At least five Sing 2s. This really should have been PG-13. In an almost Citizen Kane-style flashback, Bruce remembers when he first met Andrea, played by Dana Delaney, who apparently did such a good job they brought her back to play Lois Lane. Know who that was? Bruce Wayne. Who are you talking to? My mother. Let me out! Let me out! She's a psycho! Help! Andrea Beaumont. Bruce Wayne. I know. The boy billionaire. But Wayne doesn't have time for love as he's putting his plan into action to stop crime as a vigilante. Give credit too, this is the first Batman movie to focus on him developing his superhero identity. Which is an element Christopher Nolan would focus on in the future. There was only one thing wrong. They weren't afraid of me. I've got to strike fear in them from the start. Maybe a Christopher Lambert voice from Mortal Kombat. There's nothing to stop Gotham tearing itself apart. Andrea shows up insulted that he didn't call her yet. Yeah, that's fair. I should use that number you didn't give me. It's been three days since we met and still no calls. I figured you must be dead or something. Delaney really is perfect as the cheerful optimist turned vengeful brooder like out of a gothic 40s film or, yes, a dark comic book. It's a role she honestly already perfected in Tombstone, which came out the same year. In fact, some of the lines are eerily similar. Miss Hovey's self-defense class for girls. <laughs> oh, he laughs. Oh, he's laughing again. He knocks some sleeves onto her dress as we cut back to the present day where the Phantasm kills another gangster. And as cool as Stacy Keach's voice is, I don't think anyone can make the name Buzz sound scary. Buzz. I always want to follow it with your girlfriend, Woof. Not only is the story very much like a 40s film noir, but the imagery is too. In fact, if you want a cool experience, try watching it in black and white. 
I know a lot of people are doing that with Fury Road, but I'm telling you, this movie looks pretty amazing with that treatment too. It's the stinking bat! Again, Batman is mistaken for the killer, and what a coinky dink. Andrea happens to be back in town around the same time. She also puts together who Batman is pretty fast. Bruce? Well, that's just far-fetched. She clearly needs to be an orphan and just look at him in the face. That, I believe. As well drawn as Batman is, usually blending into the shadows, how did nobody notice him here? Remember this place? Sure. You may- Talk louder! No, don't look at me, just talk louder! He has yet another flashback to when they went to the World's Fair. This might be my favorite setting for the film as it shows the young optimistic hopefulness of the future contrasted later with the dark, corrupt present we eventually get. At last I meet the elusive Bruce Wayne. Bruce is introduced to her father, a businessman named Carl who has ties to the mob. Again, since we're going to spoilers, I loved showing this movie to friends and asking if they could guess who this gangster was. Nobody ever gets that it's the Joker, but they're thrilled when it's revealed. Part of what makes that so clever is this guy is shown first and the Joker is shown second. So you know he exists, obviously, but you're not thinking this could be him. If the Joker was revealed earlier, I think people might have figured it out too early. Bruce tries to stop a robbery, but is thrown off when Andrea acts concerned. He questions further if his future of being Hot Dog Man should be a reality. I can't put myself on the line as long as there's someone waiting for me to come home. I'm waiting for you to come home, sir. In a pretty emotional scene, Bruce pleads with the grave of his parents to give him a chance at a real life, as he didn't plan on being happy. The lightning strike every time he asks is about as gothic an answer you can get. I can give money to the city. They can hire more cops. No! Please. No! Maybe they sent me. We did not bat before hoes, our oh, spirit. Back in modern day, another aging gangster named Salvatore, played by Ava Goda, is concerned the Batman will get him next. Is it true? We have eyewitnesses. That's just beautiful. Why? I'm too old for this. He said the same thing when he was forced to do Good Burger. <laughs> Pull over. It's not very healthy in here. No! Batman puts together that the gangsters the Phantasm is killing are connected, and Alfred can't help but hope maybe after this is all done, he'll reunite with his old flame. You think you know everything about me, don't you? I dive at your bottom. I bloody well ought to. Don't bring up this morning! Cut to another flashback where Bruce finally decides to put Batman on hold and follow his heart. Oh, never mind. I'm no good at this. Cigarette? I, I always felt like you never knew what to do with me because I wasn't in the plan. I'm changing the plan. How does Batwoman sound? No, oh, I shouldn't have proposed in the same spot Jane Eyre got proposed in. After dropping her off though, the ring is mailed back with a letter saying forget about her. Left with dad. Too young. Need time. I don't smoke. Being the world's greatest detective, he won't follow this up at all. It's the early years. He's a junior greatest detective. And we're given one of the best Batman costume reveals in any movie. How good is it? It doesn't even show the costume. It's just Alfred's reaction with that phenomenal music. And it gives me chills every time. My God. I guess the one thing I haven't talked about that much yet is the mystery. It's not really that hard to figure out. You know it can't be any of the characters from the show, Reed would be too obvious, and the father is introduced too late for that to be a satisfying reveal. So you know it has to be Andrea. Her arriving in town early was a clever decoy, but everything else points to her. It always seemed just a little too obvious, and that can be distracting. Oh, is Dark Knight Month ruined for you now? Okay, seriously, why do we have so many sandbags? I will make you pay forever. I don't even think that makes sense, Tamara. Tamara? What makes you say that? Tamara, come on, the sandbags were embarrassing enough, but this is spectacularly embarrassing. No, no, I'm not her at all. In fact, oh, oh, here she comes. I better run, because she's so strong and she will beat me up. <sighs> yeah, that's right, you better run. It's okay, I got him, Critic, don't worry. Tamara, there's not enough stop signs to convey what you have to do. What are you saying with your words? I definitely... 
He's back! I shall kill him! No, no more. From that. I heard a fight. Was there a fight? Malcolm, how come you and the Phantasm are never in the same room together? Oh my god. I never thought about that. Maybe I'm the Phantasm. I just know I'm not the Phantasm. Okay, we're taking a break. Believe it or not, the Phantasm is causing some chaos around here. We should really get on that. Yes, I'll be watching myself very closely. That Malcolm's pretty sus, huh? Life, Salvatore goes to the only character who can make things more complicated. Guess? Can it be? He goes to the Joker, played by Mark Hamill, to see if he can get him off the hook. Business. I got. Ooh, business sounds like fun. Not like does Joker add a lot of energy and humor in this macabre story, but it's pretty risky when you consider the Joker is the B villain in this. How many Batman movies are there where he's the side character and not the main antagonist? Good Batman movies are there. Can't be too careful with all those weirdos around. He's the perfect drop of chaos that raises the tension halfway through the movie. Like Steve Buscemi's character in Con Air if he actually did something. Also, how did Ponder Joker hands not become a meme? Your hands are just as dirty. When Salvatore pushes him too far, the Joker gets his revenge while Batman visits Andrea getting back from a date with Reed. Mm. No. I go back and forth between Andrea acting cold to him as it was technically her who called things off. Yes, we discover the reason why later, but she seems pretty harsh over a breakup she caused. You still following your dad's orders? The only one in this room controlled by his parents is you. I guess you could argue she's let down by what he became and that he never led that normal life that he indicated he could lead. I like the cape. Not sure about the mask, though. You ever think of something skullish? Speaking of which, later that night, the Phantasm goes to take out Salvatore, but it looks like the Joker got to him first. Your angel of death awaits. Oh, most people I'd say that to have a sad face. Batman tries to put a stop to all this, but it looks like the police are trying to stop him as well. Step away from the edge of the roof. Oh, it'll find its way back home. Yeah, did they confiscate that or what? They get the SWAT team from the Blues Brothers, and honestly, this is a pretty suspenseful scene. We get the first drops of blood we've seen in any animated Batman property. Bruce takes his mask off to fool the cops, leaving him exposed. And in animation, you can get the antagonist as close as you want to him just missing who he is. Making this a really heart-pounding moment. Andrea. Hurry! Just move the cloak and scythe out of the way. The day is saved and Andrea finally tells Bruce the truth of what's going on. Later that night when she was dropped off, the mob demanded their money, but Carl couldn't get it in time. As soon as the European banks open, I'll have the whole amount wired to you. He doesn't have the money though and it would take some time to get. Andrea tells him that Bruce proposed to her. So why don't you just ask him for the money? Um, they didn't want to get him involved. I don't know. But she said the mob still wanted more, and to get revenge, her father became the Phantasm. Or maybe someone related to him, who if their voice was altered, maybe would sound like him? Again, this is why I love Keech voicing both parts. Well, talking about fathers and dead people is pretty hot. Want to make out? Ooh. Leave a tie on the door, sir. So after they bat-banged, yeah, again, wearing that PG rating like a badge of honor, Bruce makes a discovery looking at an old picture of the mobsters. Again, this reveal is awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> the penguin! I love seeing people's reactions to this. It's both a mixture of laughter and, oh shit, everything just got worse. And to think our tax money goes to pay those jerks. I always love, too, there's one moment where Hamill loses the Joker voice. It's when he visits Reed and he says the words to find out. What do you want? To find out who's iced the old gang. To find out, to find out, to find out. I don't know why, I always thought that was really cool. 
Just as Joker tries to get answers from Reed, Batman does the same after he's injected with laughing toxin. It makes for an intimidating, but also pretty funny scene. Why did the Joker meet with you? He thinks you're involved. Why? And why are our tongues fire hydrant red? Seriously, they're glowing in the dark! He reveals that he got involved with the mob, and when he couldn't pay them back, he handed over Carl's location because he was his accountant. You sold him to the mob. I was broke! Desperate! They said all they wanted was their money back! <laughs> I offered them all Rolexes and did nothing! Batman goes to Andrea's apartment to get more answers, but she's not in. Suddenly, the telephone rings. <clears throat> Miss Beaumont? There's no use jumping out the window this time. The Joker tries to blow up her place, but Batman stops it, and we finally learn what happened after she and her father fled. Dad? Ah! Oh, I knew we shouldn't have hit a Falcone Estates. Back in modern day, the Joker gets a little... Uh, the scene explains itself. What do you say, hon? Feeling the old electricity tonight? I don't know what's more disturbing, the fact that the Joker would bang a robot or the fact that we have no problem believing he would. We're given the big reveal that the Phantasm was in fact the whole time Andrea. So you figured it out. I kind of love how the extra padding to disguise her figure just flies off when she loses the mask. That's some dedicated sewing right there. While the animation in this movie is great, it's spectacular in the last third. The fights, the smoke effects, the expressions, everything about this climax is really impressive. Even the sound design. I know it doesn't get talked about much, but a good chunk of this climax and a lot of the film's action sequences also works because everything sounds as massive as it looks. Okay, that was a T-Rex, but you get the idea, it sounds just as good! Batman gets there just in time to stop the Joker from chopping her into pieces. You owe me a bike. We have a good argument about justice and vengeance that again is mirrored in future Nolan movies, and she makes a good point about what a thin line it is between what they do. What will vengeance solve? If anyone knows the answer to that, Bruce, it's you. I like, too, he doesn't have a witty comeback. Something like that is saved later when there's a speech from Alfred. I think I always liked a Batman who's smart and doesn't always get duped, yet doesn't have everything figured out, either. Leave, Andy. Now. Jesus, Miss Hove's self-defense class for girls is next level shit! I actually love how it's never revealed how she performs these tricks, but it's still done within a cloud of smoke. Not just adding to the Phantasm's look, but also showing it's probably just an illusion we haven't figured out yet. <laughs> We're given a really fun fight with the Joker, almost mirroring a Godzilla-style climax, when Batman knocks his tooth out, somehow making him funnier than he already is. Even when shit gets real, you can't help but laugh at that ridiculous gap in his teeth. <laughs> Joker says he's gonna blow up the amusement park, but Batman stops him from escaping, meaning they're all gonna get blown sky high. And I'm really glad I can go into spoilers with this one, because man, I was sick of cropping this shot whenever I wanted to talk about the most epic Joker laugh. While we're on the subject, this is the most epic Joker laugh. It really does show how far Andrea has fallen as she basically chooses revenge over saving her true love though he gets out pretty much through dumb luck. Bruce and Alfred remark on how far gone she is. Vengeance blackens the soul, Bruce. I always feared you would become that which you fought against. Alfred has always been fatherly, but again, this really has a Nolan feel to it. I'm honestly questioning more and more how much he might have been inspired by this. But Andrea fell into that pit years ago, and no one, not even you, could have pulled her back. Andrea decides, screw it, she's going on vacation! But she can't take a vacation away from herself as she says her most emo line. Do, do you want to be alone? I am. So alone! <laughs> Batman broods alone as well, but at least the city forgives him. Either that or he blackmailed Reed to get him off the hook. And we end again with some of the most chilling music in anything Batman. And 
Bat said to be the most authentic Batman movie, and honestly, I can't disagree with him. Like I said, if I had one issue, I wish the mystery was a little stronger. I mean, I feel like we could have put on a better mystery. Again? Ha 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 ha, go Phantasm. Don't worry, Critic, I'll get him! Got him! Oh my god, I've had enough of this. Okay, let's see who this Phantasm really is. What? That's right, it was me the whole time. Makes no sense! Yeah, I for sure thought that it was me. It was all part of my diabolical plan, you see. I went to extreme measures to look like Tamra. But how? I spray painted my wrist white and wrote diabetic. Then what? I altered my voice to sound like a lower version of your voice. Okay, how the hell did your height change when you put on the mask? Well, I have to have some secrets. This is the stupidest mystery I've ever been a part of. Exactly. Nobody's expecting a great mystery because it's a review show. Oh, and since we did an okay one, or even any mystery at all, it's pretty impressive. It's not even an okay one. You didn't see it coming. Okay, maybe the mystery in this is a little better than I thought. While Batman would often do detective stories, this is one of the few that offers a mystery you can solve on your own. Even the Batman is him solving a case, but you aren't given the clues to figure it out. In this one, you are. And it's still the only Batman movie to do that. Also, as many critics have pointed out, this is much more of an adult Batman movie than the adult Batman movies that were being made. But it is still meant for older kids as a starting point. And I think older kids would find this a decent mystery. And yeah, as I've learned, writing a mystery can be more difficult than I thought. It also might be the shortest Batman movie, with a running time of only 75 minutes, so it doesn't overstay its welcome. If anything, it had a huge advantage because the characters were already set up from the show, but even if they weren't, you could get what they were about very quickly. When I think of something that encompasses the essence of what Batman is over the years, I do think of the animated series, and this movie is lumped in with that. This feels like a film that was underestimated but has really grown a dedicated following over the years as being the truest Batman flick. I can think of no better way to close out Dark Knight Month than praising a movie that best represented what the Dark Knight was all about. It pretty much is everything you think of when you think of Batman. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, I remember Wait, it's- did you fight me in the hallway earlier? I'm not safe here. I step out of the rain into the Channel Awesome studio. I make my way into the lounge where it's still raining. The forecast called for selective focus all week and today was no exception. Everyone is getting ready to shoot our review of the Batman. Malcolm's prepared as Commissioner Gordon. Tamara's set to go as Catwoman. Hey, I'm Vengeance! I have Walter as Batman. Wonder how I'm gonna work that out. It doesn't matter, for there's a mystery to solve. Because like the Batman, this is a detective story. An important one. Trying to answer one of the biggest questions the film could have raised. Is that me as the gang leader? The hell are you supposed to be? I don't know. looks like you. It looks exactly like me. The internet says it's you. And has the internet ever been wrong about anything? I'm gonna send this down to headquarters. No! This thing is so big it's probably already taken over the police. 
What should we do then? Keep an eye on it. I get the feeling there's more to this mystery than meets the eye. So yeah, this was surprisingly good. Matt Reeves' The Batman had a lot of hype when the trailers dropped, but before then, there was a lot of doubters. Mostly around the casting choice of Robert Pattinson as the lead role. Which meant, of course, in keeping with every controversial Batman choice, he turned out to be fantastic. But it wasn't just his performance that made the film work. I'll admit, my first concern was this was going to be too similar to the Nolan films. But thankfully, it had its own unique identity. The movie drew influence much more from the pulp detective stories that Batman had origins in. So it's like a mix of everything you think of when you visualize scuzzy film noir. It's rainy, smoky, has opening and closing narration, and more focus on the mystery rather than the crime fighting. This might be the first Batman movie to focus more on Batman than Bruce Wayne. In a good way this time. But that does bring up a good point. In the other films, this wouldn't have worked. But here? It thrives because it has the comic center of an awkward, crazy loner bringing justice to an awkward, crazy world. There's a lot of movie to talk about, more than at World's End's worth. So let's jump right into it. This is... making up for a lot. The movie opens, much like the rest of the film, kind of like a horror flick, with the Riddler watching outside the home of a politician. It utilizes visual storytelling from the start as we see him look at the ceiling window and the following shot at night shows it's cracked open. That was so subtle I actually missed it the first time. Speaking of missing stuff, uh, hello? Yeah, I'm watching it now. Riddle me oh, this, can you see me? Post -post. Uh, I knew I should have brought the other suit. <laughs> he kills the politician and we cut to Batman, played by Twilight's holy shit these people can act to her, doing something I'm shocked Batman's never done in a movie before, narrate. Two years of night have turned me into a nocturnal animal. This perfectly sets up the detective and comic book element as both involve a lot of narration. Also, welcome back to Chicago, Gotham. You can pretend to be Times Square, but deep down we know you're the Magnificent Mile. When that light hits the sky, it's not just a call, it's a warning. This film apparently also got some flag for being too serious. But I argue strongly there's a lot of comedy in it just for very weird twisted people. If you're not snickering at the Riddler's clear colored glasses with his serial killer mask, Gordon saying let the guy dress like a bat on the crime scene, or holding on this image while dramatic music plays, I don't know how to explain the humor to you. Just for a second, get out of the Marvel movie mindset and say, you know what? People dressing up like this is goddamn insane. And you'll get the movie's comedy. Speaking of visual storytelling, it might be a little obvious, but I love that this gang member who has his doubts about the crimes they're pulling off has only half his makeup on. And he's the one that Batman lets go. I like he saw he was walking that tightrope between good and bad, much like he does, and showed mercy. Or maybe he's Harvey Dent, I don't know. Come on, this is demonstrated in a scene where the gang members want to beat up a guy on the train. They're led by... Who are you? Are you me? Am I you? Perhaps I should check on what Commissioner Malcolm has discovered. Commissioner Malcolm! An envelope. Somebody thinks we're getting too close. Somebody who has the answer. I think this is more of a commercial break moment. Good point, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Oh. Anyway. At first I didn't like that they hear Batman's footsteps as his big thing was always stealth, but I quickly put together, he wants them to hear his footsteps. The hell are you supposed to be? I'm vengeance. So I'll admit, while I love the costumes in this movie, I hate the masks. Batman's armor is creative, and I will give credit that not having a bottom half of the mask really allows a lot more of the performance to come through. But he looks like Batman Skeeto to me. The stringy ears, the dollar store mask nose, it just doesn't do it for me. The Riddler's mask has the opposite problem. It covers up too much of his performance, a lot like Defoe in The Green Goblin. So much of what makes him creepy and funny at the same time is seeing his face. I feel like this could have been one of the great Batman villain performances if they actually let us see his performance. Get off! You deserve to be dead after what you did! You hear me! What the hell am I looking at? Catwoman... No, what? What were they thinking? 
All she has is a ski mask that's a little pointy at the top. She literally works in a job that requires her to wear sexy clothes, and she loves cats. There's no way they could have worked a sexy cat mask into this. This dude's dressed like somebody burnt the monarch. We can buy that somebody will wear a cat mask. It's not that far-fetched. You gonna let him in here? Let him through. I also love that Gordon, played by the often underrated Jeffrey Wright, is kind of a weirdo too. Batman's been around for only two years at this point, and people, understandably so, find his presence a little crazy. And Wright plays Gordon like a guy who's just given up and says, you know what? He gets results. The city is shit, and the guy who cleans the shit is gonna be a little weird. Just ask this dude a quiz job as a chanter. Batman gets a riddle addressed to him, so he takes it to his bat... subway. And eh, I guess I've seen enough caves. And we're introduced to emo Bruce Wayne. <laughs> No, I mean actually emo, like he even leaves the eye makeup on. Part of me kind of thinks maybe they should have left it on the other actors. Eh, maybe not. It won't be long before you've nothing left. I don't care about that. You don't care about your family's legacy? What I'm doing is my family's legacy. Some people are torn about this portrayal of Bruce Wayne, and I can't pretend I don't understand why. But I surprisingly like it because of Pattinson. We're still in his early years, so I think him being a shut-in gives him room to grow and learn more how to be a stronger Bruce Wayne as well as a stronger Batman. It's not like the world is rewarding him for being a shut-in. Every time he's Bruce Wayne, he sees ways he could be helping as a human being, but doesn't because it would get in the way of him helping as a giant bat. Your family has a history of philanthropy, but as far as I can tell, you're not doing anything. In the end, he realizes that, and instead of focusing on getting vengeance, he focuses on saving people as... Well, okay, still Batman, yeah, I really would have liked it if Bruce wrote a check to the city or something like that at the end, but it doesn't look good on a poster. I also know the dude is 36, so he's not that young. But again, this is where the casting of Pattinson is very clever. I think it's safe to say we all still connect him to that emo kid from Twilight. And I think the film not shying away from that makes it easy to believe him as a boy Bruce Wayne, but also buy him as a Batman. The only thing I hate is how often he snaps at Alfred, played by Andy Serkis. You have to keep up appearances. You're still a Wayne. What about you? You are Wayne? Your father gave them to me. <laughs> I know that's like the idea, like a kid snapping at his father, and I'm glad he always has a humbling comeback, but this dude wakes up in a hospital after almost dying, and he's like, did you screw me over, old man? And he's like, suck my dick Grayson, you butt horse. The moment I knew Pattinson was a great Batman is when him and Gordon find another clue. With just the subtlest of reactions, he gives a look like, Wait till you get a load of this. Some drive. How did he do that? It's almost the exact same expression he has throughout the entire movie, yet somehow I know exactly what he was thinking, and it got a huge laugh out of me. Who the hell says this movie has no humor? That's the penguin. That's the Iceberg Lounge. The clue leads them to an underground club led by the Penguin, played by Colin Farrell. No, I am. Yeah. Get out of here, Green Lantern. Hey, I got a riddle. What does a literal Batman sound like? Take it easy, sweetheart. As many have pointed out, it's hard to recognize Farrell under all that makeup, but for me, it's harder to recognize him under that performance. I got you! Take that, you friggin' psycho! I got you! how much fun he had as Bullseye and Daredevil and that he can go really big and silly. So this strange hybrid of Robert De Niro and comedies and Al Pacino and dramas is pretty enjoyable. Holy God, what are you showing me? Hey, come on! Ah, you're gonna turn me into a meme over here! Selena Kyle, played by Zoe Kravitz, is pretty cool as Catwoman as well. She works at the Penguins Club and is concerned about the disappearance of her close friend Anika. The same way Vi would be concerned about her close old buddy, Caitlyn. Ani? Baby? Two points over Dark Knight Rises for the sole fact that she owns a cat! You got a lot of cats. You got a lot of shitty sequels. The two of them also had pretty good chemistry, as when he gives her contact camera lenses, one of my favorite gizmos in the movie, her advances never seem to penetrate his no-nonsense bat ways. You really don't care what happens to me in there tonight, do you? Look at me. Good. No time for love, Dr. Jones. She serves as a spy to see if they can figure out why the Riddler is knocking off cops and politicians. As she starts to get some answers, she's distracted by someone who might know where Anika is. Keep him talking. Wait, where are you going? No, stay on the DA. Bad kitty! Bad! Where's Anika? Thus, we're introduced to John Turturro playing Goddammit Nolan Lied to Me about how to say this name. 
You know Carmine Falcone. Falcone paid him off to get chill out in the open. Gif, Jif, no, nobody says Jif. Me, 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 no, nobody says me, me. Mako, Mako, I really blow at this. Selena is thrown off by him being there and she exits, leaving the DA she was talking to to be killed by the Riddler. Oh, you need a ride? That's me right there. So this might sound like a strange compliment and I don't think I've ever given it to a movie before. The focusing in this is amazing. As many people have said, the cinematography is next level, but I think the most impressive element is how well they utilize focus. Everything is shot like Batman, the Riddler, or really anybody can be in the shadows. Sometimes you're literally looking at nothing, but you think Batman might be there. Which, as he mentions, is the idea. They think I'm hiding in the shadows, but I am the shadows. And obviously it makes it much creepier when the Riddler strikes. This attack is perfectly built up like a horror film. And once the DA is knocked out, logically your next question is what the hell is he putting on him? If this was in focus, it would probably look silly and you wouldn't care what he'd be putting on him. Honestly, the blue and red lights don't really seem to have a purpose in the grand scheme of things. But out of focus, all you can say is Jesus, what is that thing? <laughs> Well, that thing turns out to be a bomb as he's forced to crash into a funeral and give a message to the Batman. Again, if you don't find this funny, you're just not sick enough. Three riddles in two minutes. I'll give you the code for the lock. Batman does arrive, tries to answer his riddles, but when he's asked to hand over an informant, he panics and goes boom. He's fine. Yeah, I get fireproof armor, but fireproof skin? His face should look like a Rares of the Lost Ark candle. They take him to the Haas police station, where the evidence is clear. Any cop with a high-pitched voice is gonna be a dick. What's going on here? I got the press downstairs. He interfered in an active hostage situation. Blood is on his hand. SpongeBob here, Patrick. Get a hold of yourself, deputy. Gordon helps him escape in a flying scene that's shot amazingly, but I'm sorry. He looks like Rocky the Flying Squirrel in that suit. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm fine. Fine. Fine, 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 fine. Yeah, bet you didn't know this was a gritty reboot of The Tick. I smell a commercial coming. Oh, I better get to the thing. Commissioner Malcolm! Commissioner Malcolm! You got mail. Let's focus ourselves to that being open. If it's answers you wish to consume, I'll give them to you in the next room. It's a riddle, but what does it mean? I don't know, but we're not going anywhere until we crack this code. There are hundreds of rooms in the world. Thousands, maybe more. So how are we supposed to find this room? Let's try counting the letters in the riddle. Oh, they could be room numbers. Or letters of the alphabet spelling out a new message. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. catches the penguin dealing a drug called Drops when Catwoman interrupts his bust. And you know a movie's working when you feel legit bummed out when the person she's looking for is dead. Not gonna lie, this was really a downer. Oh no, my... cousin. This of course begins a big chase scene involving the Batmobile that I'll admit is pretty impressive considering it's a lot of the usual tight selectively focused shots. In the rain no less, yet I can still follow it all fine. Yay! All these people died so you can ask him some questions. You literally know where to find him. And as epic as that pissed off version of the Dragnet theme is, the one that says, son of a bitch, you're in trouble. This is the only part of the movie where I don't like Pattinson's acting. With all the amazing subtle looks he gives in this film, he need to give a your ass is ass look here. But for whatever reason, he gives a teacher, can you keep it down, I'm trying to sleep back here, look. Where's that overcompensating bail face when you need it? They question the penguin and find out their journey leads to the abandoned orphanage. And yeah, I love with his feet tied, he legit walks like a penguin. Should be amusing. <laughs>
They go to the orphanage to find out who the Riddler's next target is. Jesus, his next victim is Bruce Wayne. Oh no, I'll be killed! I mean, Superman will be killed! Wait, what? The package is opened by Alfred, and I'll give credit, the film's dark enough. I legit didn't know if they were gonna kill him off or not. Sadly, though, I have to confess, as suspenseful as this scene is, all I'm thinking is, ooh, the Shakespeare head from the Adam West show! There's a C4 explosive set in the banner. Alfred is blown up, but because explosions don't hurt anyone in the Wayne family circle, he survives. Bruce Bray paints a vision board in his back cave, or living room, to figure things out. Don't worry, Alfred will clean it up. All right. He gets a call from Catwoman who says she's gonna go after the people who killed Anika. She also reveals a big bombshell that Falcone is her father. He owes me that money. He owes child support? I'm the child? I think that makes sense! Now Thomas and Bruce Wayne, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that psycho's right to go after these creeps. What do you mean, Thomas and Bruce Wayne? What, do you live in a cave? Brum -bum -bum. The Riddler reveals that Bruce's mother was institutionalized, and to keep it a secret, his father made a deal with Falcone to kill the reporter who would leak it. He talks to Falcone to see if it's true, and come on, I think we can trust a crime lord to tell the truth. You thought your father was a boy scout, but you'd be surprised what even a good man like him is capable of in the right situation. Totoro, in many respects, is the scariest villain because he doesn't scream or shout like the other baddies. He only does it once in a while. For the most part, he's very quiet, very reserved. You could even see him as charming in different situations. Which you could argue demonstrates he's a much more powerful foe. As the saying goes, people with true power don't need to raise their voices. Even when he kills someone, he's still eerily quiet. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> he finds out from Alfred that his father did make a deal to keep it quiet, but didn't want anyone killed. They even introduced the idea that maybe Falcone is the one who killed his parents because he was gonna tell the cops. It was Falcone. We shall know for sure. I don't know if I like that idea of being introduced, but they do keep it vague that it could have just been a random criminal. Might be some random thug on the street you who needed money, you got scared and pulled the trigger too fast. Batman's origin ironically feels more meaningful the more meaningless the murder of his parents is. But hey, he might be Spider-Man based off this shot, as he discovers Falcone killed Anika and Catwoman is gonna get revenge by killing him off. Hey, Dad. I'm Maria Kyle's kid. Oh my God, you're her father? <laughs> ah, jeez, did I father you too? He stops Selena from killing him and is finally brought to justice. <laughs> I'm finally seeing you in the light. You look ridiculous. He's shot by the Riddler outside the club and Batman rushes to his apartment to get him. <laughs> oh my god, Batman's the Riddler! Shut up, Frank. The Riddler is seen across the street though and again, I really feel like we've been missing a lot of Paul Dano's performance with his face covered up. Imagine this freaky-ass smile replaced by oven mitt face here. It just wouldn't be as creepy. He's allowed to shine in his unnerving, but like I said before, funny as hell splendor when Batman talks to him in prison. And if you're like me, your butthole clenched up as soon as he starts saying his name. Bruce. Wait. Bruce. Wait. Yeah, he's keeping it together, but in his mind you know he's thinking. It turns out he's just talking about how easy Bruce Wayne had it as an orphan, where he was left in the orphanage forgotten. The billionaire with the lying dead daddy because at least the money makes it go down easy. Yeah, it did now that you mention it. Oh, God damn it! The Riddler assumed Batman was on his side, and as skin crawling as he can be, again, if you see no humor to this performance, you gotta rethink a story about a guy dressing up like a bat. No! Oh! I like this guy. They are funny guys. So the third act is where things start to go downhill a bit. Nothing is ruined, but it gets a little sloppy and you do start to feel the length for the first time. We're almost two and a half hours in and I surprisingly before then didn't feel how long this was. But after this talk in the jail, they should have just gone straight to the climax.
Instead, he goes back to the Riddler's place where we just were a moment ago to get more information. And the information is very obvious. Literally, the first question you probably have about the Riddler is what's that tool he's using to kill people? Only now, though, does Batman ask that and it reveals a clue. Second, he misinterprets seeing the real you as he knows his identity, but with all the double meanings in this politician's name everywhere throughout the movie, it's pretty clear he's gonna go after her. When the climax does get going, a bunch of bombs start drowning Gotham, forcing people into the stadium where his goons will kill everyone. And I don't know, maybe this is just a personal preference for me, but I think water is a very boring climax for a Batman movie. Aquaman? Sure. Batman? Feels kinda lame. But okay, even if you don't mind that, people still continue to make bad choices. The politician knows henchmen are out there to kill her, and it's probably at this location. But she says she literally wants to put a spotlight on her. The problem with this city, everyone's afraid to stand up and do the right thing. Gordon tries as little as possible to stop her. We're under attack, ma'am. Exactly. Excuse me. Ma'am. Stop. Don't. Not surprisingly, she gets shot. She didn't even have a plan. She was just gonna guilt trip the attackers, I guess. Batman fights off the goons, but there's no big villains left to build up to. They're it. They're the last big battle. It'd be like ending Dark Knight with fighting off henchmen, but the Joker and Two-Face are nowhere to be seen. It'd be kind of anticlimactic. He injects himself with something to give him extra strength, but it's never explained what it is. Even the amazing focus is starting to look a little cheap. Clearly using CG in a lot of the shots. It looks so flat, it's like an eye exam saying, tell me when the Batman is in focus. But like I said, I can't say it ruins anything. I really like the henchmen using the same quote as Batman in the intro. I'm vengeance. Which makes him realize he has to make it more about the people and not himself. This leads to a great image of him leading everybody out, starting with the boy who lost his father in the opening. I like he thinks about what the Riddler said and chooses him first over the politician. I'll admit I feel like it should have ended with the closing narration and him looking at the boy he helped. Or again, him helping out as Bruce Wayne to step Batman for once. I really feel like they were hammering that in a bit. But we get clearly two mid credit sequences that for some reason are played before the credits. One is foreshadowing the Joker. A friend. <laughs> I know they shot another scene with him too, and the actor's portrayal is fine, but it just doesn't feel like he belongs here, and not now anyway. He's a great villain, but we've met our quota. Let's give another one the spotlight for a bit. We also see Batman and Catwoman going their separate ways. It's fine, just god damn this would have been a much better ending shot. But screw it, I still think this movie's amazing. <laughs> I'm glad it has its own take while still staying true to what Batman is. All the acting is top notch, its cinematography is incredible, there's so much atmosphere. It really is like a detective comic brought to life. Any problems I have are all in the climax, and while it does hurt the film, it doesn't destroy it. I'm super excited to see where else they take this series, and hopefully where they don't take it. This version of the Cape Crusader, I love to see develop more and more. Just when I think I've seen enough of a character, there's very little left to explore. It's always great to see something breathe new energy back into it. Speaking of which, we still have a mystery to solve. Any clues? No, but she might have some. Ah. Cat Tamara, of course. Next room was code for this room. No, I just figured the riddles were pointless and I'd tell you what I'm up to. Villains would get their point across faster if they didn't use puzzles. I'm here to tell you that I have the answer you're looking for. We're not listening to anything until you take that mask off. Fine. Actually, you look better with the other one. The gang member from the beginning of the film? Yes. His name is... Elliot Warren. British actor, he won an Olivier Award. He's been working in film for about seven years. My God. This changes everything. Who would have thought? I'm Elliot Warren. Jesus Christ. It says he's playing a character named Douglas. Clearly I was trying to give a clue to myself. Are we really doing this? Look at him, he's the spitting image of me right down to how muscular we both are. Okay, I'm gonna take the weed you've been smoking and head up. It all makes sense. I'm Elliot Warren.
can't believe you didn't use me in the review. Maybe I can get Rob to dress up as Alfred and come pick me up. <laughs> well, hey, critic. What the hell are you supposed to be? Some. Um.